Hey, what's up? Welcome to the Flutter Masterclass. My name is Mitch and I'm going to be teaching you how to code apps with Flutter. If you don't already know, Flutter is a cross-platform framework, meaning we can create apps for iOS, Android and even web, as well as other platforms with just one code base, which is why I love Flutter so much. And this is a course that I wish I had when I first got started. So I've condensed everything you need to know into these 10 hours and I guarantee you if you can go through these 10 hours then you will be a proficient enough app developer to start building on your own. Now you don't need any programming experience at all to take this course. You can be a complete beginner as this course will start from the very beginning going through the very basics of programming fundamentals before jumping into Flutter itself. The only requirement is that you have Flutter installed on your computer and can open up a new project. If you can do that, then I'll take care of the rest. So this course is split into two parts. The first part is for the beginner level, just going from the very beginning, just to show you the outline of what we're going to cover. We're just going to firstly start with the programming fundamentals and then everything in Flutter is a widget. So we'll start to learn about the different widgets in Flutter and then I'll show you how to navigate between different screens. And then we have a very important idea of this stateless versus stateful widget. Next, we'll look at how to get the user's input and then we'll put all this together to create our first app, which is the to do app. And then let's try building up a more complex UI like this sneaker shop that you can add items to the cart. So those are the topics in the beginner level. And then once you've done that, we're going to move on to the intermediate level. And for this one, the First topic we're going to cover is just the themes. So for example, I'll show you how to use light mode versus dark mode. And then we'll look at some state management as we get more screens and our app grows in size. And then let's have a look at some more advanced UI by building up a minimal e-commerce app with a beautiful design. And then we have to update our programming concepts and understand null safety. Then we're going to start looking at storing our data in the database. So we'll start off with the offline database, meaning like in the device's local storage. So to demonstrate storing the database offline in the local storage, we'll create a simple notes app as well as a habit tracker. And then let's try to authenticate users. We're going to be using Firebase for this. And then let's store data in our database online using Firebase as well. So with this, we're going to create a chat app as well as a social media type app. And then a very important topic here is the API to try to read data. So we're going to build things like a weather app and an NBA app. And then number nine, we're going to look at some notifications for iOS and Android. And since Flutter is a cross-platform framework, for number 10, we're going to look at some responsive design, so for different screen sizes. And then let's have a look at something a little bit different. So let's create like a music player app. And then we're just going to finish off with some final thoughts. So that's the plan. And now just for some general tips, I just wanted to say you have the entire internet at your fingertips, so make sure to use it. So if you come across something you don't understand, use the internet and try to figure out your problem because the act of formulating your question and finding a solution to it is how we learn. So make sure to use the internet. And what's more important than taking this course is for you to actually sit in front of a computer and code. We learn best by doing, so make sure you put in the hours to learn this stuff. So that's all the introductory stuff for this course. I'm sure if you apply yourself, you'll get a lot of value from this course. And I hope you come out the other end a really good Flutter developer. So good luck and we'll begin from the very beginning. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and you should just get this demo counter app. Now I'm just going to delete everything below the main function so I can teach you how to do this from scratch. So with any code base, everything always starts off from this main function and you can see we're just running our app. So let's just create our app real quick. Now in Flutter, there's two types of widgets we can create, a stateless widget and a stateful widget. 
I'm going to just go with the state list widget for now. I'll explain more about the difference between the two later on. So the first thing you always need to do is just to return a material app. And this will just be the basis for everything. So if you save this, it'll just be a dark screen because it's got nothing in it. And in the home, we're going to just specify a scaffold. So this will just be a blank app and it will be the basis for everything else that we create. Now, one thing is you can see that debug banner, which is there just to show that we're still developing the app. Now, I don't like to see that banner, so I'm just gonna set it to be false. Yep, so we just have a nice clean app. And the other thing is you see these blue squiggles. It's because they want us to put a const tag, but don't worry too much about that. I'll explain that a bit later on. Now, before we look at any app development, the first thing that we should do is to look at the programming fundamental. So I'm going to teach this as if it's for people that have no coding experience at all. And I'm just going to get you up to speed on all of the basic concepts that we need to code. So the very first idea is a variable. So we can store different types of information into variables. Now, the sort of main variables I'm going to show you here so the first one is a string. Now a string is just a string of characters, which in other words just means text. So we can say like, my name is Mitch Coco. And the next important variable is an integer. So like a whole number, say like an age, I'm 27. And then you've got double, which is for numbers that have a decimal point, right? So for example, like pi. And then the last essential variable we need to know is a Boolean. And Boolean just means if it's a true or false value. So it's just one or the other. So for example, is beginner? Yes, I'm a beginner, true. So these are the main variables that you'll need to know. There are other variables that you'll pick up along the way, but I think these four are the, the most important ones. And so now that we have information stored in different variables, we can now look at some basic operators. So the first thing is just the basic math operators. Now, if you know any level of math, this should be sort of familiar for you. So I'm just gonna run through them anyway. So we've got the plus, the minus, we've got the multiply, divide, and also remainder. So if I just go through these, let's say for example, one plus one we know is two. Four minus one we know is three. And in code for the multiplying button, we use the asterisk sign. So we know two times three is six. And for the division, we use a slash symbol. And finally, this percent is for the remainder. So if I say like nine divided by four gives us a remainder of one. So these five basic math operators are pretty much all you need to know. So we've got the add, subtract, multiply, divide, and the remainder. Cool. So by the way, if you want to test any of this out, so I told you everything starts off at the main function. So we could just go and do a quick print here. Say for example, let's print hi there. And if you bring up your console and you restart this, you can see it'll just print in our console hi there. So if I just play around with some of these numbers, we could say one plus five and it'll give us six. So we could say like nine, Remainder four gives us one. So yeah, we can always use some little print statements just to see what's going on. But now we have the basic math operators down. The next thing we need to know is the comparison operators. So for these ones, we have say, starting with the equals one. So this kind of double equals, it checks if the two values are the same or not, right? So five equals to five is definitely true. We also have the not equal to, which is represented by the exclamation mark. So two is not equal to three, that is true. We also have the greater than signs, right? Three greater than two. We also got the less than sign. And just like in math, we have the greater or equal to, as well as the less than or equal to. So hopefully you're following on so far. So if I just come back to my main function and just play around with it a little bit, if I print nine is equal to nine, you can see it's true. Let's do another one say nine is not equal to nine. We know that is false. 
Sweet, which brings us to the last type of operators, which is the logical operators. So for this one, the first one is just the AND symbol. So AND operator. So this returns true if both sides are true. So for example, we could say is beginner and the other condition is is age less than 18 years old. So we had some variables at the top that we created from the beginning. So we can see that is beginner, we are true. And the age, I'm 27 years old. So is beginner is true, but age is less than 18 is false. So this one should be returning false because for this to be true, we need both sides to be true. Now, there are situations where you might want to use an or operator. And for this one, it's only true if at least one of the sides are true. So is beginner. We know that the left hand side here is true, but the right hand side is false. But since one of them at least is true, then this will return true overall. And then the last thing which we kind of talked about before is the not operator. So this one just returns the opposite value, which is this exclamation mark. So if I say exclamation mark is beginner, then we're going to return false. Cool. So if I try this again, now, since we have our variables in this stateless widget, let's go down to this build method and we can just try to print some things here. So let's say like, like that all operator. You can see it returns true. Cool, so we looked at some variables. We looked at the basic operators that we need to manipulate this information. And so just to sum up, just to make sure we're on the same page, every code base starts off in the main function. We're running our app and this will build the widget down here. So let's continue this on. So now let me teach you about some control flow. So that's for right now. At the top, let's call this programming fundamentals. And now we're looking at the control flow. So control flow is how we're going to tell the computer how to get things done. So for example, the very first one that anyone needs to learn about is the if statement. So the way it works is if certain condition is true, then let's do something. So for example, we could say if age is greater or equal to 18, just print you are an adult. All right, so let's try this out. You can see, yep, if I restart this, our age is definitely above 18. So yep, we are an adult. Now the next thing is we can have an if else. So just check for a certain condition and then we can have all of the other cases. So just going off of our example, if age is greater or equal to 18, print you are an adult. Else, print you are not an adult. So this will just account for all the other situations. So just to show you here, if I say like I'm five years old, then it'll just go through the control flow and tell me that I'm not an adult. Cool, let's change that back to 27. So we looked at if, we looked at if else. And one more thing is an else if. So what this does is it just checks for another condition. Right, so the example I can give for this one is if your age is less than 13, then you can only watch G-rated movies. Else if you're less than 18, then you can watch G-rated and also PG-13 rated movies. Right, so this will just go in order and check the first condition. Okay, so if I don't qualify for that first section, then it will go on to the next condition and so on. And then at the very end of all of this, you can have another else just to get the remaining cases. Right, so if none of those conditions are true, then at the very end, you can watch G, PG, and also R rated movies. So if, else, and else if, these are the fundamental control flows for any programming language. So you're going to be using this a lot. Now, sometimes you might be using it too much. So for example, let's say we have a grade, like a school grade of B. 
And I just want to know by checking the grade, how well the student's doing, right? So we could definitely use an if statement here. Say like, if grade is A, then print excellent. Else if grade is B, print good. If grade is C, say fair. And then you can keep going down, right? Now, if you find yourself using too many if statements like this, it might be a better idea to use a switch statement. Just to show you, if I was to do the exact same thing, but with a switch statement, it says, okay, switch, and we're looking at the grade, and we can think about the different cases that this grade could be. The first case, it could be an A, and say so if it's an A, then print excellent, and then we can have the case for B, have the case for C, and so on. And then similar to the very last else statement that accounts for all of the other situations, in a switch statement, we can just place that in a default. So if none of those cases are true, then just print invalid grade. So these two blocks of code do the exact same thing. But if you have a lot of cases, then it might be better just to use a switch statement instead of an if statement. Right, so yep, this is the general structure for a switch statement. Awesome, which brings us to loops. Now, just to sort of illustrate the need for loops, I like to think of an example. So I want you to imagine you have a box of 10 colored crayons and you want to draw a circle with each one. So one way we could do it is we can say, draw a circle with the first crayon, then draw a circle with the second crayon, and then the third, and so on, right? But instead of giving the instruction like this, it's much easier for us to just say, for each crayon in the box, draw a circle. So this is what a loop is going to be used for. So the very first type of loop is called a for loop. And so if I was to just show you here, the requirements for a for loop is we have to have an initialization. We need to have a condition and also an iteration, which sounds complicated, but if I just show you as a quick example here, for my initialization, I'm gonna start with i being zero. So most of the time we just use an integer for this and you can pick any letter, but I'm just gonna pick i and let's say, okay, starting at zero, and as long as i is less than or equal to five, then keep incrementing and going through the i. So i equals zero is our initialization. i is greater than or equal to five is our condition. And then i plus plus is our iteration, which I guess I haven't really explained that plus plus what that is. So coming back to our basic operators, let's add it on here. So plus plus just means incrementing by one. It just means I'm gonna add one to myself. And similarly, minus minus means we're going to decrease by one. So these are kind of nice short way hand to do it. So for example, five plus plus is just six. Five minus minus is four. So that's what that's doing, right? So that's our iteration. We're just going to keep increasing i by one. So if I just show you like what this is actually actually doing, if I print out the i, right? Let's see what happens. So I'm just going to restart this and you can see starting from zero, it'll keep incrementing by one until we get to our condition, which is being less than or equal to five, right? So it will just go through the loop and print i equals zero, one, two, three, four, five. So if I make the condition say eight, then it's gonna print it eight times. Cool, so that's how you use a for loop on a very basic level. Now, one couple key words that's gonna be helpful is you can actually say something like this. We can say, if i is equal to say six, then let's break out of this loop. And so if I just run this again, what happens is it's gonna start at zero and it's gonna go through until eight, but let's see what actually happens. So we went zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then it just stopped. And the reason why it stopped is because we have this little check here saying, if i is equal to six, then break out of the loop. And so it'll just stop the loop entirely. Now, similar to break, which just breaks out of the loop, 
We can also have a continue keyword. And what continue does is if I just show you the behavior, first of all, starting from our zero, going to eight, it'll print everything, but it just skips six, right? So that's our condition here. So if I is equal to six, then just continue and skip this current iteration. And that's what continue is saying. Cool, so using these, you can actually do a lot of things. Now I'm gonna teach you one more type of loop, which is a while loop, which actually looks simpler. So in a for loop, you have to specify the number of times to loop, so that condition. Uh, but sometimes if you don't know how many times to loop, then you can use a while loop which basically just keeps looping until that condition is met. Okay, so for example, right, let's say I've got an integer saying countdown being five. So while the countdown is still a positive number, then print the number and let's go down. Okay, so this will keep going down until we reach basically zero. Right, so if I print this out, starting from five, four, three, two, one, and then it just stops. Right, so you can also do loops in this way as well. Maybe I should make this look a little nicer. Well, let's put some lines here just so that our notes look pretty good. But yeah, let me teach you about functions. So we just looked at some cool blocks of code that gets stuff done. Now we can organize these blocks of code into functions so that we can reuse them easily later on. So I'm gonna create a method here. By the way, functions and methods, they are the same thing. And just to remind everyone, this main function is a function, it's a method. So the whole app starts off by running that main method. And so let's create a very basic one. So I'm just gonna say void greet. And let's just say a message here saying, hello Mitch. So when this widget gets built, let's call that greet method. And then you can see it'll just print it out. And by the way, the word void, what that means is void means that the function returns nothing. Uh, shortly, I'm gonna show you some functions that do return something. But this one for now, when it says void, all it does is it just executes whatever's in that function. So I'll show you in just a second a function that actually has a return type. But for now, let's, have a, let's keep it simple and just do void. So we have this very basic function saying greet. Now I'm gonna show you how we can have functions that have some parameters. And so what that means is, okay, let's say we have another greet function here. And in this bracket, we can accept a parameter. And so the parameter I wanna accept is a string called a name, right? And by the way, we should make sure the function is called something else, like greet person. Cool, so then we can say, all right, print hello, and then also let's just add on the name of whatever we're given. So coming back to our method here, we can say greet person, and you can see it's asking us to provide a name, right? And the type we need to give is a string, you can see here. So I'm just gonna say, just as an example, if I say five, it's not gonna work. It's got a red squiggle, because it says here that int, you can't give it to a string, right? So we need to give it a string. So I'm gonna say, all right, let's give it Steve. And if I just restart this, then there we go. It's just saying, hello, Steve. Cool, now just by looking at this, we can see maybe we might need to add like a comma and a space. Yeah, that looks a bit better. But yeah, this is the idea of having some parameters. It's also called arguments. And so you can have many of these parameters as necessary. So maybe you can also ask for an age, right? Then if you're asking for another parameter, you can see there's gonna be a red squiggle here that says two positional arguments are expected, but only one found. Okay, so we can just say 27 or 55. So that's how we work with parameters. And now let's look at a function with a return type. So I showed you and explained earlier that the word void means that the function is not returning anything. So now I'll show you a function that does return something. So instead of using the word void, I'm gonna call this method as a type integer. 
And a very basic function here that we can illustrate as an example is an add function. So I'm going to say I want two integers as the parameters. So integer a, integer b, and I want to return the sum of these two integers. So let's store a plus b into another variable called sum. And you can see that the function has a red squiggle here, right? Because the void function from earlier, all it's doing is just executing the code inside. Whereas our add function currently, it's got an integer as a return type, right? So what that means is we have to return something, right? That's what it's saying here. We have to return an int. So you have to say return and then just return the sum. Okay, so how do we actually use this in practice? If I say add, say three and five, this, the way we kind of write this right now is doing nothing because it's calling the function, but, but we're not storing this sum anywhere. So because it's returning a certain value, right, we can just print this value straight away, like eight. But it might be a better idea in these sort of situations to store that sum somewhere. So I could say integers my sum and call that add function three and five, and then we can just print my sum. So the main point I want to illustrate here is that this function add actually returns a value. Right, and we can store it in our integer called my sum. Right, this is different from the void where the void just executes the code inside, but it doesn't return anything. Awesome. So now that we've gone through most of the basic programming fundamentals, I want to just show you some of the important data structures to be able to store our variables in a nice way. So the very first type of data structure is a list. So we can have like a list of numbers, say one, two, three. And just to sort of connect this back to some of the earlier concepts that we learned, I'm going to create a quick method here called print numbers, and I'm going to show you how we can use a for loop to go through these numbers. So remember before, in a for loop, starting at the initialization of i being zero, we next need a condition, right? And so instead of specifying an actual number, I'm just going to say numbers.length. So just however long that list is we're gonna go through it. And let's just print the numbers for each of them. So if I come to my method down here and I just print numbers and I restart this, you can see it's gonna print one, two, three, right? Everything in that list. And just some notes here. The way you can access the information in a list like this is through the index. So in order, it starts off at zero. So for example, like numbers and you get the number zero, then that'll return that first number. Okay, numbers one will give you two, numbers two will give you three. And so that's what I'm doing here in my for loop. We're just going through each of the numbers and then the letter I is becoming zero, one, two, and kind of iterating through until we print them all out. That's useful. Now, that's pretty smart at sort of knowing what type we give it. Like we just said list and we didn't specify what type of variables this list should hold. But you can manually specify it if you want, which is a good idea in a lot of situations. So we can say like list, and this list can only hold integers, for example. You can also have like a list that only holds strings, right? So for example, we can say a list of strings that contains names. So Mitch, Sharon, Vince. And we can do the same thing here. So we can say print numbers, we can have another method say print names and just go through the length of names and print me out all the names. So yep, this is useful for all types of information. Cool, so that was just a list. And just to make this a little bit clearer, just so that you know the idea very clearly, I'm just gonna change these to names so that you can see where the numbers are going. Cool, so that's how a list works. The next one I wanna show you is called a set, which is very similar to a list, by the way. So a list is an ordered collection of elements and you can have duplicates. Whereas a set is an unordered collection of unique elements. So it has no duplicates. So we can have a string, a set of strings and have some unique names. And so this will make sure that there's no duplicates and it's just a 
set of unique values. And then the last important data structure I want to show you is called a map. So this one stores key value pairs. And so what that means is let's say I'm going to create a map called a user. We can create a user and say like, okay, the name is Mitch Coco. Age is 27. You can even have like more fields here, like height is 180. And so you can have like a list of information kind of as a key value pair. You're going to see this a lot throughout your app development career. And by the way, the way to sort of access the information in a map is similar to how you access it in a list. So we could say like user, get me the name. And then that's going to print me the Mitch Co. And user, give me the age, it'll just print 27 and so on. So I'm just going to write some notes here just on how we can retrieve the data. Cool, now if you can understand everything I just showed you just then, that's the programming basics that you'll need to know. So the fundamental concepts. Now, if you know the basics and the fundamentals really well, so just the things I showed you just then, it can take you very far. And to be honest, if you can understand what I just showed you, then you've pretty much saved yourself a lot of time and money because this is pretty much what I learned in my computer science degree. So, so if you didn't go to a university or something that, and you didn't get a computer science degree, don't worry, this is basically what we learned. <laughs> And these ideas and concepts are not just exclusive for Flutter and Dart. This is carried over to other languages as well. So it's quite universal, these concepts. So you have to make sure you understand these programming fundamentals before we move on. Awesome. So now that you know all the programming fundamentals, let's just delete all of these notes. And now I'm going to show you about widgets in Flutter. So Everything in Flutter is a widget. And so just to show you again, I just want to delete everything below the main function. And let's just start this from scratch. So our main function is going to run my app, which we're going to create here the stateless widget called my app. And just like before, we're always going to need to have a material app in here. And if you look in the material app for the home, this is where it's going to go to as soon as the app starts up. And the very first widget I want to show you is called a scaffold. Now, if you save this and you run it, a scaffold is, as you can see, it's just a white blank app. And by the way, just before we move further, you can see these blue squiggles. It's because they want us to put the const tag on, but I don't want you to worry too much about what const and final means because it's not a huge deal for us right now. So if you hover over the blue squiggles, just go to the quick fix. And let's say ignore prefer const constructors for this file. So I'll explain a little bit later on about what const and final means. But again, just to keep everyone on the same page. So in our material app, we're going to display a scaffold. And the scaffold is a sort of skeleton widget that holds the different parts of your app. So if I was to show you here, the first thing you can control is the background color. So I could say blue. And by the way, I don't like to see that debug banner, so I'm just going to check that to be false. So yeah, we can choose a background color. And again, if you hover over this, you can see that there's a lot of different shades of that particular color. So you can choose the strength. Cool, so just pick whatever color you want. Now, the other component in the scaffold is you can see here the body. So in the body, I want to show you one of the most fundamental widgets in Flutter, which is called a container. And a container is a really flexible widget that you're going to use for many, many different purposes. So just to illustrate what it does, here we can specify the height and width. Let's say like 300. And let's also give it a color. So if you save that, you can see there's our container. Now, you can wrap this container in another widget called center, which does exactly what it says. It just centers it. And like I said before, everything in Flutter is a widget. So this container widget, you can give it another child and put in another widget. So 
Here, let's introduce the text widget and say Mitch Coco. And you can see there is our text. Now, let's just change the color of this container to green so that we can actually see the text. And one thing you're going to use a lot in containers is this padding. So if I just say padding all for 25, you can see it's got some spacing around that text widget now. And there's a lot of different versions of padding you can use. So for example, a lot of the times symmetric is useful. So you can specify it just for the horizontal or just for the vertical. And then the other one you will need to use is the only. So you can specify padding for only a particular direction like left or top, bottom, right, etc. But for our purpose, let's just say we're going to put a padding of 25 all around. And if you want to decorate this even further, you can go to the decoration. And in this box decoration, if I just show you here and I save it, this is a very common error you'll face. And what it's saying is you cannot provide a color and a decoration. So if you want to specify some further decoration, then you have to put the color inside the decoration. So everything should be working fine. Now, what can you decorate further? Well, one thing that I do all the time is curving the corners. So you can see this border radius. We can make it, say, 20. And you can see the corners are much more rounder. So this is a very common use. And coming back to our text widget, we can, of course, switch up the style. So in the text style, we can of course change the color. We can also change the font size, which by the way, with any of this stuff, if you hover over it, you can see the information. So it says it defaults to 14. So let's say like 28. And you can also change the font weight, make it bold. So you can change pretty much anything about it. So that's a text widget. Now, the next widget I want to show you here is an icon. Now, by default, Flutter has a lot of icons, so you can just pick whichever ones you want. Now, let's say I'm just going to go for the favorite icon, which is a love heart. And inside this widget, you can change everything you want to. Again, like color. You can change the size and so on. So this big collection of default icons are going to be pretty useful. Just out of the box, you can use any of these easily. Cool, so we've just been working on the body of the scaffold, which by the way, if you look at the side here, you can also minimize certain widgets. But let's go to our app bar now, and you can give it the widget called app bar. And again, just to save it, you can see there it is. And then inside this app bar, we can specify the title. And you can also change the background color, of course, to whatever you like. And if you look carefully there, there's a little shadow because it has some elevation. So if you want, you can set the elevation to be zero and that makes it much more flat with no shadows. Cool. And then if you specify this leading, you can give it an icon for the left hand side. If you want to put an icon on the right hand side, that's going to be in the actions. And you can see with the actions, it requires a list. So you can put more than one if you want. But let's say I want to put an icon button here. Then yep, you can see there it is. Sweet, so that's the basics of the app bar. Now, just coming back to the body, I'm going to show you the next widget that is really important, and it's called a column. So I'll show you columns and rows, but just starting with a column, it requires a children of widgets. So let's just put in, say, three boxes here, and I'm going to make 
the first box just a container. Let's just have a height and width of 200 and make it deep purple. And then I'm just going to copy this exact same container, but maybe let's just make the colors a bit lighter. So if I save it, then there it is. Now let's actually go back to our scaffold and delete the background color so that we can see these better. Awesome. And let's also delete that app bar as well since we're done looking at that for now. And let's just focus on this column. So columns are good widgets to display in a vertical fashion. And rows are going to do the same thing but for the horizontal. And this current column that we have here, we have our three boxes. So a couple of things about a column is you can control this main axis alignment. And just to show you the differences, right? If I show you the center, it's just going to be aligned to the middle. You can also go for the end. And a lot of the times space evenly comes in really handy. As well as space between. So a lot of different ways we can space out the UI. So that's main axis alignment. Now, the other one I want to illustrate is the cross axis alignment. Now to show you this one, let's make our first box bigger and make the following boxes a little smaller. So if you save this, then we get this kind of three containers like this. And so we looked at the main axis alignment and how that changes the column. I also want to show you about the cross axis alignment. So if you say start, then this will align everything to the left like this. And so we're looking at the other axis now. You can say end and it will align to that side and center of course. So using the cross axis and the main axis alignment, you can space these out however you like. Cool. So let's just bring them all back to the same size. Now you can see here in our containers, we very specifically gave them a height and a width, right? They are very, they are fixed to be a size of 200. Now let's say this last box here doesn't have a height, then it just disappears, obviously. But you can wrap this widget in another widget called an expanded widget. And this one is also super, super useful. And expanded widgets go well with columns and rows because what it does is it just expands the widget to fill up the rest of the space. So you can see that third box, if I save this, it just fills it up to fill the rest of the space. And so if I just get rid of these widths as well, and then I get rid of the heights for the first two containers, and let's just put them all in expanded widgets. Let's see what happens. Now this is why I like expanded widgets a lot because instead of manually setting a specific size, if I say like three expanded widgets, then it's going to divide the screen evenly into thirds. So it's going to be very proportioned out. And so one thing you can have a look at is this flex property. And if you hover over it, it's initially just a value of one. And what the flex property tells us about is pretty much the ratio of this current widget in comparison to the other ones. So for example, right, if I say flex is two, then that widget is going to be twice as big as the other. And if I say three, it'll be three times as big as the other. So you can kind of have good ratios going on. Cool, so that's an expanded widget. Like I said, it goes hand in hand with columns and rows. So now let me show you one problem when you're using columns and rows. So let's say our first box has a height of 350. In fact, let's say all of these boxes have a height of 350, which is quite large. And if you save them, you can see it's not going to fit all on the screen, right? Like the bottom square doesn't fit. So you get this sort of overflow problem. And so now the next widget I want to introduce to you is called a list view. So if you just change that column to a list view and you save it, we're no longer going to get this problem because what a list view does is is pretty much the same as a column, but it can scroll. So now we have a scrollable list, which means all of our children should fit. And you can also control here the scroll direction. So it's going to be vertical by default, but let's say I want to make it horizontal and let's give these guys some widths. 
Then you can have a horizontal list view as well. I didn't show you the row explicitly, but it's going to be the same as a column. But columns are vertical and rows are horizontal. So columns and rows are for vertical and horizontal UI layouts. And list views are used for when you want them to scroll. Now you can see the way we created this list view. We specified the children for the list view, right? You can also create them on demand by using a list view dot builder. And this one will be really helpful as well. So in the item builder, you can create a list tile, which is another default widget. And we can specify the item count. So how many do we want to create? Well, let's say 10. And just to show you what's happening here, just for the title here, let's put in a text widget to display the index. So the index is going to be starting from zero and we're going to go up until we have 10 items. So that's going to be zero to nine. And you can see that index, if I print it, we have a vertical list like this. And so just to kind of connect this back to some of our previous concepts, let's say we have a list of names. So I got Mitch, Sharon, Vince. And let's say I just want to print these names in the list view. So if you look at the item count, again, instead of just manually specifying 10, you can say names.length. So this will just get the number of how long that list is. And then in the text, we can say names and just get the index. So we looked at lists earlier on in the course. So this is how we can display it now using a list view for the UI. So similar to list views, we also have grid views. So if I show you how to do a grid view in the grid delegate, just to keep it simple, the one I always like to use is the sliver grid delegate with fixed cross axis count, which is a mouthful. But all this means is let's say I'm going to put eight. It's just how many you want in each row for the grid. So let me show you here. Let's say like a chessboard, right? A chessboard is an eight by eight grid. So let's say for the item count, I want to have 64. And the item builder, let's just create a container here. And it looks like everything's stuck together, so we can't really see it. So let's just put some margin padding on the container. There it is. So there's our grid that's eight by eight. And so, like I said before, this grid delegate is just saying how many you want in each row. So right now we have eight in each row. We can say four. And so that's what that number is controlling. Awesome. So that's a grid. Now let's move on to a stack. Now stack also has children and what it does is just like the name suggests, it stacks different widgets on top of each other. So let's illustrate this. So I'm going to have three different boxes. Let's have a big, medium, and then a small box. And so by default, you can see it's just all aligning to the top left corner. And stack has alignment properties just like columns and rows. So you could say, give me the center alignment. You can do bottom right and just anything you want. Awesome. Now the very last widget I want to show you for this particular section is a gesture detector. So let's just delete all this. And in the body, let's just go back to our very basic container. And maybe let's just give it a child. And let's just say like tap me. And let's put it in the middle, right? So, so everything in Flutter is a widget which is really cool because you can just go to any of these widgets and you can wrap it with something called a gesture detector. And what that does is it just detects gestures from the user. And a very common gesture is the on tap. But you can see here, there's all sorts of other ones like long press, you know, double tap, things like that. And so if you specify this on tap method, this will do something when the user taps on this particular widget. 
which means anything on this screen, you can wrap it in a gesture detector. And so the user can tap on whatever you would like to be tapped. So I really love this widget. And so just to show you with our sort of console, just to show you that this actually works, you can see if I tap on this box, it'll just print it out, user tapped. And so now we can just start creating different methods and functions for this gesture detector. So just to show you in a bit more practical way, you can fill out the on tap method just right there in the widget tree, but you can also separate out the function, which is probably a good idea. And so when we call this on tap, then just go straight to this method. Awesome. So I hope some gears are turning and some dots are getting connected in your brain. But comment below and let me know if you have any issues with anything. I'll try to come and help around. But those are the most fundamental basic widgets that you need to know in Flutter. So now in the next section, let's look at some more practical ways to create some real functioning apps. Sweet, so now that we went over some of the fundamental widgets, now I'm gonna show you a couple of widgets that have to do with navigation. So let's delete all this and I'm gonna create a folder called pages. Oh, what's going on with this testing? Oh, let's just add this little const tag. Now in these pages, let's create first page. And let's just have it as a stateless widget with a blank scaffold. And let's create another page called the second page. Now, when you come back to our main.dart file in the home, this is where we created our scaffolds before, right? So now what we can do is just go directly to our first page. And it says auto import, so hit enter. And so now if you just restart the app, it'll just go straight to this first page. So just so that we know which page we're on, let's just create an app bar real quick and just say it in the title. And what we're gonna do is in the body, in the middle, we're going to use a button. And when we click this button, let's try to navigate to the second page. So we have to specify the on pressed. And so when the user presses this button, let's try to navigate to this second page. So let me show you how to do that. We're going to use something called a navigator and we're going to push to the second page. So if I just save this and I rerun it and I click on the button, then yep, it brings us to the second page, which also is a blank scaffold. So just so we know what we're looking at, let's create an app bar real quick. Sweet, and you can see automatically in the app bar, it's already got that back button. So this is why Flood is really useful and easy to work with. And this is the basics of navigation. Now, a couple of things I wanna show you is another way to sort of handle navigation, especially when you have a lot of different pages is to use some routes. So in the material app, you can specify a few different routes. So for example, the first one, let's just call a second page and give it the second page. And so once we have a route, what we can do is instead of this bit of code, we can just say navigator. And before we did push, but now we can say push named, and then we can just give the route name here. And so this one just makes it look a little nicer and easier to deal with. And of course you can just add as many routes here as necessary. Awesome, so that's the basics of how to navigate to a different page. Now, what I wanna show you is a very common way to handle navigation is to have a drawer. So if I just delete everything, and if you have an app bar and you also have a drawer, without even specifying anything here, you can see that there's already that menu icon on the top left. And if you click on it, it'll open up a blank drawer. So what we can do now is inside this drawer, we can start decorating things. So for example, like the background color and the child, it's common to use just a big column here. And also for the very top, there's already a default widget that's really useful for this situation, which is called a drawer header. And all this does is like if I give it an icon, 
it just takes up a good chunk of space at the top. So this is where you would usually have your logo. And kind of similar to what we did before, let's just ignore these const tags for this for now. Yeah, we don't need to worry about that. Cool, so below this logo, we can now have a few list tiles. So say one for homepage, one for like a settings page. And so what we can put in here, now we can create a container with rows and columns and text widgets to create a nice looking tile. But because it's such a common use case, Flutter already has some nice tiles to use. So for example, we can use a list tile and then give it an icon and give it a text and let's just copy this and do one for the settings as well. Cool. Now, if you look in the list tile, it's got that on tap. And so if we press this, then let's go to the home page. And so currently we've got first page and second page. So let's just delete that second page. And I'm just gonna start creating some new pages here. So I'm just gonna call it home page and then a settings page. So it's just gonna be very similar to what we had before. Cool, and coming back to our main.dart file, let's get rid of this route and call it home page and maybe another one for settings page. Awesome, so coming back to our drawer here, if I click on this home, I want to go to the home page, right? So then now I can just use that navigated.push that we looked at before. And same thing for the settings page. Sweet. And again, just to come back to our other pages, let's just create a quick app bar so that we know what we're looking at. So if I just restart this, so I'm in my first page, go to our drawer and then we can click on the home page and navigate around. Cool. Now one thing, I don't know if you noticed, but when I open up this drawer and I go to the home page, when I click back, it still shows the drawer. And if you look at most of the apps that we use today, that drawer should be closed when I go back. So what you're gonna do is, first of all, we're going to pop the drawer. So navigated.pop, this will just exit whatever we're looking at currently. So we're going to pop the drawer first and then we'll go to the home page. So if you just save this and restart it, what's gonna happen is let's open up the drawer, go to the home page, but then if I go back, the drawer is closed. And that's kind of the behavior that we want for most of our apps. Cool, so that's how you use a drawer, which is gonna be very helpful to navigate around to different pages in your app. Now, another common way to do it is to use a bottom navigation bar. So this is also something that you see a lot on in many apps, right? It's that bar on the bottom. So if you look at the bottom navigation bar, we can specify some items. And I'm gonna have just say three things here. So the home, the profile, and the settings. And then so you can look at this and say bottom navigation bar item and just give it the icon and the name. Sweet, and if you save this, you can see there it is on the bottom. Now decoration, of course, we can make this look prettier by changing up the colors and things like that. But the main thing I wanna show you here is how to navigate around. So if you currently, if you click on it, nothing's gonna happen. Okay, cool. Now, if you come back to our homepage, I actually want to get rid of this app bar now. And I just want to show that it's our homepage through the body. Because on our original page, we're already going to have an app bar. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's do the same thing for the settings page. And we're going to need one more page for the profile. Okay, awesome. So just coming back to our very first page, right? Let's create a list of pages. So we've got that home page, we've got the profile page and the settings page. 
And then in the scaffold, if you go to the body, let's display the page of whatever we're looking at right now. So at the beginning of the course, we looked at how lists work. So if I say like, give me the zeroth index for the page, that's gonna be the home page, as you can see. If you go one, that'll be the profile page, as you can see. And then finally, number two is gonna be the settings page. So we're going to need an integer to sort of track which page we're looking at, right? So I'm gonna create an integer called selected index. And let's just start off at zero, which is the home page. And then we've got these list of pages. And so now if you come back to the body, we can just say, show me the page of whatever the current selected index is. So it's gonna start at zero. And then now finally, we just need a method to update the selected index. So navigate bottom bar. What we need as a parameter is an integer for the index, uh, the new index that we're going to. So when this method is called, let's just set the state and just update our selected index to that new index here. Awesome, now I just realized for us to use set state, we need this to be a state full widget, right? Cause we need the screen to update, but we actually made this as a stateless widget from the beginning. So if you're ever in this situation where you need to switch between stateless widgets and stateful widgets, you can just click and hover over the word stateless widget. And on Mac, if you press command dot, you can see it's, you can see there's a convert to stateful widget. And so there's gonna be a similar command for Windows as well but you can convert this to a state full widget. And the reason why I need to do this is because I just wanted to set the state and update the index. So now that we've got this nice method, if you go back to that bottom navigation bar, it says current index. Yep, we can give it our selected index and also there's gonna be an on tap. And so if we tap anything on the bottom, then let's navigate the bottom bar. So we're gonna call that method. Awesome, and so if you just save this and you click around, then we can navigate between the three different pages. Cool, so then you can just go to these individual pages and decorate whatever you need to do. Sweet, so that's how we handle navigation in Flutter. Now we've opened up another brand new Flutter project and every time you open up a new project, you always get this demo counter app and it's worth having a look at individual bits and pieces of this code. But just to show you, I think it's a good idea to show you how to do this from scratch. So I'm just gonna delete everything below the main function and let's try to code up this demo counter app ourselves. So first of all, we're going to need to create my app. And as we discussed earlier, everything's gonna start off from this material app. And for the home, let's just create a counter page. Now, when we create pages, it's a good idea to create them in a separate folder just so that everything's organized. And so this counter page is going to be a state full widget. So, so far we've been looking at stateless widgets, but now it's time to look at state full widgets. So for now, let's just put in a blank scaffold and let's come back to our main.dart file because we can now import what we just created. Cool, now when we create an app on a very kind of high level, we need three things. We need a variable, we need a method, and we also need the UI, which is the kind of visual user interface that the user is gonna interact with. So for our counter app, our variable is going to be an integer. And let's start it at zero. And we're going to create a method to increment the counter. So anytime that we call this method, then we want to get the counter and just plus plus, which means to increase by one. Now, anytime that we change the value of something and we want it to be reflected in the app, we have to make sure to put it inside a set state. So set state is used for stateful widgets. And essentially what it does is it just rebuilds the widget. And so if you don't do this set state, then even though the counter value has incremented, it's not gonna be reflected on the screen if we don't set the state and rebuild the widget. So that's the difference between stateless widgets and stateful widgets. Stateless widgets are widgets that don't change ever, whereas stateful widgets 
change depending on the state, right? So if any kind of new value has been updated and you want to change and you want to show the change on the screen, then that's for stateful widgets. And we can use set state to rebuild it. So let's see this in action. Now I'm going to create a very basic counter app here. So let's have a column. And let's just have some text saying, you push the button this many times. Now it looks like it's at the very top. So I'm just going to access alignment to the middle. And let's just center everything. So we've got our message and now let's show the actual counter value. So in a text widget, if you just show the counter, you can see it's a red squiggle because because it's an integer and to show it as a text, we have to convert it to a string. Cool. So there it is just zero. Now it looks like it's quite tiny. So let's just change up the style for this text and make it much bigger. Awesome. And then the final thing we need is a button of some sorts. So one of the default widgets that Flutter has is called an elevated button. So when the user presses the button, let's just call that increment counter method. And let's see what this button looks like. Cool, there it is. Now, if you click on the increment button, you can see it'll increase. And so if I just show you real quick, if I was to say, let's increment the counter, but you don't include the set state part of it, then it's not gonna change. Now, the actual value of the counter in the code is increasing, but it's just not rebuilding the widget. So we can't see the fact that it changed. So that's what set state does. Okay, it rebuilds the widget to reflect the change. Awesome. Now, if you're a complete beginner, learning and understanding how a very basic app like this counter app and how it works, it actually goes through some really important ideas. So I really recommend playing around with this and seeing what you can do. You can create calculators. I think that's a very good app to try to make as a challenge for yourself. Because if you think about what we made for this counter app, we looked at variables, we have a method to change the value of the variable. And then now we know some basic widgets to, to create the UI for it. And now you understand the difference between stateless and stateful widgets to create a counter app like this. Now let's continue on with our learning. So I've created another Flutter project. So again, I'm just gonna delete everything below the main function to start from scratch. And let's create my app and our material app. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to create a to-do app. So let's create that in a separate page folder. And so the main idea I want to show you with this to do app, first of all, is getting the user's input. So in our counter app, all that we get from the user's input is just the user pressing a button. So now let's collect some more information from the user. So in the body, in the middle, I want to introduce you to another very important widget, which is called a text field. So without any further customization, if you just save this, you can see that text field at the, at the middle there. And so if you click on it, you can actually start typing in the text field right away. And now it begs the question, well, how do we actually access what the user typed? So to do that, we need a text editing controller. So I'm just gonna call it my controller. And if you look at this text field, one of the options here you can see is controller. So we can give it our controller. And so this controller just stores and gives us access to whatever the user typed in there. Cool. Now let's wrap this in a column so that we can have some other widgets here as well. Below the text field, I want to create another button. And let's say if the user presses this button, let's have a method to greet the user. And we haven't created this method, so let's just do that real quick. So 
Sweet, there it is. Now let's just make sure to center this alignment so that we can bring it back to the middle. And now if I type in, say, Mitch, and I hit tap, and you can see with our controller, we have access to the text that the user typed. Sweet, now if you look at the text field, there's a lot of things you can customize about it. So if you look at the decoration, and you have a input decoration, we can specify a border. Now, there's a lot of styles you can go for, but one that I usually go for is an outline border. And it looks like everything's stuck to the sides, so I'm just going to wrap everything in a padding. There we go. And one important thing that you should be using is a hint text. So you can see here that this is just a string. So the hint text is sort of the grayed out text for what you want the user to type in. Like give them a hint about what should be typed in here. So for example, let's say type your name. Sweet. So now that we can actually get the user's input and we can have access to it, let's actually spit back some information as well. So let's output something. So I want to have a greeting message. So let's just create that at the top. So I'm just going to have a string called greeting message. And let's just have a blank string at the beginning. And what we're going to do is when we greet the user, instead of just printing it to the console, let's try to print it on the app. So to do that, we're going to say greeting message is hello. And then let's just add on whatever the user typed in the controller. Right, and since we want this to actually be reflected in the app when the change happens, we have to set the state, which again just means to rebuild this widget. Okay, sweet. So at the top, you can see nothing. Now, if I say type in your name and I hit tap, then it says hello, Mitch. Cool. So I hope that made sense. Now, the main important thing that we learned just then is about the text field and using the controller to access what the user typed in the text field. Now, there are some coding practices that will help your code be more clean and easy to read. And so, for example, one thing we can optimize here is it's probably a good idea to just create another string here called username and then just store what the controller has in this string. And then so now we can just say instead of directly going to the controller, we can just say add the username. So this will just make it easier for us to read the code later on. Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how we can create a functional to-do app using Flutter. So I'll show you how we can check off each task and also create new tasks, as well as using a little slidable widget to delete the task as well. And then finally, I'll show you using Hive how we can store the data in your local device. And it's actually really simple to do. So let me show you by jumping into the code. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page in my main function, I'm running my app, which brings us to this home page. And in this home page, I've just got a blank scaffold. So if you run this, you should just have a blank white app. And so this is where we'll begin. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is for the background color, let's make it a bit of a, say, yellow theme. So let's go with yellow 200. And then let's create an app bar. Which if we save, is going to be blue. And so instead of specifying the color individually in the app bar, let's actually just go back to the main dot dot file and use this theme. So this will probably be a good idea, especially if you have multiple pages. So the primary swatch color, you can pick whatever theme you want to go for, but I'm just going to go with a yellow color. Okay, so that will automatically change the app bar as well as the floating action bar, which we'll use later. The default colors are going to be whatever we specified here. So that's good. And let's give the app bar a title and I'm just going to say to do. 
And one other thing I like to do in the app bar is you can see there's a bit of a shadow there, which personally I'm not a big fan of. So the elevation, let's make it zero. I kind of like this flat aesthetic to it. Cool. Now, next thing is in the body, we want to have a list view of tiles. So we want to have a few to do tasks in a list. And so let's say just for now, just to keep it simple in the children, I'm going to have something called a to do list, which we haven't created yet. So with this one, let's create it in a separate folder. So in my library, you can see I've got the main function and I've got a pages folder, which currently we just have one page and I want to create a new folder called utilities. So I'm just going to call it util. Sometimes I call it components, but essentially in here, let's create our to do list or sorry, to do tile. Okay. Then we can import my material dot dot and create a state list widget called to do tile. So before we create this tile, let's just go back to the home page and you should be able to, oh, I called it to do list. I want to call it to do tile. You should be able to import what we just created. There it is. And if we come back to our to do tile, we can encapsulate the code inside this folder. Okay. So this will keep our code nice and clean in the home page. So let's start with a child just saying some, um, some tasks. So let's say make tutorial, which is what I'm doing right now. Here it is, but let's give it some decoration and let's give it a color and let's just go for a yellow color. Cool. So there it is. Now I'm just gonna put some padding around this container. Okay, so you can see now there's a bit of padding there, but maybe we could go for like 25. And then let's put some padding, not outside the container, but within the container for the child. So let's say um, maybe 12. That's looking pretty, pretty good so far. Maybe 24. Yeah, I actually like that better. Cool. And you can see that the corners are very sharp and you all know I don't like sharp corners. So let's go to the border radius here and let's make this 12. Okay. Looking pretty good so far. Now, how about we include a checkbox next to this so that we can tick off a task, which means in the child of this container, we're going to have to wrap this in a in a row. Okay. So I'm just going to say, put some comment here. I'm going to say task name, and then let's put in a checkbox. So if you just start typing checkbox, checkbox, you should see this default widget in flutter. So you can see when we create a checkbox, we need to give it two properties. So the value and the unchanged. So the value being a Boolean. So it's going to be a true or false value. Like I did this task or I didn't do it. And then the unchanged allows us to switch between the two. So if we think about the to do tile, right? And if I just kind of comment this checkbox out for a second, coming back to our homepage, what I really want to do is I want to create multiple to do tiles, right? And if you think about what changes between each tile, like what varies between each tile, it's going to be the task name and the value of each task, like if I've done it or not. And also we need it to create a method for when the user taps on a particular checkbox. So there's essentially three things that's going to vary between tile to tile. Okay. So that's what I'm going to create up here. So I'm going to say final string. The first thing is the task name. And then we also need to know the Boolean. So, um, task completed, right? This would be a true or false. And then the last thing is I need to have a method. 
So I'm gonna have a function and this is going to be a boolean and we're gonna call it onChanged because that's what this is called. So if you're not sure about what this stuff is, if you just hover over the onChanged, I'm just copying the type of method that they require. Okay, so these three things, let's create the constructor for these. So the first thing is the task name, and then we need to know if the task is completed. And then also we need to know what's the onChange function. So let's get rid of this const tag. And now we can say, instead of just fixing it to be make tutorial, you can see it's gonna replicate for each tile. Let's just say whatever the task name is. Same thing for the value. We now should be able to know what the task completed is and the onChanged method we're gonna to give to the onChanged method. Cool, so what did we just do? If you come back to the home page, you can see that our to do tile is a red squiggle because we have to fill these things out, right? So let's say the first task name, let's call it make tutorial. And then task completed, let's say true. And then on changed. Now on changed, we're going to create this method in just a second. So I'm just gonna say do nothing right now. Okay, so if I save this, you can see here it is. So we have make tutorial. Now if I copy this and I create another one, I could say do exercise. And let's say this is false. Okay, so this is how we create different to-do tiles. Now one thing is this checkbox isn't clickable because, well, we fixed these values to be true and false and we didn't specify the unchanged method. So let's do that now. Now let's create this onChanged method in just a second. And just before we do, instead of using a list view that has children and we have to specify like what the widgets are inside, let's make this a little bit more dynamic. And so what I mean is later I wanna be able to have a plus button here so I can create new tiles and also delete new tiles. So it's not ever gonna be whatever's inside the children. So I'm gonna just get rid of this and we're going to use a list view dot builder. Okay, I've made a separate tutorial on focusing on list view builders, so check that out if you need, but I can show you real quick how to use it. First of all, let's come up to the top here and let's create a list of to do tasks. Okay, so I'm gonna say list to do list. Okay, and let's put in some default to do lists. And the way I want to structure this data is, first of all, let's have the task name. So I'm gonna say make tutorial. And then the second part of this list is going to be a Boolean to, to denote if it's been done or not. So let's say at the beginning, it should be false because we haven't done it. And maybe let's create another one here and say do exercise. And this is also false. So the reason why we created this separate list is because now we can just use this list view builder and we can do some cool things. So say item count, we have to specify how many we want to build. So this one is going to be just the to-do list length. So however many we have inside. And now we can create the item builder. Let's grab this. And we're gonna return a to-do tile, which is what we created earlier, right? And so now we can specify here. So the task name. So this is going to be to-do list. And we want whatever index we're looking at. So this index will go from zero, um, like zero, one, two, three, for however many items we have. So for a particular index, let's get the zeroth one. So that's going to be this. And then for the task completed, it will be the same thing, but number one. So this is number zero, and then this is number one. And for the unchanged, we haven't specified this yet. So let's say, let's create that now actually. And I don't know why it's called P0, this Boolean. I'm just gonna change this to be value. 
Okay, and let's call this checkbox changed. Okay, so let's create our method. So let's create our method here. So this is just for the checkbox was tapped. Okay, so let's create a void checkbox changed. And so if the user taps on the tile, then the value we can give to the checkbox changed. So let's actually accept this value. So I'm going to say Boolean value. And also let's get the index. So which, which to do task are we talking about? Right, so that's controlled by this index. So now I can, so now I can give it a value and I can give it in the index. I should put a question mark here, some null safety. Cool, so if I tap on this, I wanna be able to check this on and off, right? So let's set the state, and what we're gonna change is this value here, or these values. So to do list, which index are we looking at? Are we looking at this one, or are we looking at this one? And if we take number one, so that's gonna be these guys. Let's set it to be just the opposite of what we currently have. So I think this should work. So let's just refresh this. So if I check this off and on, you can see now we can tick this on and off. Cool, if you have any questions about what we just did, just ask below and I'll try to help out. Now one thing about this, let's just go back to the to-do tile and just kind of clean up this decoration. I think that having a padding all the way around the 25 all the way around is not bad, but you can see it creates this kind of double 25. There's like 50 here. So I am a bit of a aesthetic creep. So I want to change this from all to only and just put it on every side except for the bottom side. So what that does is it just creates a nice uniform padding around all of these widgets. So that's good. Now the other thing is I want to change this checkbox active color. It's yellow, which is in theme with what we want to do, but let's make this a bit darker. So let's go to this checkbox and let's say, and in the checkbox, we should be able to see the active color. And let's say, let's actually go for black, to be honest. Yeah, that looks much better. And one other touch I want to do is, you know, the, you know, this text widget, right? I want to have a strike through, like if I, if I did do the task, we can show it with this checkbox, but let's also cross off this text. So if you look at the style in the text style, the decoration, we can go for text decoration line through. There you are. Cool, so right now I actually made it to be always a line through, but we wanna kind of follow whatever this checkbox is doing, right? Which is good because we have this task completed Boolean. So we can say, all right, in the decoration, depending on if the task is completed, if it's completed, let's put a line through it. If not, let's just copy this. And we should just be able to see a none option. Okay, so this Boolean will control this for us. So let's check this out. Cool, if I check this, then it's a line through it. And if we uncheck it, then it's back to normal. Cool, so we want to kind of put a line through it to get that dopamine hit as we do these tasks, you know? Okay, cool. So in terms of our to-do app, it's looking pretty good so far, except for the fact that we can't add or delete a new task, right? So that's going to be the crucial bit of functionality we need. So let's focus on that one. So first of all, let's create a floating action button. So if I go below the app bar, you can start typing floating action button. And the widget is also called floating action button. And we have to specify on pressed. If I save it, there it is. Let's give it a child. So I want to have a plus button, maybe an add button. 
Yeah, here it is. And so if I click on this, if I unpress it, what do you want to do? I want to create new task. So this method, let's come up here, create a new task. So void, create new task. Now what I want to happen when I create a new task is I want to show a dialog box so that the user can input the name of the task. Okay, so we can say show dialog. And this is where we return an alert dialog. And so if I just save this, yep, there's nothing there because we didn't create it. Now, usually we can create it inside here, but again, just to keep our code nice and clean, let's create this in a separate folder. So this is where the util comes in handy. So in the utilities, let's say um, dialog box. I'm going to call it dialog box. And so we're going to return an alert dialog. And now we can come back here and we can say dialog box and press tab to auto import it. Okay, so this dialog box we're going to create in this file here. So let's have a look at what we're going to do. So in the content, let's create a container, maybe height of 200. And the alert dialog, let's give it a background color of yellow. So let's just restart this. And if I click this, cool, here it is. This is our little, little box that we want to have a text field now. So let's create a column and I'm going to create a text field. So get user input. And then also below that, I want to have some buttons like a save button and also a cancel button. Okay, so if I just save this right now, we just have a text field in there. So we can just type stuff in. Cool, so the text field, it's fine the way it is, but I like to have a border around it. So let's say in the decoration, input, decoration and you can see in the border I want to have a outline input border which if you save yep I kind of want I like this style just having a border around it as opposed to just a line cool and we can give it a hint text or maybe that's inside the decoration and this should be a string yep so let's say add a new task. Here it is. And then if you click on it, then you can start typing. And this yellow, actually, let's make this a little lighter. Cool. Okay, looking good. Now, below that, we're gonna have a row of buttons. Okay, so I want two buttons, a save button, and then a cancel button. So these buttons, let's actually create another separate file so that we can reuse this button widget. I'm just going to call it my button. Cool. And when we think about creating this button, what are the two things that we need? We need to know the button's name, right? And we also want to know the unpressed. And so for this one, I'm going to use a void callback, which is a, um, it's a gesture detector. Like it's a, it's a method, but it's going to return nothing. Okay, so remember in the other one, we returned a Boolean. This one is just going to be a void. And let's call it on pressed. And let's create these constructors. And the button itself, we can actually use a material button here. And so the on pressed is going to be whatever we create in the other page and the child is going to be a text widget because this is just a widget and let's just give it the text cool and the color of it let's use the theme so theme of context color 
primary color. Okay, so now that we created a little button, let's come back to our dialog box. Let's say my button. And so here it is, let's press tab to auto import it. And the text, the first one I want it to be a save button. And on the on pressed, let's just execute nothing for now. And let's create another one down here saying cancel. Cool, so here's our two buttons. Now I actually want to have it more on the right hand side. I want to have it like on the end. And also this column, let's space evenly. Cool, and actually we want to have a bit of a gap here. So I'm gonna put in a constant sized box width of just four, I guess. Yeah, I just want a bit of a gap there, maybe like maybe eight. Now when the user types some stuff in here, how do we access this bit of text? Well, let's go to our text field and you can see that there is a controller. So we can give it a controller. Now, I want to be able to access this controller in my home page. So I'm just going to create the controller as a constructor. So when you create this text field, you need to give it a controller. And we can give this controller to this guy. And so what we did is if you come back to the home page, you can see that the dialog box has a red squiggle because we have to give it a controller. So I'm going to create my text controller. So I'm just going to say controller is text editing controller. And give this controller to this guy. Cool. So this would give us access to whatever we type in here. Now we now need to create the method for save and cancel. Okay. So coming back to our dialog box right now, if I press save and I press cancel, it executes nothing. So let's create the methods here, right? So let's say void callback on save, void callback on cancel. Require this on save, require this cancel, my boy. Let's get rid of this constant tag. And this method, let's pass through to this guy. Cancel method, give to this button. So again, what did we just do? We now, coming back to our home page, our dialog box has a red squiggle because we need to create these two methods. So on save, let's say, um, just save new task, which we haven't created. And on the cancel, uh, we could create a new method, but this one is just going to execute one line of code. So I'm just going to say navigator dot of pop. And what that does is it just dismisses this dialog box. Uh, for this one, we'll create a new method though. Now, when we click save, so let's say um, code. And when I click save, I want to do a couple things. Uh, if I just set the state, I want to add whatever's in here into this list. Okay, so let's say to do list dot add. And we're going to add a list because the first thing is going to be the controller and the text in the controller. So remember the controller is what we can use to access this bit of text. Cool, and if you're gonna add a new task, then obviously you haven't completed the task, right? So let's just say it's false for the Boolean. Cool, and let's see how this looks. So if I say add a new task, let's say code a new app, and I hit save. You can see actually behind it, if you look carefully, it created the new task, but I wanna dismiss this damn box. So let's say navigator, dot of context and just pop it. Okay, so let's just restart this again. Code new app, hit save, dismisses the dialog and we just added a new task to this list. Cool, and actually one last thing is if I click this button again, it still says code new app, which we wanna clear. So go to the controller and just clear it. 
Okay, sweet. So now we can add new tasks, right? Like let's just add this and let's say code app. And we can keep adding this stuff. Now let's actually have a way to remove a task. So obviously we can check off the checkbox and say we did it, but maybe we want to be able to just delete it entirely. So this one, what we're going to do is if I go back to my to do tile, I know a perfect widget for this. If you go to your pubspec.yaml, let's just include one dependency because this will make our app feel nice and good. Under the Cupertino icons, it's called Flutter Slidable. And we're going to go with version number, let's go with one, whoops, 1, 1.2.0. So again, I made a separate tutorial covering just this slidable widget. So check that out if you need, I'll link it below. But I can show you here real quick what we need to do. So save this pubspec YAML and close it. And now go to the container of our to-do tile. So that's just this tile here. And we're going to wrap this container in a widget called slidable. There it is. So what this does is you can actually spend, specify this end action pane. There's a start action pane and an end action pane. So that just means are you dragging from the left or are you dragging from the right? So I want to drag from the right, the end. And here we're going to give it an action pane. And if you have a curious, just hover over this to see what it requires. You can see motion and I need to give it children, right? For the motion, if you look at the actual package, there's a few different uh, animations I guess you could go for and the one I want to go for is just a stretch motion and then the children so in the children so if you slide you can have multiple options but I just want to have one option so slidable action and then the point of this slidable action is to delete this task so I'm going to say a delete function is what we need to do and we need to give it an icon let's go with that bin and also maybe a background color let's go with like a red Cool, so if I come up here, every time we create a to-do tile, we need to give it a task name, a boolean of if the task is completed or not, and this unchanged just to check this on and off, right? Now let's create one more function, which if you hover over the unpressed, it wants this type of function. So function build context, and I called it a delete function. Okay, so let's make sure to require that as well. And so if I come back to my home page now, we should have a red squiggle somewhere on this to do tile. So the delete function, what should happen if we delete it? I don't know why it's called PO, but I'm just going to change the name of it to be context. And let's create a new task called delete task, which we haven't created. So we have a create new task. Let's also have a delete task. So void delete task. And we actually want to know which task we're looking at. So let's require an index, right? So is it zero, one, two, or three? Let's give it the index. And the way to delete a task is basically to just remove it from this list, right? So let's say set the state and to do list dot remove. And I want to go for remove at because this is going to require an index, which we already gave it. So let's check this out. Let's restart this motherfucker. Okay, so we've got these two things. And actually, let's check this. Hey, there it is. So you can, this is what the slidable widget does. Again, it's super sharp, and I hate sharpness. Let's come back to the slidable action. And it's already got a border radius property, my man. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Cool, so these were the default tasks that we always gonna have when we open up the app, right? But now we can just delete it. <laughs> and we can have no tasks at all, which is good. This will be a nice functional standalone app. Cool, so our app looks like it's working pretty well. But one thing you'll realize is, let's say I add a new task here. And so I've got three tasks, but if I close this app completely and open it again, it's just going to come to the default. So it doesn't have any memory. So that's why we're going to use 
the Hive local database so that we can store some of this information on the phone. So I've made a separate tutorial on Hive itself, so check that out, I'll link it below. But I can show you real quick how we can use this in our to-do app. So the first thing is to go to your pubspec.yaml and let's add the dependencies in. So you've got to add these two dependencies, there's this Hive and also the Hive Flutter. And we actually also need to add it under these dev dependencies. So again, check out my Hive tutorial for more detail. This is just straight from the documentation. And we have to do a little bit of setting up. So if you go to your main function, let's initialize the Hive. So let's start typing Hive. And if you click, let's import the library we just put in our pubspec YAML. And you should be able to see this init flutter. Cool, and we actually also need to make this function asynchronous and we can await this. So that's how we initialize Flutter and we also need to uh, open the box, or I guess open a box. So we can say like var box await hive open box and here we can create a new box so we can call it uh, whatever you want. Let's just say my box. And so if you come to our home page, if you ever need to reference this box, you can say we can store it in a variable. So like final my box is hive and then we can open the box. So let's make sure to import hive here as well. Cool. Now, while we're doing some database work, let's actually create a new file. Create a new folder here called just data. And let's create a new file called database.dart. And in this, I'm going to create a new class. So to do database. Okay, so let's separate our homepage UI from the database related stuff. Okay, so let's reference the box as we did earlier. And we're going to need to import Hive here as well. Let's open the box which we created my box. When it comes to this to do list, so this make tutorial and do exercise is the default uh, tasks that we can have when the user first opens the app in the history of the app, like the very first time. So this is going to be the default information, right? So I'm actually going to say, let's say like list to do list. And let's just start with an empty list here. And without doing any more customization, I actually want to now delete this list. But all of our other code requires us to work with our list, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, to do database and I'm going to create an instantiation of our database. So to do database, I'm just going to call it DB for database. And we can create an instance of this class. Okay, so we're going to have this to do list that we can access. So all of these red squiggles of the to do list we had before, you can just put DB and a dot in front of it. Okay, so this is the sort of overall to-do list we can use. Okay, now we need three, um, we need three methods here. So the first one is create initial data. So this is going to be used if run this method, if this is the first time opening this app first time ever opening this app. Okay, and if this is the first time opening this app, let's just say to do list is, and let's put our default tasks. So make tutorial and it's false. Do exercise 
and it's also false. So if this is the first time the user has ever opened up the app, then let's just show these default, um, these default tasks, just to give the user idea on what this app is actually doing. Now the other method is we need to load the data from the database, right? So void load data. And just before we fill this out, we also need to update the database. Okay, so if the user makes any changes, we also want to update it in our Hive database. Okay, so if this is the first time running the app, then the to-do list is going to be these two tasks. Now, any time after the first time the user opens it, it would mean that we already have some information in our database, right? So let's say to do list equals to my box dot get. Oh, actually I made a little mistake. The hive open box, we just need to say box when we reference it. Yeah, we don't need to open the box. So in the main file, we'll open the box. And then in our code, if I want to reference the box, we can just say hive.box. So now we can say in our load data, to-do list is equal to my box. And let's get the to-do list. So the way Hive works, like I said, I'm gonna link my separate tutorial for Hive below, but the way it works is it's like a key value pair. And so, we can call the key to-do list and then it will return our um, to-do list. And same thing with the updating the database. Like if I make any changes, if I check these off, then that means our to-do list would have, would have changed. And so I want to update the database. So let's say my box dot put, and then for this key, I'm going to put in the to-do list. Okay, so it goes two ways. We can update the database and then we can also get the data from our database. Okay, so how does this actually work? So now that we've set up these three basic methods, if we come back to the home page, what we really need to do is to look at the init state. So the initial state. So when the app first runs, we have to do a couple checks. Okay, so I want to say if this is the first time ever opening the app, and create default data. Right, so how do we do this check? Well, let's just reference the box and we're gonna check in my box and let's get this key value. Now, if this is null, right, if there's nothing in there under the to-do list, then that means we've never stored any information. So this is the first time ever opening the app. So if that's the case, then let's just go to the database and create initial data, which will execute this and give us some default data. And then else, whoops, else there already exists data. So this is not the first time that the user has opened the app. Then I can say database and just load the data. Okay, and this will execute this function and it'll go to the my box. And if there's something in the to do list, then let's put it in our list here. Cool. And then finally, we have the update the database. So this is kind of going from our app session data to giving it to our Hive database. And so I actually want to execute this anytime the user makes a change. So anytime, like if the checkbox happens or they add a new task. Anytime the user makes an interaction, then let's update the database. Okay, so the checkbox was changed, then let's update the database. Save a new task, update the database, and create new tasks, we're good. If we delete, then update the database. Awesome, so this should, this should work. So I'm going to, Let's restart this. Cool, so this is the first time opening the app. So let's just say I'm gonna check these off and let's see if it remembers. Hey, and there it is. So it stores the memory. So if I have a new task, new task, 
and I create it here and I kill this app and I open it again, it's still in the memory. So this is how we use some local database storage to make our app more functional. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm gonna show you how to code an e-commerce app like this sneaker shop I coded up where the user can browse through the shoes for sale and add them to the cart. The user can also, of course, remove items from the cart. So let me show you how to do this by jumping into the code. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and you should just get this demo Flutter app. So what I'm going to do is the first thing is to prepare some images we might need. So I've got that in this folder and I've got four different shoes and also a Nike logo. So I just got this off the internet. So make sure to just prepare some images and go to your project library and let's drag this image folder in. So let's come back to our project and tell the pop spec YAML. If you scroll down, you can see the assets. So just comment this out and tell it to import some images in. Cool, so now everything below the main function, I'm just gonna delete and let's create this from scratch. So let's create the, our, our material app and for the home page, the first thing I wanna display is actually the intro page. So let's create a new folder called pages and create intro page. And so this will just be that nice greeting message at the beginning. So let's make sure to import this. Cool. Now for the background color, I'm gonna go for a bit of a light gray as opposed to a completely white background. And in the body of the column, we're going to have the logo at the top and let's just have a bit of information like some text on the bottom. And a button so that the user can enter the app. So starting with the logo, this is just going to be our image. So this one right here. Now we can control the height of this image. And also let's make sure to center the column. Cool. And maybe we could add some padding around this as well. Sweet, now let's use some sized boxes. So this will just be some empty space. And below that, let's have a title. So let's say, just do it. Now this one, I wanna make a little bit bolder and bigger and create some more space. And for the subtitle, let's say something else like brand new sneakers and custom kicks made with premium quality. And this doesn't have to be bold. It can be a bit smaller and maybe let's make it gray. Cool. And also let's center this alignment. And I'm just gonna add some padding on the sides here. There we go. Cool. Now the last thing is the start now button. So this one I'm just gonna create using containers. And let's say like shop now. And let's create a bit of a dark button. Now that means our text should be white. And let's of course curve the corners here. Cool, now this is looking really good. Now let's just go to this container and wrap it in a gesture detector. And if the user taps this button, then let's navigate to a new page. So we're gonna go to home page, which we haven't created yet. Now for this column, I'm going to space this out. Now I'm just gonna comment this out for a second and if I save this, you can see it's spaced out nicely. So now let's create our home page.
and import it. Cool, so now we should have a blank app inside. So far so good. So now in the scaffold, the first thing I'm gonna do is to create the bottom navigation bar. So I'm actually gonna import a Google nav bar and I've made separate tutorials for this one. So check that out if you need, but I think this one looks pretty modern. So I'm gonna create this in a separate folder called components. So let's call it my bottom nav bar and it's going to be the GNAV. There it is. And so for the tabs, I'm going to have pretty much two tabs. So the first G button is going to be home or shop, let's call it. And the other one is going to be the cart. Okay, so now we can go to the bottom navigation bar here and import this. Sweet, so you can see there it is at the bottom. Now let's just decorate this up a little bit. So it's gray there for the unselected options. And if it's selected, then make the gray bit darker. Also, let's have a bit of a border here. And fill in the colors. Cool. Which reminds me the background color of the home page. Let's make it the same light gray. Cool. Now, one thing I like doing with this one is the main axis alignment to be in the center. I actually like this in the middle because we only have two options anyway. Cool. And let's just add some padding and the border radius seems very round. So you can make this a little sharper if you like. Yeah, I like that kind of squared off look a little bit better. Sweet, now the main thing here is really the on tab changed value. So this function, right? Let's just copy it to the top and require it. Right, so if you come back to the home page, we should have a red squiggle because we have to fill out this on tab change. So for this, I'm just gonna change this to index. Now this is just basically for navigating the bottom bar. So let's try to create the create the stuff up here. Now the first thing is I need to have a integer to keep track of the selected index, right? So starting at zero, let's have a method to update our selected index, right? So zero for the home and one for the cart. So with a given index, let's just update it using a quick set state. Cool, so now that we've got that taken care of, we need to have some pages that we can navigate between, right? So the first thing is a shop page, which we haven't created. And the second one is the cart page, which we also haven't created. So let's do that now. So for now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to create some text in the middle. Just so I can see this working. Okay, so if I save this, and it looks like it's not showing, and that's because we have to give it to the body. So now if you give the pages to your body, you can see now we go from shop to cart. So everything is set up nicely. So now we can just fill out in the shop page file. Now, just before we do that though, let's fill out one last sort of setting up, which is if I create an app bar here for the leading, I want to have a drawer icon. So like a menu icon. There it is. If I press this, I want to open up the drawer. So the background color for this, I actually want it to be transparent, elevation also zero. So I basically don't want to see an app bar, but I do want to see that menu icon. So if you want to open up the drawer, you can say scaffold of context, open drawer. And 
just create a blank drawer here. So let's try this out. So it looks like we have a bit of an error. And that's because we should wrap this button in a builder. Okay, sweet, so there it is, there's our drawer. So now we can start decorating this drawer. So this one I wanna make a bit darker and let's have a column of like the logo and some other pages we can go to. Cool, and if you didn't know, you can actually change the color of an image, which I'm gonna do. And let's create a quick divider here. So this one's just a a line, that's all it is. Cool, and believe, uh, beneath this, we can now create other pages. So let's just create some list tiles here. And so we can have a home tab, just create some padding and everything is dark. So let's just make this white. And we can copy this and maybe create just a couple more. So this one is going to be highly dependent on your app, right? Like what, what pages you want your app to include. So I'll just show you how to sort of set this up and then you can decide on what what buttons you want here. So I'm just gonna have these three buttons, so home, about, and logging out. Now I want the logging out at the very bottom. So I'm going to wrap everything on the top in another column. And then let's space out this entire overall column. Cool, so that way we can push the log out to the bottom. So let me know or comment below if you have any questions. I'm happy to come and explain this in more detail if you need. Okay, so now we can come back to the shop page and start filling this out. So again, let's have a bit of a, a bit of a plan. On the top of my column, I want a search bar. And then I want a bit of a kind of nice message and then the hot picks, which is the list of shoes. So for the search bar, I'm not actually going to incorporate the functionality of a search bar here, but let's just include it anyway, because we might need it later on. And building UIs with Flutter is just so fun. Make sure to curve these borders. Okay, so that's the search bar. And then underneath, I just wanna have a little message here. I saw this at a Nike shop before. I thought it was pretty cool. I think it's like a Michael Jordan quote. But yeah, everyone flies, some fly longer than others. Just a nice, cute little message. Okay, finally, now for the main part of this entire app is this hot pics. So let's put in some text first. I'm gonna put in a fire emoji and make this um, have the see all option as well on the side and let's change up the style. Now for the see all, I think this one could be like blue. Yeah. Sweet. Now underneath these, we can now have a list of shoes. Cool, so I want to use an expanded list to fill up the rest of the space and we're going to return a shoe tile, which I'm going to create now in my components. So basically a shoe tile, I just want like a kind of card 
to display the shoe and the price and all that stuff so let's try that now now with a given shoe we should be able to fill out the shoe tile now this is a good time for us to actually create the models so let's go to our library and create a folder called models and what models is 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 basically say the first one is going to be shoe dot dot so that's the main sort of product for our app and so we can create a class for a shoe and what do different shoes have so the different shoes have a different name different price they have a different image and also a different description. So let's create the constructors for this so that we can create it in other places. Cool, so now we can import this shoe tile. So with a given shoe, So let's create a container here and let's just add some margin to the left hand side because I don't want to stuck on the left side of the screen. Cool and for the child I'm going to create a column and for a bit of a plan let's say I want to have a shoe picture and then the description underneath and then the price below that and also a button to add the cart. So let's start with the image of the shoe picture. That should just be with a given shoe, we can get the image path of that shoe. So let's actually come back to the shop page and pass through this shoe. Okay, so what I mean is we can create a new shoe here. Right, so in the list view builder, when we go through the index, starting from zero to however many shoes we have. We can go through the image file. So just as an example, we can create a shoe here and give this shoe to our shoe tile. So if I just save this, by the way, if it's not loading, forgot to do the item count here. So just say like four and the scroll direction, I actually want to change it from vertical to horizontal. And it looks like something on the top corners look a little weird. I think it might be because of the image. Let's wrap this image in a clip R rect to curve the corners. Now for the description. Just go shoe description and this one can be kind of gray. Okay, now for the bottom part of the shoe tile, I'm going to create a row. And a column at the beginning, which contains the name and then the price below that. So let's just save this as we go along. Now you see that plus button? I want to go to the row and say space between to push it to the end. And then here, yeah, let's see. In the column, let's do the same thing. Now for the plus button, I want to wrap it in a container because I want to kind of give it some color. So in the decoration, let's say black, which means my plus button should be white. And I want to sort of use a border radius, but only for the top left and bottom right. Yeah, that's the kind of look I want to go for. And now looking at the left hand side, let's align this to the start and space this out a little bit and change up the style so the name of the shoe should be much bigger
and let's add padding just to the left hand side okay and also let's align the cross axis alignment to the start okay this is looking pretty good now I'm just gonna add a quick divider at the bottom just to just to give us some space Cool, so now it's time for us to create a new model called cart. So I'm gonna create a class here and just a bit of a plan again. We want a list of shoes that are for sale. We want the list of items that the user put in the cart. And then a couple of methods, so a couple of get methods. So getting the list of shoes for sale and getting what's in the cart. And then what the user can manipulate is adding items to the cart as well as removing items from the cart. So this should be the functionality of the app. So starting with the shoe shop, it should be a list of shoes. I'm just gonna create the four different shoes that we have. Okay, so the Zoom Freak. Let's say the price is 236. And then for the description, I'm just getting this off the Nike website, but you can put in, you know, any bit of text here. And the image path is where our shoe is. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and fill this out for the four different shoes that we've got. So we've got the Air Jordans, um, the Zoom Freak, which we started with, then the Kyrie and KD tray. So, yep, let me just go ahead and fill this out. Cool, now the list of items in the user's cart. So again, this is also a list of shoes. And for the user cart, it'll be just blank at the beginning, nothing in the cart. And then we can also get the shoe list. So let's just return the shoe shop. And we can also get the user cart. So let's just return the user cart. And for the two methods that the user can manipulate is adding an item to the cart which we would need to know which shoe that they're adding. And then also, same thing for the removing. So let me know if you have any problem understanding any bit of this code, just comment below, I can help you out. Now, I'm gonna come back to my pubspec.yaml and I'm going to import this package called provider, which is a very simple common state management in Flutter. So I'm just gonna do the sort of setting up here. So in the main function, let's wrap this in the change notifier provider. And coming back to the cart model, let's extend the change notifier. And also notify the listeners anytime we need to update the state. Cool, so we need this to sort of deal with having a lot of different states in a few different pages like the cart as well as the shop page so so if you come to our shop page we can now wrap everything in a consumer so that we can consume the data so if you look at this value we can say okay coming to the list builder here this one right here we kind of manually input it in right so what I'm gonna do is instead of this part, let's get value, let's get the shoe list, let's look at the index, okay? And the index is going from zero to the item count that was specified. Cool, and there it is. One thing I can just see in the shoe tile, I should add some padding here. Wait, now this plus button, we need to make it clickable. So let's wrap this in a gesture detector. Sweet, now if I come back to my shoe tile, we have a on tap function. So let's add shoe to cart and let's give it an individual shoe. So we haven't created this method. So let's come to the top and let's create the adding the shoe to cart method. So we've created it, we just need to access it using our provider. So you can see here the add item to cart and then we can just give it the shoe. 
Now, one thing sort of good uh, user experience is you should let the user know something happened. So if you added it to the cart, let's just create a show dialog and say successfully added. Okay, so let's check this out. Yay, there it is. Cool, and then now if I come back to my cart, we should display it here. So let's go to your cart page. And let's use a consumer. And we're going to create a column here. So let's just have a bit of a heading here that says my cart. And then below that, after some space, let's have an expanded list view. So expanded will just fill up the rest of the space. And in the list view, let's do something similar. Let's get each shoe and return the cart item. So we can get the individual shoe from the user cart. Okay, and return the cart item. So this one, I'm going to actually separate out the code in a different file. I'm just gonna create it in my components. And so the cart item, when given a shoe, let's create a little tile here to display in the cart page so i'm just going to use a list tile again and for the leading let's put in a little image of the shoe okay and also let's display the shoe name and also the price underneath it Okay, so if I save this, I can add it, and it looks like we have a bit of an error, and that's because we didn't do an item count. So let's get the user's cart and just the length of the user's cart. Cool, and you can see if I add it like in the cart, we have it. So if I add another shoe, then we have it in the cart as well. So there it is. Now let's just decorate this up real quick. Add some margin and the border radius. Those are the main things that I like to decorate. Cool, now one thing is I need to change this cross axis alignment. I need to add a deleting button. So in the trailing of this list tile, let's add in a icon button. And we need to allow the user to remove this item from the cart, right? So let's create this method. Well, this one needs to go in an icon. Cool, so let's use a provider and access our method that we created before. and give it the shoe. And there it is, there's our delete button. So now we can delete. So we can add, and we've got the shoes here, and we can also remove them. Cool, and so that's the basic functionality that's done. So I think the app aesthetically also looks pretty good. So let me know what you guys think. If you made it this far into the course, congratulations. That type of perseverance and work ethic is what will make you a good coder. Yo, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm gonna show you how to switch from light mode to dark mode. Now, I'll show you how to do it both manually through the app itself, and also how to do it automatically with the phone system settings. 
So like for example on an iPhone you can change it from light mode to dark mode in the control center. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function I'm running my app which brings us to our material app and I've got my pages in a pages folder. So currently I just have a home page which is a blank scaffold. So you should have a nice white blank app like this. So in the scaffold, this is where we can set a background color, right? Now, just to save us some time, I created us a couple of components. So I have a box and a button. So this is the code for my box. You can take a closer look at it if you like, but essentially it's just got a width and a height and we have a child that we can give it. So I think it's better if I show you visually what this is. So in the body, in the center, I'm just gonna create my box. And this box requires us to fill out two parameters. So like I just showed you, we can specify a child. Let's just give it a text widget for now. And a color, let's create a similar purple color, but maybe make it a bit lighter. And for the child of this box, let's bring in our button. So again, this is what the code for my button looks like, but essentially it's just a gesture detector with a container inside. So if I come back here, you can start typing my button and we can specify the color for it. So again, I'm just gonna use a similar deep purple color, but maybe make it a bit lighter. And then we can fill out this on tap. Currently, let's make it execute nothing but I'll show you later on how we can use this button to change from light mode to dark mode. So in any of your apps that you're building, I think having sort of three different levels of colors is a common situation. So we have the background color, we have the sort of primary color, and then you've got that secondary color as well. Now the purpose of this tutorial is for light mode versus dark mode. So I'm going to create a new folder here called theme and let's create a file called just theme.data. And so in here, firstly, we have to import our material design and we're going to create two themes. So one for the light mode and then one for the dark mode. And the very first property I just want to show you is the brightness. So I'm going to set the brightness for light and dark. And then if you come back to our main.dart file, you can see in the material app, we can specify a theme. So let's give it the light mode first off. And you can actually specify a dark theme. So let's give it dark mode. And right off the bat, the differences that you can see is if I toggle the appearance, which is the theme of the system of your phone. So you can change from light mode to dark mode on your actual device. And currently the only thing that's changing is the text. Right, and you can see that status bar as well is changing from white to black. And so all of those default colors for like the text and the status bar is going to be controlled by the light and dark. So that will take care of a lot of the little things. Now let's be more specific in the colors that we want. So for the color scheme, for the background color, let's say I'm gonna have gray with a shade of 400. And let's do something similar for the dark mode. But for this gray, I'm going to make the shade 900. So it should be a lot darker. Cool. So if you come back to our home page, if you look at this scaffold, we've currently got it as blue. So now we can get rid of this and say theme dot of context, go to your color scheme and then just select background. And if I just restart this, so depending on if we're in dark mode or light mode on your actual device, it'll show the two different colors. Cool, so this should make our code much more cleaner and easier to deal with. So that was the background color. There's a couple more you can specify. So you got the primary and this one, I'm gonna say a little bit lighter and let's do something similar for the dark mode as well. I'm just gonna make it slightly lighter, but this is where you can specify the colors that you want precisely for your app. Now the three main things I believe that are useful to use are background, primary, and also secondary. So coming back to our home page, similar to how we did this background color, let's also change the color of the box and give it the primary color and secondary for my button. Cool, and then if I save it, you can see there's the dark mode version. And if I change to light mode, then this is how we can easily switch between the two modes. 
Awesome, like I said, these few properties are probably the main things that you'll really need to use. But you can see there's a lot more options here you can specify. So play around with it and have a look. And now that the colors are done, I want to spend the rest of this tutorial just to teach you one more thing, which is to allow the user to manually switch between light mode and dark mode within the app. So currently it's just a system wide setting. So like if you have a iPhone, you can control in the settings or in the control center for it to be light mode or dark mode for the entire phone. And then this Flutter app will reflect that system wide change. But sometimes you want your app to be able to have a kind of manual switch within the app. So I'll show you how to do that as well. Now for that, we're going to need a state management. So let's bring in provider in the pubspec.yaml. And in the theme folder, let's create one more file called theme provider. And so for this one, we're going to need to use some provider. And I made a separate tutorial for provider. So if you want more in depth on how to use this, then check out that tutorial. But I can show you here real quick. So for the first theme, let's just have it as light mode and we can create some getters and setters. And we need a method here to toggle the theme. So let's just do a quick check. If this current theme is light mode, then change it to dark mode else change it to light mode. Now if I come back to my main file, make sure to wrap your app with a change notifier provider. So we can give it our theme provider and also our app. Cool. Now if I come back to our material app, you can get rid of this dark theme. And for the overall theme of this app, we can go to our provider and access the theme data like this. Let's say if I come back to my home page and you got this button, let's say I want to use this button to toggle between light mode and dark mode. So you can see if I hit this on tap, currently it's executing nothing. But now let's say provider and try to access that toggle method. There it is. Cool, and then if I save it, you can see I can manually toggle between light mode and dark mode from within the app. Let's say you have an app and you have multiple different pages. You have to start thinking about how we're going to organize the data so that you can provide the correct information to each page. Now in Flutter, the default way is to use set state to reflect any changes to the data. And set state pretty much just asks the app to rebuild the widget with the new change. But let's say our app is a little bit more complicated than that. Let's say we have a shop app and you can add items to the cart. So from the shop page, you can navigate to other pages like the individual item page or the cart page. Now it seems reasonable to have all the data at the top level in the shop page and pass them down to the next page as you need to. But as the app grows to multiple pages, what ends up happening is you get this sort of tree architecture. And this is bad for a few reasons. When a new change is made, because all of the data is controlled at the very top level, it may be expensive for the performance to rebuild the entire widget tree every time. Also, your code is gonna get very cluttered over time and it's going to be difficult to see how the data is flowing through your app. So instead of this tree shape, Let's just line up the pages side by side and create a separate layer called provider. And this can give each page whatever it needs, whenever it needs it. This will make your life so much easier as you scale up your app. Now I'm going to show you in code how to actually use provider. And to make it as clear as possible, I'm going to use the default counter app and show you how we can make the same app, but with provider. So just to keep everyone on the same page in my main function, I'm running my app and this is giving us this home page and this is a stateful widget. So as you can see, this little bit of information, the counter starting at zero and we've got a method to increment the counter. And if we want to make any changes, then you can see it's wrapped in a set state just to rebuild. Also, if I press this button, then we can increment it. Cool. So this set state is just going to rebuild the widget. And like I said, this is how you would do it in a very simple app. Now, I just want to show you how we can do this using provider. So first of all, let's go to our pubspec.yaml 
and if you scroll down to the dependencies, I'm just going to import provider and I'm just going to leave the version number empty, which will get me the latest version. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a separate layer here called the counter model. So in here, we're going to create a class and put all the counter related information in this class. So we had that count being zero. And let's also have the method to increment the counter. Cool, so if you come back to our home page, we want to keep this just for the UI as much as possible and not much logic. So if I get rid of this, you can see there's going to be some red squiggles because we have to provide that information to this UI, right? So if you come back to our class, we have to extend this to the change notifier. And anytime we make a change, like this method here to increment the counter, once we increment it, then we can notify the listener. So this will just let any widgets that need to update know. So just a couple more setting, setting up to do is we just need to come to the main.dart file and your entire app. So you can see in this run app, I'm going to wrap this entire app here in a change notifier provider. And in this create, this is where you have to give it the model. So we're going to give it the counter model and in the child, just give it our app. So we just wrap the entire thing in change notifier provider. Cool. So now if I come back to my homepage UI, you can see the red squiggles because we have to give it the value of the counter, right? So if I want to consume that information, then we're going to use a consumer widget. So if you just grab this scaffold, I'm going to start typing consumer and we have to give it the type. So the counter model is what we're looking for. And then we can just build that UI here. So if you look carefully here, you've got the context and then the value. So the value is the important bit of information. So value gives us access to everything in that model. So for example, we can say in the text, I want to display that counter. Let's say value dot count. And then we can just say convert it to a string. And same thing for the method. So let's say instead of just accessing an integer, I want to access that increment method. So first of all, let's get access to the model class. And then we're going to increment. So let's get the counter. We're going to say context.read the counter model. And then we can access the methods in here. So counter and you can see increment. Cool. So if you save this and rebuild it, it should behave the same way. And so basically, again, just to sum up, what we did is we separated out the UI from any of the logic into this separate class. And we're using provider to just provide the information that we need to whichever widget needs it at the time. So this will make your life a lot easier when you have more and more pages and your app grows in size. Yo, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm gonna show you how to code up this minimal e-commerce app. So the user can browse through the products and add them to the cart. And of course, you can also remove an item from the cart. And we want to eventually end it with the pay button. So just to have a bit of a quick overview before we start coding, like I said, we're going to start off with this intro screen just to greet the user. And then we're going to go to the shop page where the user can browse for the products and they can add products to the cart and also remove the products from the cart. And we can go between these two pages. And once the user is happy, then they can click the pay button so that we can get paid. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and you should just get this demo homepage. Now I'm going to delete everything below the main function just to code this up from scratch. So in my material app, let's start off with the intro page. And for all the pages, I'm just going to create a separate folder called pages just to keep our code nice and organized. And so let's come back to our main.dart file and import this page that we just created. Sweet. So we should just have a blank scaffold and this is where we'll begin. Now, first thing is for the background color, I just want to have a kind of like a gray color. But instead of fixing this color manually here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder called themes. And I'm going to create a file called light mode. And I'm just going to put all the colors here just to keep it consistent and organized. So what I'm going to do here is for the background color. So I wanted to get the shade of 300 and the main ones I want to specify here are the primary 
the secondary and also the inverse primary. So essentially I just have different shades of gray for my app. You can choose whatever colors you want, but I'm just gonna go with these colors here, which I think look pretty good. So if I come back to my intro page, like I said, instead of just specifying this gray color, what I'm gonna say is theme.ofcontext, go to the color scheme, and then we can access all of those different ones that we created. So we can say background. Cool, this way, if we ever need to change colors later on, we can just come to this theme file and just change it up to whatever we want. Sweet, now for the actual UI of this page, for the intro page, I'm just gonna have a big column here and let's just create a quick plan. So at the top, I want kind of like a logo and then a title, a subtitle, and then let's have a button to enter into the shop. So for the logo, you can put in whatever your logo is, but I'm just gonna start off with a icon maybe like a shopping bag icon for now. And let's make it a bit bigger. And then the color. So again, if you want to access those colors, just go theme dot of context color scheme. And I'm going to go with inverse primary. So that's just the dark color. Sweet. And then let's have a size box just to create some space. And then for the title, I'm just going to call it minimal shop. And then the subtitle, you can have a kind of like a slogan. So I'm just going to say premium quality products. And in terms of the design, it's a good idea to make the top one a bit bigger and bolder. And the bottom one a bit more lighter. Cool. Now it's time for the button. And instead of just creating the button here, I'm just going to, I'm probably going to want to reuse this button later on in the app. So I'm going to create this in a separate folder called components. And I'm going to create a file here called my button. So this button, I want it to be tappable. So let's have a gesture detector. And so on tap, you can see it requires this function. I'm just going to grab this one. And I'm just going to require it on the top when I create this button. And so for the look of this button, let's have a container with a, with a child, which I'm actually also going to require at the top. So what we did here is if I come back to my intro page and I try to get the, my button, you can see there it is auto import. So just hit enter and let's start filling this out. So for the on tap for now, let's execute nothing and the child let's give it like an icon sweet and you can see there it is so let's come back to our button.dart file and decorate this up let's give it a color let's give some padding and the corners are so sharp so let's just curve those corners and let's just space this out a bit Okay, sweet, it's looking good. Now, if I click on this, I wanna to go to my shop page, which we haven't created yet. So let's just create that in our pages folder. And when it comes to navigation, I created a separate tutorial just about navigations, but it's a good idea to have some routes. And what I mean is we can, list out the different pages that we have. So for example, we have the intro page and we've got the shop page now. And so if we just specify these routes, then when I click on this button and I want to navigate, we can say push named and we can just go to that route name. And so you can see if I click on the button, then we come to the shop page. Sweet, now let's start decorating the shop page. Now the app bar looks quite funky. Now I wanna make it very minimal. So for the background color, I'm actually gonna go transparent. It's got a bit of a shadow there. Now let's say elevation zero. And the foreground, let's give it a dark color. And then now we have to start filling out the drawer. So if you just say drawer and you save it without specifying anything further, you can see it's got that blank menu drawer here. And so I wanna start filling this out. And so same thing with the button. 
With the drawer, I want to create it as a separate component just to keep our code nice and modular. So let's give it a background color and let's have a big column with a bit of a plan. So at the top, it's usually a good idea to have a drawer header, which is kind of like the space for the logo. And I'm going to have three list tiles. So I want a shop tile, a cart tile, and another one just to exit the shop. So let's start filling this out. So for the drawer header, I'm just going to use the same icon that I did at the intro page. But like I said, you can bring in your own logo or image here, whatever you want. And then let's just space this out. And then usually you create this as a list tile. And again, I'm just going to create this as a custom list tile just to make it look nice. And if you think about what varies between these list tiles is I want the text, I want the icon. And I also want the on tap. So if you come back to our drawer now, you can say my list tile, order import, and then start filling this out. So the first one, I just want to say shop. And I think for the shop, I think a home, like the house icon is appropriate. And currently for the on tap, let's just execute nothing just to see how this looks. Sweet, there it is. Now I think we could use a bit of padding on the left hand side. Nice. And so let's just create more of these list tiles and change up the text and the light and the icon. Now for the last tile, like the exit shop, I actually want that on the very bottom. So one little trick you can do is group everything else in another column so that in this overall column, you essentially have two items in there and then we can space between and then it'll push the other thing to the bottom. Now that's too close to the edge though. So I'm just going to put another padding here just to space from the bottom and that's looking pretty good. So now let's handle these on tap functions. So for the shop, we are already on the shop page. So if the user clicks on this, then let's just pop this drawer. And if we click on the cart page, then now we want to navigate to the cart page. So for this, we still do want to pop the drawer and then we want to go to the cart page. Now we actually haven't created the cart page. So let's just do that real quick. and specify the route. And sweet, we can now go to the card page. So now let's start filling out this page. So I'm going to have a similar app bar as I did to the previous page. Now for the exit shop title, we want to go to just the intro page, just to go back to the very first screen. And it looks like we have a bit of a typo slash. Sweet. Now our app is looking pretty good. So now that we've got this template down, we want to now have the products and the shop. So for this, I'm going to create another folder called models and let's create our first product. So this is going to be a template of what a product should be. So every product, we need a name. I need a price. I want a description and we're going to also have an image later on as well.
Now let's create a model for the shop. And so in a shop, we want to firstly have a list of products for sale. We want to have another list for the user's cart. And let's have a couple of getters. And then the main important functions here are the adding item to the cart and also removing an item from the cart. Those are the two main functionalities. So let's start off with having the list of products for sale. And I'm just going to call it shop. Let's have our first product here and we can fill it out. So I'm just going to keep it quite generic. So I'm just going to say product one, price is 99, 99 cents, some item description and the image path. Now for the image path, I'm actually just going to comment that out for now and we'll do that at the end just to keep it simple. So I'm just going to copy this and create four products. And then for the user's cart, it's just going to be an empty cart at the beginning. And we want to have a couple of getters, which just means if anywhere around the code, we want to get the shop, then we can just return what the shop is and same as the cart. Great, which brings us to the main important functions, which is the adding to the cart. So as a parameter, I'm going to need to know what the product I'm about to add. Okay, and simply we can just add it to the cart. Same thing for removing, just I just want to know which item I'm about to remove and just remove it from the cart. Cool, now for us to display this on our app, we're going to need to create a nice little UI component called product tile. And so as a parameter, as long as we're given a product, then let's create a nice product tile UI for this. So just starting off with a column. I want a I want the product image at the top, the product name, the description, the price, and also maybe a button to add it to the cart. So like I said, the image part, I'm going to show you how to do just a bit later on. So just to keep it nice and simple, I'm just going to put in an icon, maybe the favorite icon, which is like a heart and the text. Let's get the product name, the product description and the product price, which is actually a double, like it's a number. So we're going to have to convert it to a string with two decimal places. Sweet, now I'm going to bring in a package called provider, which is a very popular simple state management solution. So if you open up your terminal, let's say flutter pub add provider and just import this package. I've made a separate tutorial on how to use provider. So check that out if you need, but I can show you here real quick how we can use it. So essentially, if you go to the shop, we want to extend this to the change notifier. And any changes we make, like when we add to the cart and we remove from the cart, we want to notify the listeners. And what that means is we just want to update the UI for the components that are listening to these changes. So we just need to do a quick setup here real quick, which is at the main function. We have to wrap our app in a change notifier provider. For the shop and return our app. Cool, so what did we just do? Now, if I come back to my shop page, we can access the products in our shop. So we can say context.watch the shop. And you can now see all of those methods that we had before. So we can just get the shop. And now in the body of this page, let's create a quick list view.builder. And what we're going to do is we're going to get each individual product from the shop and just return it as a product tile UI. We have our list of products going through each index, which we should actually specify the item count. We want to have just the length of the products. And we're going to go through the index of each product. And return it using our product tile that we created. Cool, so let's just save this and rerun just to see what this looks like. And there it is. Cool, now it doesn't look that pretty, but we can decorate this up now. So if I come to my product tile, I think we could use some decoration here. 
like give it the primary color and some margins and also padding for the inside children now I did the margin as 10 inside so if I come to my actual list I'm gonna have a padding of 15 which makes it 25 all around so you can see everything is spaced out really nicely now you know I really hate sharp corners so let's curve these corners there we go and also I actually want this scroll direction to be horizontal nice and it's currently filling up the entire space so I'm just going to wrap this in a sized box just to fix the height of 550 And the product tile itself, I'm going to specify a width of maybe 300. Yeah, I want a card that looks like this. And so this icon, this favorite heart icon is where we want to actually put the image later on. So I'm just going to set it up nicely for that. I'm going to wrap this in a container. And just add some decoration with the secondary color. And padding. So I want this to be a square. Now one little thing you can do is you can say the width double dot infinity, which just means fill up the entire width. And then I'm going to wrap this in an aspect ratio widget. And I want the ratio to be one, meaning it's a square. Okay, it's looking pretty good. Now let's just have another sized box. And everything's aligned to the center. So if you look at this cross axis alignment, I want it to be at the start. And let's change up these text widgets. So the product title should be bigger and bolder. And the description should be much more lighter. That's looking good. And for the price, I want that to be at the very bottom. So kind of like what we did earlier in the drawer, I want to collect everything above it and put it in its own column so that we can say main axis alignment, space between. And what that's gonna do is just push that last widget to the bottom. And the reason why this step is very important is because you probably want to have more text in the description, right? Like we want some more space there just in case we are going to type some more in the item description. Sweet, and then we want to have a button. So I'm gonna wrap this in a row. And beside the price, I'm going to have a button. So let's just have a add button. And just decorate it up slightly. And so if I click this button, I want to have a add to cart method.
And just before we do add it to the cart, let's just show a dialog box just to ask the user if they want to actually add it to the cart. Like let's get confirmation. So add this item to your cart question mark. And let's have a couple of actions. So we want two buttons here, one for canceling and one for yes. So if we cancel it, then we just want to pop the box. If it's a yes, then we want to pop the box, but we also finally want to actually add it to the cart. And so you can go to the context dot read in the shop. And there's our method add to cart. Sweet. So if I restart this and I click the plus plus button, then you can see there's our box. Do you want to add this to your cart? Let's say yes. And if I go to my cart page, it's still empty because we didn't fill it out. So now let's fill it out. So we're going to have a big column and we want to have a cart list for the majority of this page. And then let's have a pay button at the, at the bottom. So let's start by getting access to that cart. And create a list view builder. So it's going to be similar to what we did on the shop page. We're going to get the individual items in the cart and just return it as a list tile. So we'll give it the name, we'll give it the price and also a trailing icon for us to remove this from the cart. Now this showing dialog to confirm if we if the user actually wants to remove it is going to be quite similar. So I'm just going to copy that earlier dialog that we created and just change up these to remove. And we need to know what product we're removing. So let's actually require that as a parameter as well. Sweet, and whoops, we forgot to specify the item count, which is just however long the cart is. Sweet, okay, let's try this. So if I add this to the cart and I go to the cart page, you can see there is the item. And we can also click this minus button to ask the user if they want to remove this. Sweet, that's looking really, really good. Okay, now one thing I wanna do is you can see the majority of this column is the cart list. Now at the bottom, we wanna have a pay button. So let's use our button. So in my button, we want to say pay now. And let's just create a method here real quick saying user press the pay button. And so what I'm gonna do is, let's just require the context just so that we can show another dialog box. And I just want to say, user wants to pay, connect this app to your payment backend. Awesome. Now, another kind of UI thing that is useful and good idea for you to do is if the card is empty, instead of showing a blank page, let's write a little note. So what I mean is if the cart is empty, question mark, then let's just return a text widget saying your cart is empty in the middle. So there it is. So if I just save this and I rerun it, I can add items to the cart. And there it is. And if I pay now, you can see that that button works. And if I remove an item from the cart, then it tells me that the cart is empty. Looking pretty good. Now, just for convenience, I think it's a good idea to put a cart button on the top app bar so that we can always access it. So in the app bar, in the actions, let's create a quick button here for the cart. Okay, 
There it is. So of course we can access the cart in the drawer, but we can now also access it right from the app bar, which is handy. Sweet, which brings us to the images. So I've actually already prepared some images. So I've got some square images here, like the glass, the hoodie, the shoes, and the watch. So you obviously don't need to use these exact images. You can choose whatever images you want and the products that you're selling. So let's say you have some images in a folder called assets, and then go to your project and you just want to drag that into your project. And then we want to come back to our code and we have to tell it in the pubspec.yaml that we are bringing in some assets. So if you scroll down, you can comment this little bit out and specify where the assets folder is. Sweet, so save it and close that. And if you come to my product model, remember we commented this out. So let's now try to have an image, right? So when we create our products, we have to give it an image path. And so just for the first product in the assets, what is it called? So assets slash, let's say glasses.png, make sure to write the exact file name. And I'm just gonna do the same thing for the other ones. Sweet, now if I come to my product tile, this is the UI to display it. And right now we are displaying just this favorite heart icon. So I'm just gonna remove that and let's say image.asset. And then we can just say the product.imagePath. And that should be good to go. So save it. Now it might be a good idea, especially when you're bringing in assets like this, it might be a good idea to just kill your app and just rebuild it. And if you rebuild it, then you should get no issues. And it looks like we have some nice images there for the products. So there's a very minimal functional e-commerce app. So I'm just gonna leave it out there for this video. We made some good progress and implemented the basic functionality that you need in a very minimal e-commerce app. Hey, what's up? Let me teach you about null safety. So if you clicked on this video, then you would know what a normal variable is, right? So variables by default are non-nullable, meaning it cannot be null. So in other words, it must have a value. So let's say like integer x, then you can see it's got a red squiggle there because it says here, the non-nullable variable x must be initialized. So that's just saying we need to give it a value, right? So this is how normal variables behave. Now I'm gonna show you about this question mark. So if you put a question mark after a variable, it means it can be null. So for example, if I say integer with a question mark and I say y, then unlike before, this one doesn't have a red squiggle. And in my main function, if I just sort of print out what y is, then you can see it just has the value of null. And just to be clear, when an integer is null, that's different from the integer having a value of zero, right? Null meaning it doesn't have a value at all. But of course you can also give it a value if you like. It's just saying it can be any integer, but it can also be null. And then you have this double question mark. And what that does is it provides a fallback value in case the variable is null. So for example, let's say I'm gonna have a string that can be null. And let's say we wanna get a name from the database. And this happens sometimes. So if you get a name or a value from the database and maybe that doesn't exist, then it will return null. And that might cause errors in your app. So for this string, let's say it can be null, right? So if I just print this, you can see it's got a null value. And then let's say I'm gonna have a string. Now I wanna actually display this name in my app, right? So let's say we're going to give it this name from the database, but you can see it's got a red squiggle because it could potentially be null. And so in this case, if I say double question mark, what this is saying is if the name from the database happens to be null, then let's just give it no name. So if I print out name in app, you can see it says no name because the name from the database is null. So this is the general idea of null safety so that our app doesn't crash. Now, again, like I said, of course, this name from the database, most of the time we should have a value, right? So like if I say it's got a value of Mitch, then that value is what we're going to give to our name in the app. Awesome, now the next couple of things I wanna teach you is this exclamation mark. So. If you have an exclamation mark after a variable, it means that you 
are certain that this variable is not null. And so let me show you what I mean. Going back to our name from the database, let's say we have the value Mitch. And I want to print out the name from the database. And then if you hit dot, we can access a lot of these different methods, right? So a very common one is going to be length, right? Let's print the length of this name. Now you can see it's got a red squiggle again because it says here, the property length can't be unconditionally accessed because the receiver can be null. So try making the access conditional using either this question mark thingy or an exclamation mark, right? So what this is saying is because our name from the database potentially could be null, it's not gonna have a length at all, right? So that's why we have this red squiggle. But if you know that is definitely gonna have a value, like in our situation here, we know we're gonna give it Mitch. And so you can put an exclamation mark to sort of let the system know that 100% this is not gonna be null so that we don't have any errors, right? So if I print this and you can see the length of Mitch is going to be five characters. Going back to this error, you can see we just did the exclamation mark, but then you also have this other way of doing it, which is this question mark with a dot. So with this one, it's called a null aware operator. And what this means is you can use it to access a property or a method. So kind of like this length that we had earlier of an object. And a couple of things to understand about this. So if the object before this null aware operator is not null, it's just gonna return like normal. But if the object before this null operator is, is null, then it will just return null. So let's try this out. So this name from the database, you can see the type, it potentially could be a null. So if I give it a question mark before this dot, then the error goes away and everything will just work fine. And so if we get rid of Mitch and there isn't a value here, so it's null, it will still work fine. And then it will just print out null as opposed to having an error. Now, again, I'm just gonna explain this here. So without the null aware operator, you will get errors for using properties and methods like this length on null values. So simply, in other words, this null aware operator helps you gracefully handle null values without your app crashing, which is really helpful. Now, a couple of things to understand that I feel like is useful to know, which is before null safety was a thing, we had to do a lot of manual checks, something like this. If the name from the database is not null, then we can do stuff like we can do save code in here since we manually checked to make sure it's not null. So we used to have to do these sort of checks all the time just to make sure everything's all good. But now we can just use these little null safety features to make our code much more easier and cleaner to read. Awesome, now the question is, when do I use the question mark version versus the exclamation mark version? So I'm gonna just show you the advantages of each of them. So starting with the null aware operator, the advantages of this, the first advantage is just safety, right? So using this null aware operator is safe when dealing with nullable objects. So if the object happens to be null, the expression will just gracefully return null without throwing any exceptions or any errors in your code. Right, so going back to our name from the database. So currently we didn't give it a value. So this name from database is null, as you can see. And so if I were to use this exclamation mark version, let's see what happens. Right, so remember this exclamation mark is us telling the system for sure that this name from database has a value. Right, so just to show you, like if I say again, it's got a value of Mitch. So we know for sure that it's not null. Then if I just restart this, then everything is fine. But if we get rid of this and it actually is null, but then in our code, we're telling it with this exclamation mark that it for sure has a value, then that's a mismatch and basically we're wrong. And so if you run this, then you're gonna get this error. It's saying null check operator used on a null value, meaning it's null, but we're telling it it's definitely not null. So you'll get this error. Right, so that's the advantage of using this question mark version. It's just much safer to use and it will just gracefully handle it without throwing these errors. The other advantage is just having cleaner code in general. So you can simplify conditional checks. So remember I showed you before null safety, you had to do these manual checks, right? So instead of using a longer condition, like for example, like let's say we have a student and we would have to check, make sure it's not null 
right? Make sure there actually is a student. And then if there is a student, then let's return that student's name. Otherwise, we're gonna return null. So this kind of longer condition is something we don't have to do anymore. You can just say student question mark dot name. So in this case, ultimately what we just want is the student's name, right? But because it could potentially be null and we're gonna have some errors, that's when this question mark is really handy. And so that makes our code much cleaner. Well, if that's the case, then when would you ever use the exclamation mark? So the advantage of this exclamation mark version is explicitness. And what I mean is by using the exclamation mark after a variable, you're explicitly stating that you expect the value to be non-null, like it has a value. But let's say it doesn't go according to our expectation. And if it does end up being null, then the code will throw an error, which you saw earlier. And that's actually sometimes useful because that can actually make debugging straightforward since the error will point directly to the line that has that error. Whereas the previous one, the question mark version, is not gonna show any error, it's just gonna handle it for us. And so your code will be handled you know, gracefully and so you won't even know really where the null happened. So these are the advantages of using these two different checks. If you have any questions so far, just let me know below. But this was just the theoretical understanding. But just to make our understanding more concrete, let's use a practical example, which I always find helpful. So imagine a school where students take an exam, right? Let's say the exam is out of 15 marks. And at the end of the year, the school wants to print out the marks of every student. However, not all students took the exam. Okay, so if I just create a quick student class here, let's say every student needs a name. So I'm gonna require this when we create a student. And let's also create an integer for a score. But for this one, I'm gonna put a question mark here because it potentially could be null. And so I'm not gonna require it. Right, why would that be the case? Well, maybe the student was absent and didn't even take the test. And then at the end of the year, the school wants to print out the mark of every student. So let's just create a list of students here. Let's say I'm gonna create my first student called Mitch and let's give him a score of seven. Let's create another student called Sarah, and this Sarah person is absent, so I'm not gonna give I'm not gonna give her a score. And let's just create some more students here. So you got John, you got Lucy, and then Ben with a score of zero. And then another person, Jaden, who was also absent. So the key idea you need to understand about why null is a thing is null is different from a score of zero. Like you can have a student that did take the test, but he just got everything wrong and got a score of zero. That's different from someone who was absent and didn't take the test. You understand? Right, so this is the list of all of the students that we have. And then let's try to print out the student's marks. Now to do this, I'm just gonna create a method real quick to convert a score into a percentage. So let's just create a quick method here where we are going to accept a score as an integer, but this score could potentially be null because the student could have been absent. And let's say the total number of marks is 15. And to do some math calculation on this, we're going to need a double. Let's say double percentage. So let's convert this score to a double since the score is an integer. And let's multiply by 100 and divide it by the total number of marks. So this is how obviously you would make something into a percentage. But you can see there's a squiggle here because it says here that the receiver could be null. So let's put our question mark, our null aware operator here. And it looks like we still have an error. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to use our double question mark, right? So remember this means if our left-hand side happens to be null, then let's just return zero so that our calculation can move forward. Awesome, and then let's finally, let's try to return this as a percentage, as a string. So the first thing I'm gonna do is let's just check this score that we are given, is it null? If it's null, then let's say absent. Otherwise, let's return that percentage. Now I wanna return the percentage 
to string as fixed and this one just means how many decimal points so let's just say zero decimal points i just want a whole number and maybe let's attach a percent sign on here as well awesome now let's come back to our main function and let's try to print out the student's marks so let's do a for loop and go through each student in the list of students and we're going to print the student's name so let's say the student's name's mark and then get that score as a percentage and we can change this to interpolation if you like to view it like that better but let's have a look i'm going to save this and then rerun this so we had these scores that we gave them and some of the students were absent so mitch's mark is 47 percent sarah's mark well she was absent and then we have all these different percentages now the key thing again like i said what i want you to understand is having a score of zero is different from not having a score right so if you don't have a score then that's equivalent to being null and so these kind of situations happen a lot like we saw in this particular example where some variables could be null and so all these little question marks and exclamation marks all of this stuff is to help us with our null safety so that our code doesn't crash now i tried my best to explain null safety as simply as i can so I want you to have a think about this and if you have any questions on anything we looked at today, I want you to comment below so I can try to help you out. Hey what's up, welcome back to another quick flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to teach you how to store data in the device's local storage using a database called ISA. So you can go to isa.dev to check it out in more detail, but I can show you real quick how to do the basic CRUD operations, which if you don't know, it stands for create, read, update, and delete data. So to demonstrate this, let's create up a very basic notes app. So I've opened up a new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function, I'm running my app and I've got this pages folder with the notes page and it's just returning a blank scaffold so you should just have a white blank app like this now the first thing we need to do is to import the isa database dependencies so i'll link the documentation below but this is just what i'm following so we just want to grab all this and get the packages so just then we should have added three packages and i'm also going to add another one the provider package just for some simple state management Cool, so if, what we just did is if you go to your pubspec.yaml, you should see these four things that we just imported. Cool, now let's create a new folder called models. And the first thing we have to do is create a model of the note. Let's start by importing ISA and let's create our class. So for the note, I just want to know the ID and you can say isa.auto increment. So this will just start from zero and then go to one, two, three, each time you create a new note. And then the most important thing for a note is just the text, which is a string. And I'm gonna put the late tag here because we're going to initialize it later. Cool, so this is how you create a regular class. Now for isa, you're going to need to add this line, part note.g.dart. So it's gonna be this exact same file name as what we had before, but we're gonna put the g in there for generated. Okay, so this line is needed to generate the file. And then we're going to run this command. And we need to put a collection tag before this note. We're basically gonna run this little command. So simply what we're doing here is we wanna save some things in our ISA database, right? Now, because I created a custom object like this note, and this will generate this new file for us. And that basically just allows us to store these notes in the database. It says do not modify by hand. So don't touch this, but this step is just required so that we can save our notes in the database. Cool, so now that we've done that, let's create one more file here called note database. And in here, I want to have all of the operations. So the first thing we need to do is just to initialize the database. And then we're going to do the CRUD operations. So create, read, update, and delete. So using this, we can create a nice little note app. Okay, so for us specifically, we're gonna create a note and save to the database. 
we're going to read some notes from the database, update them, and also delete a note. So let's fill this out. Now at the beginning, we want to have the ISAR object, and we're going to create the method to initialize all this. So the first thing is we just need to know the directory where we're going to save it. So at the top, if you just import the path provider, this was one of the packages we imported at the beginning of the video. And so this thing just helps us get the path directory for where all of this is going to be saved. So await isar open, and we just need to pass it the schema, which if you type note schema, this is just telling us the type of data inside. Cool, and for the directory, we can just pass it the directory path. Cool, so that's how you initialize it at the beginning. Now we also need to have a list of notes. So I'm just going to call this current notes and it's just going to be an empty list at the beginning. And let's start off with creating a new note. So to make this more clear, I'm going to call it add note. And as a parameter, I'm just going to require a string that is a text. Cool, so final new note equals, we're going to create our note object. So once we created a new note object, let's then save it to the database. So we can say isar.write transaction, and we want to look for the put. Cool. And then after that, we want to reread from the database. Okay, just to update the changes. So let's fill out the read method here. And again, I'm just going to, to be clear, I'm just going to call it fetch notes. We can say isa.notes where find all. So this will just grab all of the notes in the database. So let's just clear our current notes and then just add it all in. Cool, and then now it's time for the update. So if I want to update a note, then I just need to know the ID. And we want to also know the new text. So let's firstly get the existing note by identifying with that ID. And if this note isn't null, so if it exists, then let's assign the new text. Okay, and then we can write the transaction again, isar.notes put the existing note. So this will update it. And then we can reread everything by calling the fetch notes method. And lastly, let's delete a note. So for this, all I need is just the ID. And then we can say write transaction, and then delete. And let's fetch the notes again. Awesome, so that's the CRUD operations for the note database. So remember this initialize method? Let's come back to our main.dart file and we're going to initialize the note database. So firstly, we're going to do widgets flutter binding ensure initialized. And let's change this to an asynchronous function so that we can await the note database and initialize. Cool. Now to create the actual note app, I'm going to use provider for some simple state management. And so I've actually made a separate tutorial on provider and you can check that out if you need, but I can show you here real quick how to use it. We've already imported it at the start of the video. So if you come to our note database, then we can say extends change notifier. And the other thing we need to do is just to go to this fetch notes and I'm going to say notify listeners. And what that does is we're going to notify the widgets that are listening to these changes. So pretty much it will update on the screen. So just a little bit of setting up to do in the main function. When we run my app, wrap it in the change notifier provider. And in the create field, we want to create the note database. And then in the child, we can return my app. Cool. And then once you save that, it's probably a good idea to just kill the app and run it again. And now we can come to our notes page and start filling this out. So from here on out, I'll show you how to do the UI and the buttons and all that to connect our database so that we have a simple notes app. So I'm just going to start off with an app bar, just saying notes. And we're going to need a floating action button. So you can see it's that little button on the bottom right. 
and we can give it an icon. Now let's come up to the top here and I'm just going to create those four methods real quick, the CRUD operations. And what this is for is to deal with any UI related stuff. So for example, like when we create a note and we click on this button, we want to show a dialogue and have a little box here with a text field so that we can actually get input from the user. So this is all like the UI related stuff. So if you just save this and you run it and you click on that plus button, you can see it's going to open up this dialog box with the text field inside and you can start typing in. And so now if you want to access what the user typed in, we need a text controller. And so if you look at the text field underneath, it says controller and we can give it our text controller. Cool. Now I think we're going to need a button. So if you go to the actions, let's have a create button. So if we click on this button on pressed, let's say context.read note database. And then now you can access all of those options from before. So we want to add note. And let's just give it the text in the controller. Cool. So this line, we'll just add it to the database and then let's give it a child. Now, one thing is when you click this create button, we actually want to pop the dialogue, right? We want to dismiss the box so we can say navigator.pop and that will pop the box. So now we have the ability to add notes into the database. We're going to need to read the notes so that we can actually display it on our screen. So let's fill out this read notes method and fetch notes. Sweet. So now that it's all loaded up, let's come down to the build method and access the database. And create the list of notes. Sweet. So now it's in current notes. We can now create a list view dot builder. And we want to firstly get the individual note by going through each index like zero, one, two, three. And then now we can return the list tile UI. Oops, I forgot to give it the item count. So that's just going to be current notes dot length. Okay, let's try. So if I save this and I open it up, you can see that there's the notes. Now, one problem is it's actually not showing up on the startup at the beginning of the app. So in the initial state, let's read notes. And I think we should, we can actually change this from watch to read. Yeah, that works. So what we just did here is on app startup, we can fetch the existing notes. Cool. So now we can add notes in. Now, one thing that we should improve on is once we added a new note, we should clear the controller because it's still got the previous note in there. Sweet. Now, if you come down to our list tile UI, we need some buttons here. So on the trailing, I want to have a row because I want two buttons. An edit button and then a delete button. So that's going to be for the update note method. And so for the update note method, let's require the note that we're updating as a parameter and let's pre-fill the current note text into our controller. And show the dialogue with the text field. Cool. So this is very similar to the previous dialog box. So if you have any questions, just let me know below in the comments. We're going to clear the controller, pop the dialog. And that's pretty much it.
And then let's just fill out the delete node as well. So for this one, we just need to know the ID and then just go to the node database and then delete. Sweet. So now let's come back to our UI and create icon buttons for the update. and the delete button as well. Okay, awesome. If you click on the delete, yeah, it all works. And editing works as well. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how to code up a minimal notes app with a very nice aesthetic design that has both light mode and dark mode. So I've opened up a new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function, I'm running my app and I've got this pages folder with the notes page and it's just returning a blank scaffold. So you should just have a white blank app like this. Now the first thing we need to do is to import the ISAR database dependencies. So I'll link the documentation below, but this is just what I'm following. So we just wanna grab all this and get the packages. So just then we should have added three packages. And I'm also gonna add another one, the provider package, just for some simple state management. Cool, so if, what we just did is if you go to your pubspec.yaml, you should see these four things that we just imported. Cool, now let's create a new folder called models. And the first thing we have to do is create a model of the note. Let's start by importing ISA and let's create our class. So for the note, I just want to know the ID and you can say isa.auto increment. So this will just start from zero and then go to one, two, three, each time you create a new note. And then the most important thing for a note is just the text, which is a string. And I'm gonna put the late tag here because we're going to initialize it later. Cool, so this is how you create a regular class. Now for isa, you're going to need to add this line, part note.g.dart. So it's gonna be this exact same file name as what we had before, but we're gonna put the G in there for generated. Okay, so this line is needed to generate the file. And then we're going to run this command. And we need to put a collection tag before this note. We're basically gonna run this little command. So simply what we're doing here is we wanna save some things in our ISAR database, right? Now, because I created a custom object like this note, and this will generate this new file for us. And that basically just allows us to store these notes in the database. It says, do not modify by hand. So don't touch this, but this step is just required so that we can save our notes in the database. Cool, so now that we've done that, let's create one more file here called note database. And in here, I want to have all of the operations. So the first thing we need to do is just to initialize the database. And then we're going to do the CRUD operations. So create, read, update, and delete. So using this, we can create a nice little note app. Okay, so for us specifically, we're gonna create a note and save to the database. We're going to read some notes from the database, update them, and also delete a note. So let's fill this out. Now at the beginning, we want to have the ISAR object and we're going to create the method to initialize all this. So the first thing is we just need to know the directory where we're going to save it. So at the top, if you just import the path provider, this was one of the packages we imported at the beginning of the video. And so this thing just helps us get the path directory for where all of this is gonna be saved. So await ISAR open, and we just need to pass it the schema, which if you type note schema, this is just telling us the type of data inside. Cool, and for the directory, we can just pass it the directory path. Cool, so that's how you initialize it at the beginning. Now we also need to have a list of notes. So I'm just gonna call this current notes, and it's just going to be an empty list at the beginning. And let's start off with creating a new note. So to make this more clear, I'm gonna call it add note. And as a parameter, I'm just gonna require a string that is a text. 
Cool, so final new note equals, we're going to create our note object. So once we created a new note object, let's then save it to the database. So we can say isa.write transaction, and we want to look for the put. Cool. And then after that, we want to reread from the database. Okay, just to update the changes. So let's fill out the read method here. And again, I'm just going to, to be clear, I'm just going to call it fetch notes. We can say isa.notes where find all. So this will just grab all of the notes in the database. So let's just clear our current notes and then just add it all in. Cool, and then now it's time for the update. So if I want to update a note, then I just need to know the ID. And we want to also know the new text. So let's firstly get the existing note by identifying with that ID. And if this note isn't null, so if it exists, then let's assign the new text. Okay, and then we can write the transaction again, isar.notes put the existing note. So this will update it. And then we can reread everything by calling the fetch notes method. And lastly, let's delete a note. So for this, all I need is just the ID. And then we can say write transaction, and then delete. And let's fetch the notes again. Awesome, so that's the CRUD operations for the note database. So remember this initialize method? Let's come back to our main.dart file and we're going to initialize the note database. So firstly, we're going to do widgets flutter binding ensure initialized. And let's change this to an asynchronous function so that we can await the note database and initialize. Cool. Now to create the actual note app, I'm going to use provider for some simple state management. And so I've actually made a separate tutorial on provider and you can check that out if you need, but I can show you here real quick how to use it. We've already imported it at the start of the video. So if you come to our note database, then we can say extends change notifier. And the other thing we need to do is just to go to this fetch notes and I'm going to say notify listeners. And what that does is we're going to notify the widgets that are listening to these changes. So pretty much it will update on the screen. So just a little bit of setting up to do in the main function. When we run my app, wrap it in the change notifier provider. And in the create field, we want to create the note database. And then in the child, we can return my app. Cool. And then once you save that, it's probably a good idea to just kill the app and run it again. And now we can come to our notes page and start filling this out. So from here on out, I'll show you how to do the UI and the buttons and all that to connect our database so that we have a simple notes app. So I'm just going to start off with an app bar, just saying notes. And we're going to need a floating action button. So you can see it's that little button on the bottom right. And we can give it an icon. Now let's come up to the top here and I'm just going to create those four methods real quick, the CRUD operations. And what this is for is to deal with any UI related stuff. So for example, like when we create a note and we click on this button, we want to show a dialog and have a little box here with a text field so that we can actually get input from the user. So this is all like the UI related stuff. So if you just save this and you run it and you click on that plus button, you can see it's gonna open up this dialog box with the text field inside and you can start typing in. And so now if you wanna access what the user typed in, we need a text controller. And so if you look at the text field underneath, it says controller and we can give it our text controller. Cool, now I think we're gonna need a button. So if you go to the actions, let's have a create button. So if we click on this button on pressed,
let's say context.read note database and then now you can access all of those options from before. So we want to add note and let's just give it the text in the controller. Cool, so this line we'll just add it to the database and then let's give it a child. Now one thing is when you click this create button, we actually wanna pop the dialog, right? We wanna dismiss the box. So we can say navigator.pop and that will pop the box. So now we have the ability to add notes into the database. We're going to need to read the notes so that we can actually display it on our screen. So let's fill out this read notes method and fetch notes. Sweet, so now that it's all loaded up, let's come down to the build method and access the database. and create the list of notes. Sweet, so now it's in current notes. We can now create a list view dot builder. And we want to firstly get the individual note by going through each index like zero, one, two, three. And then now we can return the list tile UI. Oops, I forgot to give it the item count. So that's just going to be current notes.length. Okay, let's try. So if I save this and I open it up, you can see that there's the notes. Now, one problem is it's actually not showing up on the startup at the beginning of the app. So in the initial state, let's read notes. And I think we, should, we can actually change this from watch to read. Yeah, that works. So. What we just did here is on app startup, we can fetch the existing notes. Cool, so now we can add notes in. Now one thing that we should improve on is once we added a new note, we should clear the controller because it's still got the previous note in there. Sweet, now if you come down to our list tile UI, we need some buttons here. So on the trailing, I want to have a row because I want two buttons. An edit button and then a delete button. So that's going to be for the update note method. And so for the update note method, let's require the note that we're updating as a parameter. And let's pre-fill the current note text into our controller. and show the dialog with the text field. Cool, so this is very similar to the previous dialog box. So if you have any questions, just let me know below in the comments. We're going to clear the controller, pop the dialog. And that's pretty much it. And then let's just fill out the delete node as well. So for this one, we just need to know the ID and then just go to the node database and then delete. Sweet, so now let's come back to our UI and create icon buttons for the update. and the delete button as well. Okay, awesome. If you click on the delete, yeah, it all works. And editing works as well. Sweet, so now let's create a new folder called theme. And I wanna have a light mode and a dark mode for our app. So for the brightness, we wanna make it light and the color scheme, I already chose the colors that I feel like is appropriate for light mode. So you can just copy what I have, but essentially I wanna fill out the background color with a shade of 300. And then you can have a lot of variations. So the primary color, 
the secondary color and also I like to have an inverse primary which is like the opposite color so a very dark one. Let's copy this and create another one for the dark mode and for this we're just going to make it a lot darker. So you can use whatever colors you want but let's try these numbers out. Let's create a new file called theme provider so that we can switch between the two modes. So firstly Let's say it starts off as light mode. And let's have a getter so that we can access what the current theme is. And we also want to have a getter method for if it's dark mode or not. So this will be helpful. So this is going to be a boolean where you return a true or false. So if you do this little check here, this one is going to check is our current theme data equal to the dark mode. So this is going to return a true or false. And let's have a setter method so that we can set the theme. And mainly what we need here is just a method to toggle the theme. So if the theme data is light mode, then let's change it to dark mode and vice versa. So let's just add some comments here so that you guys know what this is all about. So if you come back to our main.dart file, remember we already have a change notifier provider for our note database. But I also want to have another one for our theme. So in that case, we can actually have multiple providers. So one for the node database and then one for the theme. And then if I come back to our material app, you can specify in the theme. Let's use our provider to get the current theme data. Oh, looks like we have a bit of an error and whoops, I forgot to give the child our app. Sweet, so if I save this, we can see some of the themes already got changed. Now, if I come to our notes page, which is the page we're currently looking at, let's decorate this up. So for the app bar, I like to make the elevation zero, so no shadow. And for the background color, I'm just going to make it transparent. So we don't really see an app bar because I actually want my title to be a custom title. So like a custom heading in this column. So let's say like notes. And let's just align this to the start. And let's just add some paddings and decorate this up. To make our app look a little fancy, I'm going to introduce a Google font. So let's just add that package in. And of course you can choose any Google font that you like, but I personally want to use this one, DM serif text. Cool, and remember how we had the colors in light mode and dark mode, right? So we can say theme dot of context and then go to the color scheme and then you should be able to see all of those options that we had from before. So for this one, I'm going to use inverse primary, right, which is that color. And by the way, I like to make the text not completely black and just make it like a kind of dark gray. So that's what this color is. And for this one, maybe we can just put a padding just on the left of 25. And if you come to our overall scaffold, you can specify the background. So go to the color scheme and let's just give it the background. So it should be like a light gray. Awesome. Now time to add a menu drawer. So if you just give it a drawer widget, you can see on the top left, there's that menu. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate this drawer out into a new component. And let's just call it my drawer. 
and just give it the background color. And we're going to have a column with a few different things. So first of all, for the header, it's always a good idea to use a drawer or a header. And let's just give it an icon. And before we fill this out any further, I want to just save this and come back to our scaffold. And let's just import my drawer, which is what we just created. Cool, so that's what it currently looks like. And let's come back to our drawer.dart file. And we want to have a couple of list tiles here. So one for the note and one for the settings. Now, even for this, because we're going to probably repeat some codes, I'm going to create a drawer tile as a separate component. And essentially, this is just a list tile. And what I want to know between each tile is the title and also the leading icon. And actually also we want to know the on tap. So if you tap this, we can grab this function here and let's just require it when we create this widget. Sweet, so let's see what this looks like. If I come back to my drawer, we can say drawer tile, there it is. So auto import. And let's just fill this out. So one for the notes and one for the settings. Cool, and there it is. Now I think we could probably give some padding to the left. And we can just style this up to what we want. Cool, now let's fill out the on tap. So if I tap the notes tile, I just wanna go back to the original page, which is where I'm currently at. So what I'm gonna just do is, we're just going to pop the dialog. So navigator.pop, and what that does is it's just going to pop the drawer. Now when it comes to the settings, we actually don't even have a settings page, so let's just create that real quick. And so if I tap on this settings tile, we want to firstly pop the menu drawer like before, but then let's also navigate our way to this new settings page. And let's just try it out. And sweet, we go to this new settings blank page. So now let's turn our attention to filling out this settings page. So just starting with the background, let's give it our background color. And let's just give it an app bar. And same as before, I just want the elevation to be zero and transparent. And the reason why I still want an app bar there anyway is because I just want that little back arrow, those kind of leading icons there. Sweet, now in this settings page, all I really want is just a switch for the dark mode. So let's just put this in a row. And I'm going to use a Cupertino switch, which is the Apple looking one. So for the value, if I just say true for now, and we don't do anything on the on change. Let's just see what it looks like. And yep, there it is. So that's the kind of Apple style switch. You can say true or false to make it on and off. So this value, let's go to our provider and we can access our theme provider and we can get the Boolean is dark mode. So remember how we created that earlier? It's just gonna return a true or false. Cool, so currently it's light mode, so it's off. On the unchanged, if we flip this switch, what we want is to go to our theme provider and then just toggle the, th toggle the theme. Right, so if I click this, you can see now everything is dark mode. Cool, and that's looking pretty good so far. So I'm just gonna decorate these texts really quickly.
and let's space this out and wrap this in a container so that we can just kind of make this look a little nicer. And I don't like sharp corners, so let's make the border radius more curved. And this is looking really cool. Now in our components, let's create another one called Note Tile. And so for each Note Tile, I just want to know the text. And I'm just going to decorate this up kind of with those borders and the curved borders as well. So you can see currently in our note page, we're returning this list tile UI. So we pretty much want this, but we're going to just decorate our own custom one. So we're going to add some padding and some margins. And we have to add in the trailing section, we need to add those two buttons for the edit and the, and the delete. So we're actually going to need to require those functions when we create this node tile. Awesome. So if I come back to my note page, we just have to fill out this note tile. So on edit, Let's give it our update note method. And then on delete, let's give it our delete note method. Awesome. So that's looking pretty good. Now I just want to fine tune some of these colors. So if I come back to my theme, right in the dark mode, we can actually click on a more specific color. So I actually want everything to be a little bit more darker. Yeah. And the tile itself, which is the primary color, I want that also a little bit darker. And so you can just play around with this to fine tune the colors to exactly what you want. Cool, so let's just make sure we can edit the note. And even this dialog box, right, it's a bit too gray for my liking. I want it a bit darker. So I think we didn't even give it the color, did we? Yep, so in this alert dialog, let's give it the background color. And same thing for the update note dialog. And yep, that color looks much better. Uh, what else? The floating action button on the bottom right, it doesn't look too good. So let's go to that guy. And I'm just going to firstly make it inverse primary. So you can see that plus button. And the background color of the actual app, we can make it secondary or primary. So yeah, just play around with the colors to what you want. Cool. Now one other final UI adjustment I want to make is currently in our note tile, we can see both the edit and the delete button. I want to hide this in a little option, like an, in a little menu. So you see these two buttons here. I'm going to get rid of this row and we're going to have a icon button with the three dots, which I believe is more vertical. So yep, these three dots as the menu. So I want to make this much more minimal and hide some of the functionality into this little menu. So if I click on these three dots, I want to open up something right now. I'm going to introduce another package called popover, which I made a tutorial on before. So you can check that out if you need more understanding on that specific package, but I can show you real quick how to use it because I think it's a really cool package. So flutter pop add popover. And what this does is when I click on these three dots, 
we can say show popper well, there it is and in the body builder <laughs> funny name uh, you can return the note settings which we haven't created yet so if I create some note settings this one is essentially just going to be currently let's just have it as a red container I just want to see what this looks like if I come back to my note tile let's import what we just created and let's click on these three dots sweet there it is so it opens up another little box and we can control the width and the height and I actually want this to be opened up right next to those three dots and it's probably because the context is getting kind of confused so what you can do is just wrap this in a builder and it will just have its own context so you can see now when I click on the three dots the box opens up right next to those dots which is pretty cool sweet so if I come back to my note settings let's decorate this up so I basically want a column for those two options which is the edit and the delete right so I'm gonna have a column and we're going to have a gesture detector so that we can tap on these containers Cool. so if I save this and just restart it you can click on these three dots and sweet there it is now it's looking a little scrunched up to the top so let's center these text widgets and maybe we could style it up a bit make it bold maybe and that's looking pretty good cool so if I edit this we can still update the note, but it looks like we should pop the dialogue as well. So if you tap on this option, then we do want to edit it, but but just after that, let's also pop the dialogue. Or maybe before that. So let's see how this looks. Oh, I actually forgot to say an exclamation mark, which means it's definitely not null. Whoops, and it's a function. So let's try this and everything should be working like usual. Now one thing is this drawer, maybe we could change this icon because I don't really like that icon. You can change it to any picture you want. I'm just going to use a pen or an edit. Yep, let's leave it at that one. And that's looking really good. So we have a very aesthetic, minimal looking notes app with both light mode and dark mode. Hey, what up? Welcome back to another quick flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how to code up a minimal habit tracker. So you can check off your habits every day and the more you complete, the greener the heat map will be for that day. And if you do this over time, you'll get this nice heat map as a monthly overview. I'll also show you how to code it up in light mode as well as dark mode. Now, just before we start coding this up, let's have a look at a quick diagram just to see what we're doing. So from our app, the main functionalities that we want to do is to create a new habit as well as editing it and deleting the habit. So we're going to do this in our habit database, which is where we're going to store these habits. So let's say, for example, we have habit one, two and three. Each of these habits should have a name and also we're going to store a list for the completed days for that given habit. And then we're going to look at this data and then summarize it into a nice heat map and give it back to our app. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function, I'm running my app, which brings us to this home page, which I've got it in a folder called pages just to keep our code nice and organized. And this is just returning a blank scaffold. So you should just have a blank white app like this 
Now the first thing I'm going to do is to just create a folder here quickly called theme and let's just set up the light mode and dark mode colors first. So you can fine tune these numbers to your liking but you can also just copy the numbers that I've got here. So I like to specify the background, primary, secondary, tertiary and also inverse primary. And so these are just different shades of gray that I've selected. Let's also have another one for dark mode, which is going to be very similar to light mode, but just everything's going to be a bit darker. Cool, and then just to switch between the two modes, we need to create a theme provider. And so let's say initially it's going to be light mode. And then let's have a getter to get the current theme. And a boolean for if this is the dark mode or not is going to be helpful. So it will just do this quick check. Is the current theme data equal to dark mode? This is going to return true or false. So this should be helpful for us later on. And then let's have a method to set the theme. And finally, just a quick toggle method just to switch between the two. So if the current theme is light mode, then let's make it dark mode and vice versa. Cool, so let's come back to our main.dart file and in our main function, we want to use a change notifier provider, which, whoops, I forgot to import. So let's open up the terminal and let's add in this package, flutter pub add provider, just for some simple state management. So we can say change notifier provider and then give it our theme provider and then just give it our app. Cool, so if you come back to our material app down here in the theme, we can specify like, for example, light mode, or we can say dark mode. So we want to switch between these two modes. So let's just give it the, by using the provider, we're just going to give it the current theme data, which should initially be light mode, as you can see here. Cool, so if we come to our home page, which is what the app is showing right now, let's have a app bar and also a drawer here. You should be able to see if you just save it, the little menu icon on the top left, and you can click this to open up your menu drawer. And so I'm just going to give it our background color. And in the middle, let's just have a switch so that we can go from dark mode to light mode. And I'm going to use a Cupertino switch because, which is the Apple style looking one, because I just think it looks pretty cool. So for this switch's value, we can give it through our provider, just if this is dark mode or not. And so this could be true or false. And so just depending on if we're in dark mode or not. And then if we tap on this switch, then we're going to go to this unchanged and then go to our toggle theme method. And if I just try this, then sweet, you can see we can toggle between dark mode and light mode. Sweet, now for our habit database, I'm going to use the ISA database to store our information. Now I've already made a separate tutorial on how to use ISA, so check that out if you need, but I can show you real quick how to use it. So firstly, let's just add these dependencies in. And we're going to create a new folder called models. And so let's create our habit. So if we think about a particular habit, let's have an ID and the habit name, and also a list of the completed days. So for the habit ID, we can just say isa.auto increment, and it will just go from zero, one, two, three, four, as we create new habits. And then we're going to have a name Let's give it a late tag because we're going to initialize it later on. And then also a list of the completed days. So in this list, the type is going to be a date time. 
And so just as an example, this daytime object is going to look something like this. So the year, the month, the day. So like 2024, 1st for January, and the day is 1. So for example, this is going to be the type of information stored in this data. Cool, so let's add a collection tag. And we also have to write this little line. So part and then habit.g.dart. So, so it's the same file name as this current one. So habit.dart. But we just need to put the G in the middle for generate. So we just need to run this little command, which we'll do in just a second. I want to create one more model just for some app settings because I just want to store the first time that this app is launched because we need to know the start date for the heat map later on. Same thing for this, we need to put the generated file and then run this command. And then it's going to automatically generate these two files here. And if you look, it says do not modify by hand. So don't touch this file. This is just so that we can save different objects like a habit in our database easily. Cool, now finally let's create our folder called database and we're going to create our habit database here. And in here we're going to have most of our functionality. So I'm gonna break it up into two sections. So firstly, let's grab our ISA object, which is our database. And the first section is just going to be a bit of setting up. So a method to initialize the database and also to save the first time that the app starts up. And also just a getter to get the first start update. And then the main chunk of this is going to be the CRUD operations. So so with a given list of habits, we can add a new habit. We can read the habits from our database. And then we can update the habits. We can do two different types of updating for a habit. We can change the on and off and also the name for the habit as well. And then finally, we can delete a given habit. Sweet, so let's just start creating this up. So starting with the initializing. This is just some setting up for the database. So first thing we have to do is to get the directory. And that's from importing the path provider at the top. So make sure you got that. And then we can say ISA is await and then ISA.open. And then we can give it our two schemas, which was those two classes that we created. So the habit and the app setting schema. Cool, and then just give it the directory and we can initialize through this method. Sweet, and for the sake of the heat map later on, we just wanna have a quick method here just to save what the first date is when this app gets launched for the first time. If the existing settings equals null, which means it doesn't exist, then let's specify the first launch date to be daytime.now. So the first time launched is now. And then put this information into the app settings. Cool, so now that that's stored, let's have another method just to access this information, right? So we're going to go to the ISARS app settings and we're just going to return the settings first launch date. Cool. Now that was just some of the setting up part. So let's come to our main.dart file and actually initialize all of this. So firstly, we have to say widgets flutter binding ensure initialized. And then let's initialize the databases. So this should be an asynchronous function so that we can await the habit database and you can see initialize. And let's also do the saving the first launch date as well. 
Sweet, so now let's move on to the main functionality of this app, which is this CRUD operations. So starting with a list of habits, I'm just gonna call it current habits. Let's create a method to add a new habit. So all we need in terms of the parameter is I just need to know a habit name. And so then we can create a new habit we can save to the database and then we can reread this from the database. So let's start off by creating a new habit and just setting the name to be this new habit name. Let's save it to the database. And then once that's done, we want to just read this again from the database so that we have the latest information. So this read habits we are going to create right now. So firstly, let's fetch all the habits from the database and let's give this to our kind of local current habits list. And then we need to update the UI. Cool, now for updating, we have two different kinds of updating. The first one is checking the habit on and off. So the updating the habit com completion. And for this, all we need to know is the ID of the habit. So I need to know which habit we're looking at, right? And also the Boolean of it, if it's completed or not. Firstly, let's use the ID to find the specific habit. And then let's update the completion status. So if the habit is completed, we're going to add the current date to the completed days list. And otherwise, if the habit is not completed, then we're going to remove that current date from the list. Sweet, and then let's save the updated habits back to the database and then just reread everything. Cool, and the other kind of updating is just to update the habit name if we need to. So for this one as well, we just need to know the ID and then what's the new name. So let's find the specific habit first that we're looking at and then let's update the habit name and then reread from the database. And lastly, the last functionality is to delete a habit. So for this one, I just need to know just the ID, so which habit we're deleting. And then let's reread. Cool, and that's pretty much all the code for the 
functionality for the habit tracker. So if I come back to my main.dart file, we have this theme provider, but I want to have another one for my habit database. So in that case, we actually can provide multiple providers. So the first one, I'm just going to give the habit database and then the second one, the theme. Sweet, now if I come back to my home page, let's start decorating up the UI and creating our habit tracker. So starting with our drawer, which is what we have mainly here, I want to keep my code as clean as possible. So I'm going to put this in a new folder called components. And let's just import everything again. And then if I come back to my home page, then now I can just say my drawer. And it makes the code here look much cleaner. Sweet. So the first thing I want is a floating action button so that we can create this new habit. So let's just give it our appropriate colors. And I'm going to give it a plus icon which is this add icon. If I press on this floating action button, then we want to create a new habit. So let's create that method up here. And so all of the methods that we're creating here is all for the UI related stuff. So for example, like showing a dialog box. So when I create a new habit, we're going to open up this alert dialog box and we're going to have a text field so that the user can type something in, which means we're going to need a text controller to access whatever the user typed in. So I'm just going to restart this. And if I click on this plus button, you can see it opens up this little box and you can start typing something in. So in the decoration, I want to have a hint text just to clue the user into what they should type in here. I'm going to say create a new habit. And then in the actions, let's have a couple buttons. So I need a save button and a cancel button. So for the save button, let's get the new habit name from just the text controller. So whatever the user typed in. And then we're going to save the information to the database. So if you go to our habit database, you can see there's our add habit method that we created. And then some UI stuff. We just want to pop the box. So we just want to close it and also just clear the text controller. And so this one is going to be called save. And the cancel button is going to be similar, but we're just going to pop the box and clear the controller. Okay, so let's try this. So if I click on the plus, you can type a new habit and then save it. And I think it got saved, but we now need to display it on the screen. So let's go to our init state. So in the initial state, let's read the existing habits on app startup. So if you go to the habit database, let's read the habits. And then in our UI, in the scaffold, in the body, let's build a habit list. So Firstly, let's get access to our habit database and get the current habits.
And then let's return this list for the habit UI. Cool, so for the item count, that's just current habits.length. And we're going to go through each habit. So let's get individual habit. And let's check if this habit is completed today, which it would be nice if we had a sort of helper method just to do this little task for us. So in that case, I actually am going to create a new folder called util. And let's have some habit utilities. So sometimes I just want to create some kind of little methods just to help us out with the code. And so this one, what I want is given a habit list of completion days, is the habit completed today? So remember for each habit, we are storing the days that we've completed in a list for that habit. And so I just want to know if one of those days is today. So this is going to be called is habit completed today? given a list of completed days. So we're just going to look at today and then compare the year, month, day and return if today is in one of those days. So we can come back to our home page and we can import this little method. And then finally, we can return a habit tile UI. So for now, I'm just going to give it the habit name. And this should have a bracket. Cool, now if I just save this, you can see there's Jim. So that was the first one that we saved earlier. And we can add another one. Cool, now even this is getting a bit verbose. So I'm going to come back to my components and let's create a new file for the habit tile. So let's start off with a container and we're going to decorate it. And just depending on if it's completed or not. Let's say if it's completed, the color can be green and otherwise it can just be like a gray color. Sweet, there it is. Now I think we could use some padding and some margins. And the corners are so sharp, so let's curve them. And for the child here, let's actually return a list tile. And so we can give it the text and also for the leading icon, I want to have a checkbox. So this checkbox is for the on and off. And so just give it the is completed Boolean. And we can fill out this method for the on changed. So it's requiring this function. So I'm just going to require that at the top. And let's come back to our UI and you can see on changed we want to check the habit on and off. So let's create that real quick at the top. So with a given Boolean. So with a given Boolean and a habit, Check this off. So let's update the habit completion status.
and now let's save this and test this out and you can see if I click on these checkboxes we can turn it on and off sweet now one thing I just want to make this look a little nicer if I come back to my checkbox let's also make the active color green yeah I think that looks better and one thing is it's actually only tappable in that checkbox region when I actually want the whole tile to be tappable. So this entire container, let's put it in a gesture detector and fill out the on tap. So I just want to toggle the completion status in the same way. And so let's try this. Yay, we can click on the tile itself. Sweet, now I want to be able to delete and also edit these habits. Import this package called Flutter Slidable. And I've used this in other apps before, but you can just wrap this in a slidable widget. And I want the slide to happen on the end of the tile. So on the end action pane, we can fill out just some kind of motion. And we can have a couple of options. So I want to have one for the edit and the delete. So I'm going to require both of these methods. And so for the edit, I'm going to give it like a gray color with a settings icon. And similar for the delete, but let's make it red and a delete icon. Awesome. Now let's come back to our home page and let's just create the boxes for these. So when we want to edit or delete, we want to just bring up a quick dialog box. So just starting with the edit habit box. Let's firstly set the controller's text to be the habit's current name. So we want to sort of pre-fill the text controller with the habit name. And then let's show a dialog box with a text field again. And we're going to have a couple buttons as well. So save and cancel. So this is actually similar to what we had before. So I'm just going to grab this. and paste it here and let's just fix some of this up so just this method so instead of adding a new habit we're going to update the name and so in our habit tile if we click on the edit habit then we can open this edit habit box and let's do something similar for the delete And so for the delete, it's a little bit simpler. We don't need to know anything except for just the habit ID. Okay, everything should be done. So let's just save that. And you should be able to slide from the end of this tile and access each of those methods. Sweet, and you can see I can edit and also delete. Now, one thing is some of this padding stuff, let's fix up. So this margin I'm gonna get rid of around the tile and just put it on the padding on the entire widget. Yeah, there we go. And I also feel like the text could be white when it's active. Yeah, 
Sweet, that's looking much better. So let's just go through and clean up some of this UI. So for example, like the app bar, I like to just make the elevation zero and also just make the color transparent and instead make the foreground more visible. So now that we can input the data for our habits, let's lastly have a way to display this in a nice way. So we're going to use a heat map. So in your components, let's create a new file called heat map. And I'm going to add this package in. So flutter pub add flutter heat map calendar. So I've also made a separate tutorial for covering just the heat map specifically. So check that out if you need, but I can show you how to implement into this habit tracker now. We're going to return. If you start typing heat map, you can see there's our package and we have to firstly specify the color sets. And so what this means is it's just going to be a map of colors. So like, let's say the first one is green and then all of them are different shades of green. So let's make it more green as the number gets higher. And then we need to know the start date. So we're gonna display like a list of days. So we need to know when is it gonna begin. So that's why we collected that information before. So let's just require that as a variable. And the end date is just going to be today. And the other important thing is the data set. So you can see here, it requires a map for a daytime and an integer for the strength. So we're going to require that as well when we create this heat map. And just some of the other setting up. So the color mode, I want the colors. Let's make the default color secondary. We can control the text color. And so all of this stuff you can customize to your own liking. And I also wanna make the scrollable and size 30, let's see what that looks like. So if I come back to my homepage scaffold in the body, currently I'm just displaying the habit list. So now let's put that in another list view and we're going to have heat map on the top and then habit list on the bottom. So let's build this heat map. So firstly, let's get access to our database. And the current habits. And we're going to return the heat map UI. So the future we're listening for is to know what the first date is. And so once we know what the first date is, then we can return this heat map. And so for the start date, we can just give it the information. And for the data sets, for this one as well, I kind of want, want another helper method just to prepare the data for us nicely. So let's come back to that habit util folder. And I just want to prepare the heat map data set. So Given a list of habits, I just wanted to convert it to like a nice map. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through using a for loop. Let's go through each habit and in each habit, let's go through each date in the completed days. And so what we're going to do is if the date already exists in the data set, then we can just increment its count. 
So this would result in a stronger green. And otherwise, just initialize it with a count of one. And just return this data set. So if I come back to my heat map, we can say prep heat map data set and just give it the current habits. And I think that's good to go. Now, a couple other things when you have a list inside another list, for the bottom one, which is this habit list, I'm just gonna specify a couple of these properties. The shrink wrap should be true and the physics should be never scrollable. So if you have lists inside of another list, like nested lists, you might have problems with scrolling. So that's why you have to say this. Cool, now if I save this and I rerun it, you can see there's our heat map. So it's just gonna add on every single day. So currently, if I check this off, you can see one of the tiles, the latest one, is going to be a bit green. And the more I check off, the more greener it's going to get. Right? So that's what these colors are doing. So you can change these colors, obviously. And so if I have another habit, it's going to get even greener. So over time, you're going to have a nice heat map that shows you how you've been doing your habits. And let's just see what this looks like in terms of dark mode. It's looking pretty good, but again, if you want to specify and change up some of these colors, like I feel like this secondary color could be a bit darker for the tiles. Yeah, that looks much better now. So you can change it up to your style. But we coded up the habit tracker. Yo, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. I'm going to start a new small series on authentication. So signing users in with email, Google and Apple sign in. So for this video, we're going to focus on coding the UI for the login screen. And then let's use this in the following videos to implement the various authentication sign in methods. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function, I am running my app, which brings us to this login page. And I've got that in a separate folder called pages to keep our code nice and clean. So in this login page, it will just be a blank scaffold. So you should just have a white blank app like this. Now, the first thing to do is to prepare any images we might need. So for this login UI, we basically only need two images, which is the Apple logo and the Google logo. So we're going to use this later on for the authentication. And these images, you can honestly get them anywhere on the internet, but I'll have this in my code below so you can access these assets as well. So in your project, go to the library and I'm just going to drag my images into this library folder. And make sure to come back to the code and we have to tell it that we're going to import some assets. So just come to your pubspec.yaml and comment this out and library slash images and make sure to save that file. Cool, and in our login page scaffold, let's start decorating this. So for the background color, I like to have a slightly light gray as opposed to just having a completely white background. And in the body, let's have a big column and let's just have a bit of a plan as to what we're gonna fill out, okay? So let's just comment this. At the very top, I want a sort of logo and then let's have some text saying welcome back. And then we want some text fields. So the username and the password text field, a text saying forgot password. We also need a sign in button. And then we want to give the user an option to continue with another alternative sign in method, say Google or Apple sign in. And at the very bottom, if they're not a member, let's give them an option to register now. Cool, so this is the overall plan and let's just start filling this out. So for this logo, obviously that depends on your business and what your logo is. For this, I'm just gonna put in any icon. Let's just put in a lock icon. Now you can see when you save it, I don't know if you can see that in that corner, but it's all scrunched in the corner, right? So let's just give it a big size. And one useful widget in Flutter is to wrap your column in a widget called save area. 
And essentially what that does is it just makes the UI avoid the notch area. So that's pretty, ha that's pretty handy. And let's just center this column. And by the way, in terms of like spacing the UI out, uh, it's a good idea to use sized boxes, which is basically just empty space. So I'm going to use a lot of sized boxes to sort of space it out the way I want. By the way, Flutter really likes you to put these const tags. So let's just do that. Now, this is going to be our first text widget. Let's just say kind of like a greeting message. So welcome back, you've been missed. And let's just style this up. So let's make it a bit gray. And for the font size, you can see the default there is 14. Maybe I'll make it 16, just a little bigger. And let's just do another sized box, make it 25 this time. And let's start to fill out the text field. So on a very basic level, right? If I just say text field and you just save it, then you should be able to click on this little gap here and start typing in, which is good. But let's just make this look a little more modern, make it a little bit more elegant. So for the decoration, there's actually a couple uh, borders that we have to specify. So one of them is the enabled border. And so I'm going to make the border white. But then there's actually another border called the focused border. Okay, so I'll show you what the point of each of these are. I'm going to make the focus border just gray as opposed to white. If I just save this and rerun it, you can see I've got a border now that's white. And if I click on it, then it will become the focus border and we'll make that border gray. So this is just a good way, kind of like a good UX pattern to help the user know that they're in this text field right now. Now, I think this text field could use a little padding to get off the sides. There we go. and. Personally, I'm going to actually fill in the color and I'm going to make it gray with a shade of 200. So I kind of like this look where you've got almost white inside the fill color, but then the border itself is completely white. So I think this looks pretty nice. Sweet. Now, if we want to create another password text field, looks like we're going to have to just copy and paste this, right? Now, this is making our code very hairy and verbose. So let's just put this in a separate file. And for these, I like to make the folder called components just to have the different UI components. And so let's call it my text field. And just paste what we created earlier here. Okay, so we can come back and go to the login page and now we can just say my text field. And so that cleans up the code so much, right? Now, if we need to make any specific uh, adjustments, we can just do it in the my text field dot dot file. So this is a good kind of common practice that you should be doing to keep your code nice and clean. What do we need next? Now, if you think about what differs between the two text fields that we have, we're going to need to um, give it the controller and also the hint text as well as the obscure text. So I'll explain these three things I'm bringing in. So starting with the controller. Controller is basically uh, what we can use to access what the user typed in to the text field. So if you look under the text field, it always require, requires us to fill out a controller. And so if the user types something in there, we can use the controller to access this information. And for the hint text, hint text is uh, what it sounds like. It's just a string just to kind of hint to the user what should be typed in this text field. And the one last difference between the two text field is the obscure text. Now obscure text is a Boolean, meaning it's true or false. And this is just to hide the characters when you're typing a password in, right? You don't want the password to just be displayed. So just to show you what I'm talking about, if you look at the login page, my text field is now got a red squiggle because we have to fill out those three things that we just specified. Right, so let's just come up to the top and I'm just going to create the controllers for the text. Let's call it username controller. And let's call it password controller. 
Okay, so we can just give these controllers to each text field. And the hint text, so what do we want the user to type in here? Let's just say username. And down here we want the password. Cool, and obscure text, remember this is a boolean. So for the username, I want it to be false. But for the password, I want it to be true. So if you actually start typing in, the username, we can just display the characters, but in the password, it'll be obscured. So that's what that was talking about. Now the username and the password, the hint text seems a little bit too dark for my liking. I want to make it more, more lighter. So you can specify this hint style. And yeah, I think a lighter gray makes it look better. Cool, so let's add another smaller sized box. And now let's just have a text widget saying forgot password. Now this, I actually want it kind of on the right side as opposed to the middle, but this column from the beginning, we set it to be centered, right? So kind of a nice trick to do is to wrap your text widget in a row, which if you save it, it will automatically come to the beginning. Then we can set the main axis alignment to be at the end. So this is a nice little trick I like to use and then just use some padding for the row. Cool, so that's where I want it. Now let's just get another size box and for this one, 25. And now we're going to use a sign in button. So similar to how we created our own text field, just to make our code nice and clean, I'm going to do the same thing for the sign in button. So let's go to our components folder and let's create a button called my button. So for now, just in the middle, let's just create a text widget saying sign in. And we can now come back to the login page and just say my button. There it is. And let's decorate the shit out of this. Okay, for this, I wanna make it black, which means my text should be white so that we can see it. And let's just add some padding. And you guys know I hate sharp corners. So let's go to the decoration and make the border radius a little curved, maybe eight. That feels better. And let's just finalize the sign in text. I want to make it more bold, more bigger. And cool. I think that's looking pretty good. And by the way, we want this button to actually be a button, right? Instead of just a, you know, container. So let's wrap it in a gesture detector. So we're going to need to create this on tap method. Now, if you hover over the on tap, you can see it requires this like function. So I'm just going to copy this, whatever it wants and require it when we need to create this button in our login page. Okay. So come back to the login page. My button now has a red squiggle because we have to fill out the on tap. Okay. So we haven't created this method obviously. So I'm just going to call it um, sign user in and for now it's going to execute nothing but we'll set it up nicely so that in the following videos we can just fill out those methods when necessary so for this one as I said we're just doing the UI cool so let's add another size box and this is a part that's kind of fun so I'm going to use a couple um, dividers now if you don't know what a divider is it's essentially just a line so if I show you divider and you save it it's kind of very faint so i don't know if you can see that right now so you can control this thickness so you can see that little line there right so this is kind of just helpful uh, when you're creating uis so i'm actually going to create a row and have two dividers and in the middle i'm just going to have a text widget saying continue with Sweet, I think that's looking pretty good so far. And finally, we are going to have the buttons for the Google and the Apple sign in. We're gonna to need to put it in a row since we have two objects side by side. And just to show you real quick, like if I use an image asset 
and I give it the path of where my picture is. Right, that's the path here. If I save it, there it is, but it's huge. So we can actually control the height of this image. And so this is going to be a point in time where we go to our components and let's create one more thing. And let's call it like a square tile. And again, if you think about what differs between the two tiles, like having an Apple button and a, and a Google button, is the image itself, right? So I need to know the string of the image path when I create this square tile. So that then I can give it to this image.asset, right? So if I come back to my homepage, square tile, and I have to give it my image path, which is the library slash images slash Google PNG. And for the Apple, let's just change it to Apple. Cool. And remember, it was so big, right? So let's make the height smaller. Sweet. And let's align this to be in the middle of the row. And let's just space this out accordingly. Sweet. Now coming back to the square tile, let's finish decorating this up. So I want to have a white border, as you can see there. And of course, we're going to have to make the border radius curved. And similar to the text field, I want the, the field color to be gray 200. So that it's got that white border around it. And I think this is looking pretty good. Sweet. And the very last thing is just to finish off with some text widgets at the bottom. We want to say, are hey, you not a member? Then register now. And just for the register now, I just want to separate the text widget so that um, we can make it blue for the register now, just to make it seem like a more clickable bit of text. Sweet. Now the UI is essentially done. Now the very last thing that I always do is to go to the column, the overall column, and make the main axis alignment to be at the center. And so for our particular design on this iPhone 14, nothing really changed that much, but I like to make this aligned to the middle because it makes it easier when we are dealing with different screen sizes. So Yep, that's just a handy trick I like to do. But that's essentially it. We have a nice modern looking UI. Yo, what up? Welcome back to the Flutter authentication tutorial. In the last one, we created the UI for this modern login screen. So in this tutorial, let's hook it up to Firebase and allow users to sign in with their email and password. Now, the very first thing we need to do is to go to your Firebase console and make sure to sign in with your email so that we can now create a new project. And for this one, I'm just going to call it Auth Tutorial. And let's hit continue. And let's just disable this Google Analytics just for simplicity. And let's create the project. Cool. Now, once that's done, we now need to add Firebase to our app. And by the way, I'm going to link this Firebase documentation below because this is essentially what I'm going to explain to you in this tutorial. I'll link it below so you can take a closer look at it. So it says here, before you begin, if you haven't already, follow the steps in the get started guide. So let's just open that in a new tab. And even for this, we have another prerequisite, which is to connect your app to Firebase. So we're going to need to install and initialize the Firebase SDK for Flutter. And then if you go to this one, most of this you hopefully should have already done. Like you have an editor like VS Code and you've installed Flutter. And just then you should have signed into Firebase using your Gmail. And the most important thing to do here is the Firebase CLI. So the command line tools. If you haven't already install the Firebase CLI. And so just depending on your platform, right? So what machine are you using? Let's say I'm using a Mac and there's three different ways to install it, which if you actually read this recommended for, if you're a new developer, just use this first method just to make it easy. Um, but if you do have familiarity with Node.js, then you can use this NPM as well. So 
just copy this and put it in your command line and make sure to install this Firebase CLI. Cool, so once you've done that, let's just close this and we've installed the Firebase CLI. Now let's just make sure everything's all good. We have to log in using the Firebase login. So let's copy this and let's go to our code now. So this is the modern login UI that we created in the last video. So I'll link that below as well. So make sure to check that out first because we're gonna build on from this UI. And so in this project, in your terminal, let's put in Firebase login. So we're gonna make sure we're logged into our Gmail as it says like that. And then what's the next step? Then we can copy this. And looks like we have a slight warning. And I think this is a Mac only warning. So it says you can fix by adding this bit of code. Let's just put that in. And then if everything has been done correctly, we should be able to do this Flutter Fire configure. And there we go. So it's gonna fetch the Firebase projects. And you can see these are the projects that I have in that Gmail. So you can see the auth tutorial is the one we just created. Which platforms should your configuration support? It says use arrow keys and space to select. And if you hit enter, I think it will just do all of them. So I just hit enter. So it'll set up the Android, the iOS, uh, the web. This, you actually had to do it manually before. But thanks to the Flutterfire CLI, we can do this all seamlessly and it's all automated. Cool, so it wants to update the build.gradle, so just say yes, and we're good. So let's go back to our Firebase project. And remember, we had to connect our app to Firebase, right? So if I just refresh this real quick, you can see those three apps. So the iOS, the Android, and the web, it just got added automatically. So that's good. So now, the rest of the work is gonna require us to do some actual code. So let's just copy this and let's add the package Firebase core. Cool, that's done. And by the way, what we just did is if you go to your pubspec.yaml, this is where we sort out the packages, right? So that terminal command automatically added the Firebase core. It looks like it says here the Flutter Fire configure is step two, which we have already done. So yeah, this is just gonna do the same thing. So we already did this. And you can see step three says, in your main.dart file, we're going to import these packages at the top. And so the Firebase options, it should be a auto-generated file, which helps us just to deal with which platform we're on. So if you go to your main function, we're going to add this snippet of code. So the Flutter binding and also the Firebase initialize app. And so for the options you can see here, we can just select the current platform. Cool, and if everything has been done good, if we hit Flutter run, hopefully there's no issues. Uh, if you do have issues, then that means there's something wrong with the setting up. Okay, sweet, so now we can actually do some code. So if you go to our login page, Remember these two text editing controllers? We have the username and the password text field controllers. And we also had this method which we didn't fill out, which is the sign in method, right? So if you scroll down, where's my button? This one, so if I tap on this, then we're going to execute this sign in method, which currently is blank. And so this is what this tutorial is gonna focus on, filling out this method. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new page called auth page. And so this is just going to be a stateless widget. And we're going to use this to check if the user is signed in or not. Because if the user isn't signed in, then we have to display the login page. And if they are signed in, then we're gonna display a home page. So we're gonna use this auth page to decipher between the two. Okay, so in the scaffold in the body, we're going to use something called a stream builder. And we're going to check for some users. And the stream that we're going to be listening to is the Firebase auth, which, whoops, I just remembered I didn't, I forgot to import the Firebase auth package. So let's just do that. Flutter pub add Firebase auth. Cool. And again, just to show you what we just did, if you go to your PubSpec YAML, it should have added this package automatically. Cool, so now that's done, we should be able to import that library. 
and we can start dealing with Firebase auth. So you can see this stream is going to constantly be listening to the auth state changes. In other words, if the user is logged in or not. So then we can build something and with the help of this snapshot, we can say, is the user logged in? Is the user not logged in? So if the snapshot has data, then we have some user. So let's return our home page. Else, let's return the login page. And this home page we obviously haven't created, so let's just do that real quick. And let's just keep this simple in the middle. Let's just say logged in. Cool, and if you come back to the main.dart file, my main function executes my app, which at the very beginning goes to the login page, but let's change this to the auth page. Okay, so we're gonna fire up the auth page at the beginning, and then it's gonna check by listening to the stream if the user is logged in or not. Cool, now if you come back to our documentation, we can close this now and come to the actual main documentation we want to use for this video. So we've got everything set up. And if you just scroll down, signing in a user with an email and password is what I'm going to show you today. Cool. So if you come back to our Firebase console, let's hit authentication and get started. And if you go to the email method, just make sure to enable this and save it. Cool. And in the users, Let's create a user manually. So I'm just going to call it test at gmail.com and the password can be test123. Cool, so we have our first user. Okay, so let's come back to the login page and let's finally fill out this sign user in method. So we're going to await Firebase auth. And if you look in the method, you should be able to see a sign in with email and password. And this is going to require us to provide an email and password, which we have these controllers from before. And just to keep it nice and consistent, instead of username, let's rename this to email. And give the controller and the password to these fields. And let's see what happens. So let's fill out the email which is test at gmail.com and my password was test123 and if I sign in then sweet we're signed in sweet it works and so now when the user is logged in then they will see this home page which let's add an app bar and actually have a button so that the user can log out right so let's create this sign user out method and this one is also very easy you just need to say firebase auth and sign out. Cool, now since we made that auth page, this should sort out the logging in and logging out. So let's give this a go. Cool, so if I hit the button, we just log out and come back to the login page. And so that's what this auth page dot dart is doing. Just to have some more information about the user, let's create a user. And just get the current user. And let's say logged in as the user's email. And let's just display the user's email like that. And maybe let's make it a bit bigger so you guys can see. Cool. All right, so the basic functionality is done. Now for the rest of the tutorial, I'm going to sort of have some good practices uh, when it comes to like UX, the user experience. So for example, like if we're signing a user in, it's going to take a little bit of time, so let's show a loading circle. And to do that, we're going to show a little dialog. And by the way, to show a dialog, it's actually going to be easier to use a stateful widget, but I actually made this login page as a stateless widget. And I was thinking surely there's a way we could just convert a stateless widget to a stateful widget easily. And I looked it up. And there actually is. So you can hover over the stateless widget and you can hit these commands. So I'm using VS code and on a Mac. So it looks like it's command dot and we can convert to stateful widget. Oh, sick. Sweet. So now that we can 
show a dialogue, we can have the context and we can show this loading circle finally. So in the center, let's just return a circular progress indicator. And let's see how this looks. Hey, there it is, but it's not going away. So at the very bottom, let's just pop the circle. And let's try it again. Cool, so you have the loading circle, and then once you've signed in, let's pop the circle. Okay, looking good. Now, some other errors to take care of is, what if the username is wrong? Like they enter a wrong email. Then it looks like we're just stuck on this loading circle, right? So with this sign in method, I'm just going to copy this and we're going to try signing in. And if there's an error, let's catch the error. And let's just see what the error is. So if the error code is user not found, then for now, let's just print it to our console just to see what's going on. And if it's the wrong password, then let's also print that to our console. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you in my terminal console right here. Let's put in a wrong email. And you can see, we can see what the error is. No user found for that email. And similarly, if we have a wrong password, so we got the email correct, but the wrong password, then we can see that error. So let's display this information to the user so that they know what the problem is. Okay, and just to keep the code clean, I'm just going to separate out these methods. So if it's a wrong email, let's just show a small alert dialog. And same thing for the password. And It looks like our loading circle is still persisting and that's because once we signed in, we should pop it and get rid of it at the end. And if we do have an error, then let's pop the circle and then display the appropriate error. Sweet, so you can see that little alert dialog to display the error and the user can just click anywhere to exit out of it. Sweet, so again, just coming back to the documentation, you can see this is the code that we actually implemented. So this is how you sign a user in with an email address and password. Yo, what up? Welcome back to the Flutter authentication tutorial. In the last one, we coded this login screen and can now sign users in. Now, the next step is to click on this register now button and be able to create a new account for the user. Cool, so just to keep everyone on the same page, in the last video we created this login page and filled out this sign user in method. So now we can input an email and just sign in. Now just before we sort out the register page, let's just do a little clean up on some code. And what I mean is if you look at the software keyboard, if I just toggle this, then on your phone you'll have this bit of an overflow problem. So to sort this out, if you go to your scaffold, just wrap your column with a widget called a single child scroll view. And so that should just sort out that little error with the overflow. And the other thing I wanted to clean up is this wrong email message pop up. So if the user gets the email or the password wrong, we created these two separate methods, but I think we could probably combine this to be just one method. So I just want to delete the second one and let's just say kind of more generically this is just a error message to the user so i'm just going to rename this method called show error message and let's require a string as the parameter okay so what did we just do well if we try to sign in and we get some exception then we could check what the error is first before displaying the image but just to make it simple i'm just going to say show error message and just put the error code in there. Cool, so that just makes our code nice and simple. And now it's time for the register page. 
Cool, so I want to make that blue register now text to be clickable. So let's scroll down and find this text widget and let's wrap it with a gesture detector. And so we're going to need to create this function at the top. And require the constructors. Cool, now if you come back to the auth page, right now we're just checking if the user is logged in or not. And if the user is logged in, then we'll just return the home page. But if the user is not logged in, then right now we're just displaying the login page. But for this, I'm going to create one more page called login or register. Let's have a Boolean to show the login page at the very beginning. And also let's create a method so that we can toggle between the login and the register page. So to do that, if this method gets triggered, then let's just do a quick set state and make the show login page just the opposite of what it was. Cool, so when we build this, if the show login page is true, then return the login page. Otherwise, just show the register page. Cool, and you can see there's a red squiggle under the login page because remember we have to specify this on tap method. So if we tap, then let's just do the toggle pages. And the register page we are about to create now. And for this, this is going to be very similar to the login page. So I'm just going to copy the entire login page, control A or command A. And let's just copy this into the register page. And so I'm just going to change login page to say register page. Cool. And for the most part, it'll be the same, but let's just change this up and say sign user up as opposed to sign user in. And the other big thing I want in here is I want one more text field for the confirm password. And at the very bottom, we should now say something like already have an account, then log in now. Cool. So if I come back to this login or register page, we have an on tap to fill out. And this should work. So let's give this a go. So right now I'm on the login page and if I hit the register at the bottom, then we go to this new page. Cool, now it looks like we're gonna have to sort out some of this UI because it's getting pushed to the bottom. So just a quick fix is to just reduce the sizes of the stuff at the top. Cool, and now we can just toggle between the two pages. And I actually also realized for the register page, we should change up this message. Say like, let's create an account for you. Cool, and one last thing is the sign in button. We should say sign up. But if you go to the button, so remember how we created this button? Let's go to that component. So right now it looks like we just say sign in as a fixed string. So I'm just going to create another variable just called text. When you create this button, let's fill out the text. So sign in for the first one and in the register, I want to say sign up. Cool. There we go. Sweet. So in terms of the UI, everything's looking pretty good. Now for the actual snippet of code to create the user. If you go to your method, we did a sign in with email and password. So just start typing create user with email and password. And this method will create a new user. Now I want to do just one quick check to see if the confirm password and the password is the same. So the password controller should be the same as the confirm password controller, which looks like I forgot to create. So let's just create that real quick. And we should give this controller to the text field at the bottom. Cool. So if the password controller and the confirm password controller are not the same, then let's show the error message.
cool and let's just scroll down and make sure that we give the right controller and let's just do a quick check now so i'm just going to say mitch at gmail.com and just give some password and sweet we're logged in with this new email now if i go to my console you should be able to see you should be able to see that the new user is created. So that test at gmail.com, that one we just created manually right from this console. And in this video, we can now create a new user directly from our app. Now, one last thing I just realized is on a register page, you're not going to need this forgot password. Where are you? Yep, this guy we can just get rid of. Cool, much better. So that's essentially it for this video. We can now create a new user. And with that account, we can now log in to our app. So the next thing I wanna work on in the next video is Google sign in. So hopefully that goes well. It's where we can now log in and also register a new account. Now it's time for us to implement the Google sign in. So just to keep everyone on the same page, in the last couple of videos, we made it so that we can now log in users and also register a new user. So now we need to do the Google sign in. Now for this one, we need to look at this package, which I'll definitely link below. So the Google sign in. Now I'll just copy this and let's come back to our code. Go to your popspec YAML and let's add this package in. So save it. And let's close the file once that's done. Now, just going back to the Google sign in package, there's a lot of instructions here for the integration between Android and iOS, but some of this is a little bit outdated, so I'll show you what you need to do. Now, the very first thing we have to do is to register our Firebase app, which we actually already have done in the last tutorial. So, if you go to your console, we can now go to the authentication, and if you go to the sign in method, we enabled the email. So now let's add a new provider and enable the Google. And for the public facing project name, you can just call it whatever you want. I'll call it Flutter Google Auth Tutorial or just shoot. And just select a project support email, so just your own email. And it says here to set up Google sign in for Android apps, you need to add this SHA1 fingerprint. So I'll show you how to do this a bit later on. Now, just coming back to the Google sign in package, if you read these instructions for the integration, just starting with the iOS one, um, like I said, a lot of this, like steps two to six is already done for us. We already did that. And we just need to do this step seven. So copy this, and then you can see where we need to paste it in the iOS runner and the info.plist file. So let's go to iOS runner, info p list and just add it here and then if you look carefully you can see here it says copied from the google service info.p list so we have to give it the correct id so just go to this file that's just right above it and you can see so get this little number here after the google user content dot apps and just replace that one cool so this is a very important step so save it and let's close this so coming back to our code, let's go to the library and let's create a new folder called services. And in this folder, let's create a new file called auth service. And let's put all the Google sign in in this file. So in this class auth service, the method, let's call it sign in with Google. And just to have a bit of an outline on what we're trying to implement here. The first thing is to begin the interactive sign process. So bringing up that uh, page to click your email and then we have to obtain auth details from the request and then create a new credential for the user and finally we can use the credential to sign in so i'll explain what each of these steps are requiring so at the beginning the sign in process let's get the google sign in account and let's just call it g user and let's try to sign in so this should open up a page that 
uh, allows you to select an email or you can input your own email. And then let's try to authenticate Google sign in authentication. I'm just going to call this G auth and let's wait for if the authentication request has been has been all good. And then once that's done, let's create a credential. So if you look in this credential, we have to specify two things, the access token and the ID token. So let's give it that. And then finally, once we have the credential, we just need to use the Firebase method to just sign in. Cool, so in terms of the code, that's actually really it for signing in with Google. Now, if you come back to the login page, we want this button of the Google to be clickable, right? Now, if you scroll down, it's this square tile that we created earlier. Now, we could just wrap this in a gesture detector right here, but since we have um, the Google as well as the Apple to do, let's go to our square tile component and let's add the gesture detector here. So on the on tap, let's create an on tap method and require the constructor. So what we just did is we should have some red squiggles because we have to specify the on tap method. So if I tap on this Google square, then let's go to our auth service class that we just created. And the method is the sign in with Google. So we're going to need to remove this const tag now. And same thing for the Apple one. This one we'll do in the next video. So I'm just going to execute nothing. And I want the user to be able to um, see these Google and Apple sign in on both the login page and the register page. So let's just do it for the register page as well. I'm going to run this on my iPhone simulator and we should get some error. Yep, this thing. So it says the CocoaPods, it's out of date. So to update it, just run pod repo update. And then if you copy this and try to run it, again, we still have some issues. And so I did a bit of Google search to, to see how to sort this issue. And I can link the Stack Overflow post below if you like. But I can show you what to do. If you just scroll down, just do exactly what I do. So it says, yeah, go to the iOS folder in your project. And we're going to delete this pod file dot lock. So in the iOS folder, let's just delete this guy. And then let's run this pod re repo remove trunk command. And then from here, this one becomes sort of machine dependent. So for Intel chip users, you can just do that. But I'm actually using an M1 Mac. So I'm going to follow these instructions here. I'm going to copy this and then just put your password in. And then we can run this repo update. And as it says here, we should do this in the iOS folder. So let's change the directory to iOS. And in this folder, just run that command. And hopefully we see some, some green. sick so that's looking pretty good and the rest of this don't worry about now let's hit flutter run finally let's just make sure everything is working smoothly cool so i'm going to hit google and sweet we get this little window and it opens it up and there's my email i'm just going to click it and we're signed in so that's how easy it is to implement google sign in cool so it's working on iphone so we just need to do one little thing for Android, which is if you go to the project settings and you scroll down for the Android app, you can see this SHA certificate fingerprints. So if you click on this question mark, you can see this page and we just have to do a little something. So for the debug certificate, so I'm on Mac, I'm going to use this one. So make sure if you're on Windows, do the Windows, but just copy this and put it in your terminal and it wants a key store password so if you go back the default password is just android all lowercase so just type in android 
And then you can see the certificate fingerprints. So the SHA-1 and the SHA-256. So let's copy this and let's go back to the console and let's add the fingerprint. Do the same thing for the SHA-256. Cool, and that should be done. So it should work on Android as well. Yo, what up? Welcome to the Flutter and Firebase Masterclass. In this one, I'm going to teach you the four most important operations when it comes to databases. And I'm going to show you by coding up a super simple notes app where you can create a new note, read the notes from a database, as well as updating and deleting. So let's go to your Firebase console and let's create a new project. I'm just going to call it CRUD tutorial. And I'm just going to create this now. Cool, so now what we need to do is we need to connect our Firebase with our Flutter project. So I've opened up here a brand new Flutter project. And let's open up the terminal. And if you've never used the Flutter Fire CLI before, then you're going to need to install this one. But I've already done that, so I'm just going to skip that step. And the first thing we need to do is to say Firebase login to make sure that you're logged into the same email as the Firebase console. Then let's say Flutter Pub Global Activate the Flutterfire CLI. Looks like we have a little error thing. I'm just going to copy this and paste it in. Sweet. Then let's say Flutterfire Configure and let's look for our Firebase project that we just made. So there it is, CRUD Tutorial. And I'm going to choose Android and iOS. Let's say Flutter Pub Add Firebase Core. Awesome, and then we always need to add this little code in the main function just to set up. So widgets Flutter Binding, ensure that it's initialized. And then let's change this to an asynchronous function and await Firebase Initialize App. Cool. And I always just kill the app and restart it just to make sure everything's working fine. And there it is. And if you come back to your Firebase console and you refresh it, you should be able to see we connected the two apps. So the Android and the iOS. Awesome. Now the first thing we want to do here is go to the build. We want to have the Firestore database. And let's create a database. Hit next. And you can choose your location, but I'm just going to leave it at US. Cool. And then if you come to the rules, you can see it's allowing the read and write. I'm just going to change this, the write to be true. And this just means we can now save data into it. Sweet. Now let's come back to our Flutter project again. And let's add in this package for the Firestore. So Flutter pub add cloud Firestore. And now we can access our database. So I'm going to delete everything below the main function and just create this from scratch. So I've got my app and then our material app. And I'm just going to call it a home page. And it's always good practice to put your pages in a separate folder. And this can be a blank scaffold. And let's come back to our main dot dot and then let's import this. Cool, so we should just have a blank scaffold. Sweet, and let's just set up this app, just the basics of it. So the app bar. And I just want to have a floating action button. So that's the thing on the bottom right. Let's give it a plus icon. Cool, so now I'm going to create a new folder called services. And I'm going to have firestore.dart. And so I'm going to put all the operations into this file here. So class firestore service. Now the very first thing we need to do is to get the collection of notes from the database. And then we're going to have the four things. So create, read, update, and delete. And specifically for us in this app, we're going to say like create means adding a new note. Read is getting the note from the database. And then we want to update notes. And same thing as deleting. Cool, so if I start with the first one here, let's get the collection reference of notes. 
and let's call the collection just notes. If I just quickly code just the first function here for the creating, we want to have a future and this is for adding a note. So I'm going to accept a parameter, just a string for what the note is. And the bit of code you need to know, if we go to the notes, you can see after the dot, the add method. And in these curly braces, you can also have multiple fields. So let's say in the note field, I want to give it the note, but let's also have a timestamp. Cool. And so let's try to test this out with our floating action button. So if I click on this button here, I want to open up a small box to get the user to type something in. So if I create a method here real quick, let's open note box and let's show the dialogue. And we're going to need the context. So I'm actually going to change this to a stateful widget. So if you hover over this stateless widget and you press on Mac, it's command dot. And you can see you got this option here. I think on Windows, it might be control dot. We can now build this dialogue. And let's just start off with a blank text field. So just to test this out, if I save this, I click on the plus and sweet, here's our little dialogue box. And then you got the text field inside where we can type in. So how do we access what the user typed? Well, we need a text controller. So you can see in the text field, we can give it the text controller. And then now we need a button. So in the actions, let's have a button to save. So I'm just going to use an elevated button. And let's say add. Cool. So we want to type a note in and then we want to hit add to save it. So currently it's executing nothing. So inside these braces, let's add a new note. And we want to access the methods from this Firestore class, right? So at the top here, let's get the Firestore service object at the top. And then now we can say Firestore service and then we can access all of those methods. So dot add note and we want to give it the note. So that's going to be the text controller. Cool. And then just a couple UI things we need to do. So after you add the note, we want to clear what's in the text controller and just leave it blank after it's added in. And then we also want to close the box. So let's try this. First note and I add it and nothing's happening on our app because we are not reading it yet. But if I come back to my console and I refresh it, you can see there's our notes and we've got our first document and there's our first note there. So that's the natural next step we need to do, right? We need to be able to read now that we can create. So let's fill out the read method here. Now read, we're going to use a stream and a stream builder to sort of continuously listen to any changes in our database. So let's call this get notes stream. And we want to get the notes and we can now order them by the timestamp. So descending, let's say true, meaning the newest one is going to be at the top. Cool. So if I come back to my UI in the home page, in the body of the scaffold, we want to use the stream builder. And you can see inside here, we have to give it a stream. And so we can give it our get notes stream. And so that's what it's going to be listening to. And then we can build the UI. So firstly, let's just check if the snapshot has data, then we can get the docs. So let's create a list here called notes list. And we want to display it as a list view. Cool. So just to have a bit of plan about what we're doing. So the first thing is let's get the individual document. And then we want to get the string of notes from the document. And then let's give that to a list tile to display nicely in the UI. So the first thing is let's just get the individual document. So we're going through the index of the notes list. And one bit of useful information for our other couple methods coming up is going to be this document ID just to keep track of the notes. So I'm just going to use this a bit later on. Now let's get the note from each document and store it in this data variable. So what we really want is just a string for the note text. And in the data, we can get this particular field called note. Sweet. So now let's display it as a list tile for the UI.
and everything's all good except we can finish off this if else and so if there's no data then let's just return no nodes cool and looks like we have some range error oh that's because we didn't specify the item count so that's just going to be however long the notes list is sweet so let's just save this and rerun it and you can see now we can read our database and we've got the first note which means we should be able to create a second note and there it is cool so we can create and we can read now the last couple is the update so this one we need to know the doc id so we need to know which note we're updating and we also need to know what the new note is going to be so for this one if you go to the notes let's go to the particular doc id and then let's just update and you can just update the fields So if I come back to my UI, let's just go to the trailing and let's, let's have a gear button. So I'm just going to have an icon button here. And let's have a settings icon. Yeah, it's probably good. Cool, there's a gear. And so if I click on this, currently it's executing nothing. So what I want to do is I want to open up another box so that the user can type something in. Now let's see if we can recycle what we already used just to be efficient with our code. So we already have a open note box method here for when we add a new note. Now let's just add a parameter here for the document ID. And I'm gonna put a question mark here. And what that means is this can potentially be null. I made a whole video about null safety. So check that out if you need. So when we call this method and we're giving the parameter document ID, we want a string, but it could also be a null value. So the reason why I'm doing this is because when we hit the button to save, let's put a little if statement here. So if the document ID is null, then we're going to add a new note. And then otherwise we want to update an existing note. Okay, so if I come down to my button here, then we can just open the note box and just give it the doc ID. Let's hit the gear. We can now put in a new text. And you can see it got updated. Sweet. Which brings us to the last one, which is the deleting. Same thing, we need to know which note we're deleting. So let's accept the document ID as a parameter. And once we know that, let's just go to that document in the notes and just delete. And then in our UI, we need to have another delete button. So in the trailing, let's just put in a quick row here and have the button. So one's for the update and let's just copy it to create another one for the delete. And for the on pressed, we just want to call the delete note and switch up the icon. Cool, and by the way, if you save this, you're gonna get an error. So you need to specify the main access size to be minimum. Cool, so if I try this, then if I delete it, and then it will get deleted. And that's it, that's how you use the CRUD operations. Now we can use this to make some other cool apps using Flutter and Firebase. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how to code up a minimal chat application. So I'll teach you how to do the authentication, the chatting functionalities, and also have a light mode and dark mode for the design aesthetic. Now, just before we start coding, I'm just going to show you a quick overview of what we're about to create. So the first thing is the user is going to go to the login page. And if they don't have an account, then you can go to the register page to create one. And then so once we have an account, we can go to our home page and we can access the settings. And also the main thing is the chat page where we can chat to different users. So this is what we're going to do on a very basic level. Now, just to add a little bit more detail at the very, very beginning, we're going to need to have a little check to see if the user is currently logged in or not. So if they're not logged in, then obviously let's just go to the login page. 
but if they are logged in then let's go straight to their home page so if you think about like an app like instagram then you're not going to log in every single time right it should remember the fact that you were logged in before and similarly if we go to the settings page we should be able to log out and bring us back to the beginning and on this setting page we'll also have a toggle for the light mode and dark mode and then finally in terms of storing the data we're going to use firestore and we're going to collect two bits of information so firstly we're just going to collect the users so let's say like user one two and three and we're also going to collect the data for the chat rooms so an example of a chat room is going to be the one between user one and two and then that's going to have its own set of messages and then between user one and three and then between user two and three so we're going to have a bunch of chat rooms and so this is how we're going to store the data so i've opened up a brand new flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page in my main function i'm running my app which brings us to this login page and i've got all the pages in a separate folder just to keep our code nice and organized and this login page should just be a blank scaffold. So you should just have a white blank app like this. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do before we code up the UI is to create another folder called themes so that we can set this up nicely for light mode and dark mode. So let's just start off with light mode and you can play around with these colors, but you can also just copy the ones that I've chosen. So the one I like to specify are the background primary secondary tertiary and also inverse primary so these are just different shades of gray that you can use so what you can do is in the background color of the scaffold we can say theme dot of context go to the color scheme and then you can see all of those options so if you come to our main dot dart file in the material app you can give it your light mode and we should have a kind of light gray background. Cool. Now in the body, let's have a big column and let's start building out this UI for the login screen. So I'm just gonna start off with a big logo at the top, have a bit of a welcome back message, and then we need a couple of text fields for the email and password. Then we also need a login button and a little register now toggle to go to the register page if the user already has an account. Now for the logo, you can put in any image or icon that you want. But for now, I'm just going to put in a message icon just to keep it simple. And it looks like it's scrunched up in the corner. So I'm just going to main axis alignment to the center and also just center this column. And I feel like we could make this a bit bigger. And so for the color of this icon, right now it's just black. Now I'm going to use the primary color. So I want to make it a little bit grayer. And then let's have a message saying, welcome back, you've been missed. Looks like we could use a bit of space here. And I'm just going to style up the color and maybe make it a bit bigger. And then let's have another bit of space. And then we want to have a text field. So if you just type text field and save it, you should be able to see this little line where you can type a message in. Now we're gonna probably use a text field multiple times in this project. So I'm going to create a separate folder called components. And this is where I like to have those widgets I like to reuse. So I'm gonna create a new file called my text field. And we're going to decorate this up. So I wanna have a outline input border and we can also have a focus border which is when the user clicks into it so just so that i can demonstrate what i'm doing let's come back to our login page and start typing my text field and you can see it says there auto import just hit enter and there it is. You can see that little background there. So you've got the focus border and the enabled border. So if you click into it, it should light up a little bit. Cool, now I think it's too stuck to the edges. So let's put some padding on the horizontal and also let's put in a fill color. 
and say field is true then you can see it's got a color inside and the other useful thing is hint text so what hint text does is it's just a string so you could say like type something dot dot now the first one i'm going to need it as a email and the second one i need it as a password so what i'm going to do is just change this to a, be a variable so at the top i'm going to accept a string called hint text and require it And so if you come back to my text field, you can see it's got a red squiggle now because we have to specify that hint text. So for the first one, we can just say email. We can copy this and say password for the second one. Now it looks like we should probably have some space in between. And the hint text usually kind of as the name implies, it should be a hint. So I'm going to make this much lighter, right? And again, you can change any of these colors in the light mode file. And let's just keep going. So you can start typing our email and the password. Now you can see for the password, we don't want to show the password, right? We want to obscure it. So this obscure text is a Boolean, meaning it's just a true or false. So it's false by default. But if I say true, you can see it's going to obscure the text like that, which is what we want for the password. So we're going to also accept this Boolean at the top. And if we come back to our text fields in our login page, we have to specify it. So obviously for the email, we want to make it false. And for the password, we want to make it true. We do want to obscure it like that. Cool. Now the last thing is we want to access what the user typed in the text field, right? So to do that, we need to give it a controller. So let's just require that as well. And we're going to need to create these text controllers at the top. So let's call it email controller and also password controller. And let's continue this on. So let's just have another bit of space and we're going to have a login button. Now, same thing for this, we're probably gonna to need to use this button in other areas of the app. So in the components folder, I'm gonna create a new file called my button. And let's just start decorating this up. So in the middle, in the center, I wanna just have a text widget saying button for now. And let's decorate up the colors. And I just want to see what this looks like as I build it. So in the login page, let's say my button. And there it is, auto import, so hit enter. And that's what it looks like currently. So I think the first thing is I need some padding in the inside. And we need some margin to get it off of the edges in the horizontal direction. And of course the corners, you know, I don't like sharp corners. So let's curve these border radius. And the other thing is the button. I want it to say something else. So let's accept this as a string at the top. So if I come back to my login page, when I create this button, I can just give it a text let's say login for our one. Cool, now this button needs to be tappable, obviously, so let's wrap this in a gesture detector. And you can see we can require this function at the top as well for the on tap. So if I tap on this login button, we want to log in. So let's just create that method real quick at the top and then we can fill this out later when we do the authentication. And then finally, after a little bit more space, so we want to say some text saying not a member, then register now. So if the user already has an account, sorry, if the user doesn't have an account, then we want to send them to the register page, right? So what I want actually is I want the register now to be a clickable text. So I'm just gonna separate this out into 
two text widgets in a row. Then let's center this. And for the register now, just to show the user it's actually clickable, let's make this bold. And then we can use this to go to the register page later. Sweet, now that we've made our login page, let's also create a register page. And this one's going to be very similar to our login page. So I'm just going to grab the scaffold here and let's just copy and paste this in. And let's import the necessary components and the controllers as well. Let's grab those. So if you go to these login buttons, let's change this to register. And just to see the changes, let's go to our main.dart file and just return the register page right away. Cool, now we're gonna to need to change some of these messages. So let's say, let's create an account for you. And we need one more controller for the register page because I wanna have a confirm password text field. Okay, so we've got the email, we've got the password, but let's grab one of these and create one more for the confirm password. And at the very bottom, instead of saying not a member, we can say already have an account, then let's log in now. Cool, so we've made our register page and also our login page UI. Now, if you look at the main.dart file, we are showing one or the other, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another file called login or register, and let's put this in a separate folder called auth. So all of the authentication related stuff, let's put it in this folder. So what this login or register file is going to do is we're going to initially show the login page. And we also want to have a toggle to switch between the two pages. Okay, so we can say in the build method, if we are showing the login page, then just return the login page. Else return the register page. Okay, so if I come back to my main.dart file, let's just import what we created. And so by default, it's gonna show the login page first. Now I wanna to go to the register page when I click on this register now text. So let's come to that text widget and we're going to wrap it in a gesture detector so that we can tap on it. And it's gonna require this function. So let's just grab this and create it at the top. Same thing for the register page. And so what we just did is if I come back to the red squiggle here for a login page, it's going to require us to specify the on tap. So if we tap on it, then we can toggle pages. Sweet, let's see if this works. So you can click on register now and then it goes to the register page. You click on login now and it goes to the login page and we can go back and forth. Now let's come to our Firebase console and let's create a new project. I'm just gonna call it chat app shoot, like chat app tutorial. And once you've created that, Let's go to the authentication and click get started. And you can see here the email and password. That's the one. So, so enable it. 
And let's just create a test user. So test at gmail.com and just give it a password. And so in the project overview, you can see it says get started by adding Firebase to your app. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back to our code and in the terminal, if you haven't already done so, then you need to type in this command to install the Firebase tools. But I've already done that, so make sure you've done this as well. So that we can now say Firebase login. So make sure that it's logged in to the same email as your console. And then we can say Flutter Pub Global Activate Flutter Fire CLI. And on Mac, I always get this issue, just copy this in. And then we can say Flutter Fire Configure. And so what this will do is it will show you all of your Firebase projects. So just go to the one that you just created, chat up shoot. And hit yes. And if you come back to our console and you just refresh the page, hopefully you've added the two Android and iOS. You can see it's connected there. Sweet, and it looks like we have a red squiggle, and oh yeah, we also have to now add the package. So Flutter pub add, we want to add Firebase core. Cool, and while we're here, we also want to add Firebase auth so that we can now do the authentication. And just a last little setting up we need to do in the main file is this widgets Flutter binding ensure initialized and change this to an asynchronous function so that we can await Firebase initialize app for the current platform. So once you've done all that, just kill the app and restart it. And if your app opens like normal, then your app is connected to Firebase. Sweet, now let's figure out the authentication. So in the auth folder, let's create another file called authservice.dart. And in here, we're going to have all of the functionality. So we first are gonna just get the instance of the auth. We're going to sign in, sign up, and also sign out, and maybe deal with any errors if there are. So what we can do is say firebase.instance, and let's start off with our sign in method. So this is going to be a future. And I'm going to call this sign in with email and password. And all we need is an email and a password string. So when we call this method, we're going to try to sign in with email and password. And if there's any exceptions, any errors, then we're going to catch it and throw the error. Now, just before we build this any further, let's see if this sign in method works. So in our login page, we had this login method here, right? So that's when we click on the login button. What we want to do is we want to firstly get our auth service. And let's try the login and catch any errors. So on this page, we want to deal with any of the UI related stuff. So we're going to try to sign in and we need to get the text from each of the email and password controllers. And if we have any errors, then let's show a dialog box, which means we're going to need to know what the current context is. And so we're just going to show a little box just saying what the error is. Cool, so that should be working fine. Now one more thing we need is I need another file called authgate. And so what this authgate does is we're going to use a stream builder and the stream is just going to listen to any auth state changes. And so what this means is it's just going to check if the user is logged in or not. 
So if the user is logged in, then we're going to return the home page, which we haven't created yet. If the user is not logged in, then we're going to just return either the login or register page. So let's just quickly create that home page. And so if you go to the very beginning of the main.dart file, currently returning the login or register page, but I'm just gonna now return the auth gate. Okay, so the auth gate, what it's gonna do is it's gonna check to see if we're logged in or not, to then see what the appropriate page is that we need to display. Cool, so now our login should work. So let's try our test account. So we said test at gmail.com and the password. Then we can now go to our home page which means now we should have a way to log out, right? So in the app bar, in the actions, we can have a little log out button. So when we execute this log out function, then we need an ability to sign out. So let's come back to our auth service and create this sign out method. And this one's really easy. Just go to your auth and go sign out. Cool, so let's come back to our UI. So here we need to get our auth service. And then just sign out. Cool, so if I just try this out, if I click the sign out button on the top bar, on the top app bar, then it will just sign us out automatically. And again, just to remind you, that's what this auth gate is doing. It's constantly listening to the auth state changes, whether we're signed in or not. Cool. So if I just show you here, we can... Now we need to go to the register page and have an ability to sign up. So sign up with email and password. I just need to know the email and password. So firstly, let's try signing up. So I think it's create user. Yep, with email and password. And just catch any errors. Sweet, so let's go to our register page and in the register method UI. We need to get our auth service first of all. And just sign up. Let's give it our email controller text and our password controller text. Now, one thing just to help our code out a bit is I want to only do this when our password and the confirmed password is the same. So if the password and the confirmed password match, then let's try to sign up and also catch any errors. Let's actually get the login page show dialog, this guy, and paste it here. We're going to need to know the context. So let's give that as a parameter. And so I'm just gonna put a bit of comments here. So if the passwords match, then let's create user. And if the passwords don't match, then we're going to show an error telling the user to fix. Okay, let's try this. So if I try to create a user, then yay, we can go straight to the home page. And if I come back to my console, if you go to your authentication, you can see there's our account we just created. Awesome, and also just to see if our code is working, if the passwords don't match like this, then it says passwords don't match. Cool.
So now that we're on our home page, I want to have a bit of a menu drawer. So if you just type drawer and you save it, you can see that little menu icon on the top left and you can click this to open up the drawer. And I just want to keep my code nice and clean. So I'm going to separate this out into an individual component. Give it a background color. And we're gonna have a big column. So at the top, I want a bit of a logo and then a home list tile, a settings list tile. And at the very bottom, we want a logout tile. So just to see our progress as we code this up, in our home page, let's type my drawer. Oh, it's not there. Why? Oh, it's called my widget. Let's change this to my drawer. And let's start off with our logo. So at the top is a good idea to put a drawer header so that we can put an icon or an image. And then beneath that, we can have some list tiles. So the first one is just going to be a home. Let's give it a home icon. And I think we could use some padding on the left. Yeah, let's copy this and create one for the settings. And also for the logout. Now, just for the logout one, I want that one to be on the very bottom of the screen. So what you can do is Everything above it, let's wrap that in another column, right? Which means this overall column, we can say space between, and then it pushes everything to either side. And then let's come to our logout tile, and I feel like we could give it a bottom padding as well. Sweet, that's looking good. So let's start filling out the functionality of this. So on the on tap, if I tap on this home i just want to go back to the current screen so all i'm going to do is just pop the drawer so we can say navigator.pop and this will just get rid of the drawer now for the settings tile i want to pop the drawer of course but then i also want to navigate to the settings page now this settings page we haven't created yet so let's just do that real quick There we go, you can see it works. We can go to our settings page. And lastly, the logout. So we had it in our app bar before, but let's get rid of this and get rid of the logout and let's put it in our drawer. Okay, so if I click on this logout tile, we just want to log out. So let's see if this works. And that's looking pretty good. So now that we've got the authentication done, it's time for the Firestore. So for kind of like our chatting functionality and the users and stuff like that. So if you go to the Firestore database, let's create database. You can select your region, but I'm just gonna leave it at United States. And what we need to do here is in the rules, you can set up your custom rules, but just for us to be able to write information, I'm just gonna change this to be true and just publish it. Cool, so if I come back to my code, what I'm gonna do is I am gonna create a new folder called services. And our auth service, we're going to put into this folder. 
and we're going to create another folder for chat services. So auth and chat, those are our two main services. Okay, so let's save and close all these files and just go to the chat service. And so in this class, what we're going to do is firstly, we need to import that package. So go to your terminal and type flutter pub add cloud firestore. And then once we got that, we are going to get a method to get the user stream to get all the users and display it on the screen. We need a method to send a message and also to get messages. So let's just start off with the getting an instance of the firestore. And let's start filling out the user stream. Now, if you look at this and it's kind of confusing, there's a lot of things going on. I can try to explain it nicely for you. So in this stream, you see inside here, the list that is a map that is a string dynamic. So what that means is firstly, a map. What that is, is it's kind of like a field like this. And your Firebase console looks like a map. So it's got email and it, what is the email for the user? It's test at gmail.com. And maybe they also have another property like an ID and it's some number. So this is an example of a map. It's kind of a way to represent like a user in this case. So we can have another map or another user, right? And so when you have a list of these, this is what this is talking about, a list of maps. Okay, and we're gonna return the stream. Stream meaning we're just gonna to listen to our Firestore. So we're going to return the Firestore collection. So it's in a collection called users. And let's go to the snapshots and we're going to map this. And I'll put the comments here just to try to make it as clear as possible. We're gonna go through each individual user and just return that user. And at the end of all of these maps, we're gonna return it to a list. Okay, so what did we just do? If you come to our home page, what we're gonna to try to do is try to display all the users. So firstly, I'm just gonna get the chat and auth services And for the body, I'm going to build the user list. So I'm going to separate this widget out just to keep our code clean. And we're going to return a stream builder. Now for the stream, we created this just then. So go to your chat service and we can say get users stream. And then for the builder, what we're going to do is firstly, just see if there's any errors. It might be loading, so if that's the case, just return loading. And then finally, when everything's done, let's return the list view. So for the children, we're going to look at the snapshot data and go through the map, and we're going to create each individual user list item. Okay, so even this, I'm going to just separate it out just to keep it nice and modular. So for building an individual user list item, I just need to know the user data, which is that map that we talked about. And so let's put some comments here. So display all users except current user. Okay, and then we're gonna return a user tile. So a user tile is gonna be another UI component. So let's just create that real quick. And what we need for this user tile is I just need to know the text and also the tab. So let's create our gesture detector and just kind of like a container with some decoration.
and the main element for this is a row of an icon and the username. Okay, so let's come back to our home page. We're going to see the red squiggle because we need to fill out the text. Right, so I'm just going to display the user's email and then on tap, currently we are on the user page. Currently we're on the home page. So if we tap on a specific user, let's go to the chat page and chat with that user. Now this chat page we haven't created yet. So let's just create that very quickly here. And require the receiver's email just to know who we're chatting to. So let's come back to the home page, import the chat page we just created and just give it the user's email. Cool, everything's ready. So if I just come back to our red squiggle here, build user list item, we have to give it the two parameters, which is the user data and just the current context. And I think that's all good. So currently, even though we have some users, it's not displaying the users, right? So what the issue is, is when we create a user, if you go to our sign up method, once we create the user, let's also save this user's information in a separate document. Okay, so let's get an instance of our fire store at the top. And go to that Firestore's collection of users. And then we're going to go to the specific document for that user. And we're going to create a little map here. So let's save some information like the user ID and also their email. And it, sh it should be a good idea to put this in the sign in method as well, because sometimes we might make an account for a user in the back end and not through the app. So just to make sure we have all the users, just save the users if it doesn't already exist. And so let's create a user here, flutter at gmail.com. And if I register, you can see, yay, we have our first user in the app. Let's create Ronaldo. And there's Ronaldo. Cool, so we can now display all the users. Now, one thing you don't wanna display is you don't wanna display yourself. Like, if you see a page of users and you wanna to chat to them, we shouldn't be able to chat to ourselves. So we just wanna display everyone else. So let's just grab this and we're gonna put a quick if statement and just do a quick check. So is the email not equal to the current user? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my auth service and let's just create a quick method here just to get the current user. And so we can just use that anywhere in our code just to get the current logged in user. So we're going to compare that to the user's email and as long as it's not the same, we're going to display it. And it looks like it's still displaying myself and whoops, that's because I got my current user, but I should get the email and compare the emails. I'm going to add some margin and let's add some padding. And I feel like we could add some space between the icon and the username. And you can see if I click on any of these users, I can go to a new chat page to talk to that user, which is pretty cool. Sweet, so now that we're on the chat page, we need to be able to finally send a message and also get the messages. So when we send a message, we just need to know the receiver and what the message is. The sender, we don't need to know because that's the current logged in user, which we can access anytime. So Firstly, get the current user's info, and then we're gonna create a new message. 
and then we're going to construct a chat room ID for these two users. And we have to and we have to make sure that this chat room ID is sorted to ensure uniqueness, which I'll explain a bit later on. And then we're going to add this message to the database. Cool. So let's come to the top and just also get the auth as well so that I can get the current user. So let's have the current user's ID and the current user's email. Now it's a good idea to save the timestamp, right? So we'll just say now, which is when the user sends a message, we're going to collect that information and we're going to create a new message. Now for this, I'm going to create a new folder called models. And let's have a message dot dot file. And this is what an individual message should look like. We need to know the messages sender, right? So their ID and their email. We need to know who's going to receive it, what the message is, and also the timestamp of this message. And with this information, let's have a quick method to convert it to a map. Sweet, so in our chat service, when we send a message, let's create a new message. So let's create a new message. So for the sender ID, the person who's sending it is just the current user. So let's just give it those details. Now we need to construct a chat room ID to store all of these messages. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a list of strings and we're just gonna have two strings in this IDs, which is the current user's ID and the receiver's ID. And then we're going to sort them. And what this does is it just makes sure that any two people have the same ID. Okay, then what we can do is just join the strings together. Let's join them with an underscore. And then finally, just add this to the collection in Firestore. And I'll show you what this looks like in the console in Firestore a bit later on. Now for getting the messages, it's quite similar as well. We're going to need the user ID and the other user ID, so just both people. And we're going to similarly construct a chat room ID for the two users. And then we're going to return the collection for the chat rooms. And we're just going to go to that specific chat room. Cool, and that's pretty much it. Okay, sweet, so let's see if this works. Now, if I go to a chat room, the first thing I'll need is actually a input box so that the user can type a message in, right? So let's create a text controller. And let's get our chat and auth services. And let's just create a quick method here for sending a message, anything UI related. Now, just to help the code out a bit, we're only going to send a message if there's something in there to send, right? Otherwise, it's going to send blank messages. So as long as the message controller is not empty, then we can send the message. And actually, we also want to know the receiver's ID. So let's just require that at the top. Cool. And then the message, give it the message controller's text. Cool. 
Sweet, and then after we send it, we should clear the controller. Okay, sweet, now let's start working on the UI. So in the body, we're gonna have a big column and we're gonna have two things. So the majority of the screen is gonna be just displaying all the messages and at the bottom, we wanna display the user's input. So we're gonna use an expanded widget for the message list to fill out most of the screen. And let's start by getting the sender's ID, which is just the current user's ID. And we're gonna return a stream builder. Now, what stream are we gonna to listen to? Well, we already created that get messages stream and just give it the two different people. And we're going to build a list view. So let's just check for any errors and see if it's loading. And then finally, just return the list view. Let's build out a individual message item given a document. And we're just going to return the message. Sweet, everything's set up. So finally, let's just create our user input. So for this one, we, we're gonna have a row. Now we already created our text field at the beginning of the video, right? So we're going to put that in an expanded widget because it should just take up most of the space. And then just next to it, we want to have a send button to send the message. And let's give that to our UI. Awesome. Now I'm just going to kill that app and just rebuild all this. And you can see there's our little user input at the bottom. So let's try this out. I'm going to say hello and hit the send button. And you can see that the messages are getting displayed. So if you come back to our Firebase console, you can see if you just refresh the page, you can see this is what it looks like. So we have a collection of users and we also have a collection for the chat rooms. And each chat room has its own ID, which is unique between two people. And so you can go to the messages and you can look at each individual message. Okay, awesome. Now one thing we have to fix is if I sign in under someone else, like Messi, and I type it, it's just all coming on the same side, right? So let's work with a bit of alignment to show the messages on the right, if it's for the current user, and then we want to have all the other person's messages on the left-hand side, right? So let's have a quick Boolean here just to check if this is the current user. So this right here will check if the user of this message is the current user that signed in. And then using that, we can say, we can specify an, al an, an alignment. So is current user question mark? If it is, then align to the center right. If it isn't, align to the center left. Let's wrap this text in a container and give it the alignment. Looks like it's still not working. Maybe we could give it into a column and then use the cross axis alignment. Oh, I know why, what happened? 
if I if we come back to this new message, we mixed this up. The sender ID, we should give the current user ID and the email to the email. Well, that's why. Okay, let's save that. And now if I say this is messy, it comes to the right side. Okay, sweet. So let's just double check this. I'm gonna sign into Ronaldo. And let's talk to Flutter. And then the messages comes on the right hand side. And I'm just gonna log out. Let's sign in as Flutter and go to Ronaldo and yep, it's on the correct side now. So the current user that types the message is always gonna be on the right hand side. Sweet, now the functionality is pretty much done. I just wanna finish off by decorating this up a little bit more. Like the user input at the bottom, it's too close. So let's put a padding. And the icon button, I'm just gonna make it kind of green on the outside, make it a circle. and the arrow can be white. And also let's create a chat bubble to make it look more like a chat application. So for any chat bubble, I just need to know the message and also if it's the current user. Right, so the color is just going to depend on if it's the current user or not. And let's try this out. So let's come back to our build message item and return a chat bubble. And you can see there it is. That's what it looks like. Let's make it look much better. So let's add some padding. Let's add some margin. And the text color can be white. And let's make the corners not sharp, more curved. And so you can just play around with this and adjust it to however you like, but that's looking pretty good so far. And also, you know these app bars, I like to just make them like in the home page. I like to just make it transparent and make the elevation zero and instead change the foreground color so that I can see that. I think that looks a little bit more cleaner and more minimal. So I'm going to do the same thing for the chat page. That looks better and also the settings page. Clean up the app bars and let's give it the background colors if you haven't. And just to finish off, the last thing I'm going to do is to implement dark mode into this application. So we've been doing everything in light mode. So I'm going to create another file here for the dark mode. And so again, you can choose your own colors, but I'm just going to use these colors and these shades of gray. And for us to switch easily between the two themes, we need a theme provider. And so we're going to start off at, as light mode and let's have a getter method to get what the current theme is. Let's also have a boolean to see if this is dark mode or not. So this is really helpful later on, which I'll show you. This little double double equal sign is just going to check if it's dark mode. And then we need to have a set theme data. 
And most importantly, we need a toggle theme. So if the theme is light mode, then change it to dark mode. And vice versa. Cool, so if I come back to my main.dart file, we need to give it the change notifier provider, which I actually didn't even import. So let's just import that real quick. Flutter pub add provider. And so you can say change notifier provider and give it the theme provider and then give it our app. And then if you come back to our material app at the bottom, you can see the theme currently, we just gave it light mode, but it could be light mode or dark mode, right? So we're just gonna use our provider to get the theme data. So this could switch between light mode and dark mode. Sweet, so now we actually need a switch, like a physical UI switch. So in the settings page, I'm gonna create a row and have a little toggle here. So I'm going to use a Cupertino switch, which is the Apple looking one, just because I think it looks better. And you can see for the value, if I say false, it's off. If I say true, it's on. And so let's just decorate this up real quick. Let's space between, give it a container with some decoration. That's looking pretty good. And so now for the value, it's gonna be a Boolean, like a true or false. So let's access our theme provider and just check if this is dark mode or not. And then on the changed, if the user taps on this switch, we want to go to that theme provider and then toggle the theme. Sweet, so let's save this and check this out. Yay, we can flick the switch and now we're in dark mode. Everything's in dark mode. And then if we need to make any specific changes to the colors, then you can go to this dark mode and then change it up. And what's even cool about this is you can actually click on this and then get the specific color that you want. So I feel like this secondary color could be a bit darker, like my tiles are looking pretty light. And so if I just save this, yeah, that's looking pretty good. And I think the chat bubbles could also use a bit of dark mode adjustment. So let's just see if we're in dark mode, right? Then let's adjust these colors. and also change the text colors appropriately to if it's dark mode or not. So just change this up to your appropriate style. And let me know if you have any questions about any of this, I can help you out in the comments below. Everything is working in terms of this chat app, and it's looking pretty good. Sweet, now one last thing that we need to fix is if I go into a chat and I send a lot of messages, then it's gonna need to scroll down to the bottom, right? And especially when we toggle the software keyboard, it should automatically scroll to the bottom. So. What we need to do is if I come to my chat page, I 
I'm going to firstly convert this to a stateful widget. And then we need a focus node. So when I initialize the state, we're going to add a listener to this focus node. And so this is just helpful for the text field if we're in focus or not. So if we are in focus, then what we're going to do is we're going to wait for the keyboard to show up. And then that will allow us to calculate the remaining space on the screen. And then we're going to scroll down. Okay, so we're not going to scroll down immediately. We're going to just wait a little bit of time, 500 milliseconds, so that the keyboard shows up. And then we'll scroll down. And we should also dispose of these focus nodes and controllers. And we need a scroll controller. So for the scroll down method, if we just get the scroll controller and we can animate to the very bottom. We can control this duration. I'm just going to say, let's say one second, and you can specify the type of curve, like the kind of animation. So I'm just going to choose this fast out, slow in. And then if you scroll down, if you go to the list view, let's give the controller our scroll controller. And then also, if you go to the text field, we're going to give it our focus node. So let's go to our text field component and let's actually require this. So now in our text field, we can give it a focus node. And so what this is doing is if you go to one of the chats, if I click on the text field, it'll be in focus. And so the keyboard will show up, right? And then once the keyboard shows up, we're going to scroll down, as you can see. Cool. Now the other thing is when we go into the list, we should scroll down automatically, right? So let's also do that. If you go to the initial state, so when this page fires up, let's also do a similar thing. So it's going to wait for the list view to be built. And then let's scroll to the bottom. And I think the last case is when we send a message. So when I send a message, we also want to just scroll down to the bottom so that we can see the latest message. Okay, let's test this out. Firstly, if I go in, it just scrolls automatically. I open the keyboard, it goes automatically. And if I type a new message, it scrolls down automatically as well. And that's it. Yo, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm gonna teach you how to create a minimal social media app. We're going to start completely from scratch and start with authentication. And then once you're logged in, you can post a message to the wall. We'll have some additional pages like the profile page. And I'll also show you how we can make it using light mode as well as dark mode. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and I'm just going to delete everything below the main function just to start this from scratch. Now the very first thing we need to make is a login page. So I'm just going to create that in a separate folder called pages, just to keep our code nice and clean. And the login page for now, we'll just start off with a blank scaffold. And let's just come back to our main function just to import it. And sweet, if you save everything, we should just have this nice white blank app. So this is where we'll begin. Now for this app, I want to take consideration for light mode, but also dark mode. So I'm going to create a new folder here called theme. And let's create a light mode file. 
and let's fill out the different colors for light mode so the brightness I'm gonna make light and the main thing here is the color scheme so I'm gonna fill out the background primary secondary and also inverse primary is pretty helpful so these are just different shades of gray that we're going to use cool and maybe let's have another one for the text we can have a body color and a display color cool and then let's just do another quick one for dark mode and so for dark mode, I'm just going to copy and paste this in, switch some of these values. Make the grays a bit darker and some of the text we can make lighter. Cool. So you can obviously choose whichever colors you want, but I'm going to go with this. Now in our main dot dot file in our material app, you can specify the theme to be light mode. And then we can also specify the dark theme. So we'll give dark mode. Cool. So if I just show you right at the beginning, if you go to the scaffold, we can say theme dot of context and we can go to the color scheme. If I just set the background color, this will just change depending on if it's light mode or dark mode. So currently it's in light mode and let's start filling out the body. So in the middle, I'm just going to have a big column and let's have a bit of a plan here. So I'm going to need a logo and then maybe an app name. And then we need two text fields. So one for the email and one for the password. Let's have a forgot password as well. And the main thing here is the sign in button. And at the very bottom, we also want this little text saying, if you don't have an account, then register here so that we can go to the register page. Cool. So let's start filling this out. Starting with the logo, you can place whatever image you want. I'm just going to start with a very simple person icon. And for the color, I'm going to give it the inverse primary. So it will be a very dark color that we specified in the, in the theme. Cool. And you can see there it is at the top. Now for the column, I'm just going to center this main access alignment. And if I just toggle the appearance and I change it to dark mode, you can see that the colors change nicely. So let's just continue on. Now after the logo, I want to have a little gap. So let's use the size box and then this is usually where you would put your app name. So I'm just going to say minimal. And when it comes to the text fields, I want to create this in a new folder called components just so that we can reuse this later on. So I'm going to create a stateless widget here called my text field. And here are the different properties that I want to change between text field to text field. So the variables are going to be the hint text. Are we going to obscure the text like for the password? And also what is the controller? And the controller is used to access whatever's typed into the text field. So let's just require these when we create this text field. And just to show you real quick what's going on, if I just return a blank text field and come back to the login page, you can start typing my text field and you can hit enter to auto import. And now we can just start filling these out. So controller, we need to give it a controller. So let's just create that at the very top. We have to create a text editing controller. So the first one is going to be for email. And then we want another one for a password controller. So if you just save this, you can see there's a little line there. There's our text field and we can just start typing stuff in and we can access what the user typed in using this email controller. Cool. So let's just come back to our component text field just to decorate this up. So we can give it the controller that we passed through. And I just want to decorate a little bit here. So I'm going to use an outline input border, which is what I like. And it looks like we probably need some space between the app name and the text field. And this column, let's give it a padding all the way around of 25. Nice. Sweet. Now I want to create another text field for the password. And again, we're going to need some space between, but a very small space. So let's make the height just 10. 
And for the obscure text, I want to say true for this one. So what this one is saying is we want to make sure that when the user types a password in, that you can't see it. So I'll show you what I mean. And one thing I always like to do is to make sure the border corners aren't so sharp. Like I like to specify the border radius and curve them a bit. You can obviously go for a much more curved look, but I'm going to go for 12. Cool. And we've got the hint text there. So what the hint text one is doing is if I just say email for the first one and then password for the second, you can see it kind of tells the user what should be typed in this text field. So it'll disappear when you start typing. Cool. And these little dots is what I mean by the obscure text, like for passwords. And it looks like it's currently set to true as default. So let's just pass through the obscure text variable. So the top one's false, the bottom one's true. So you can see in the email text field, we want to show the letters, but for the password, we want to hide them. So that's what that's doing. Cool, and then let's move on, have another little sized box of 10, and let's have a text widget saying forgot password. Now, I actually want to position this. It's in the middle right now, but I want to have it on the right hand side. So a little trick is if you just put this in a row, you can see it's just going to go straight to the left hand side and then I'm going to specify the access alignment to the end. There we go. Cool. And then let's just style this up a little bit. And dark mode and light mode looking pretty good so far. Now it's time for our sign in button. So we might have to use some buttons later on again. So I'm going to create this as a separate file in our components. Let's call this my button. And again, if we think about what's going to be different from button to button, the first thing is the text that's written on this button. And also if I just use a gesture detector here for the on tab, the function of the button is going to be different. Right, so let's just require those two parameters. And let's start decorating this up. So I'm just going to use a container here. And just curve the corners a bit. Add some padding. And then in the middle, we just want to display a text. So just to visually see what we just created, let's come back to our login page and import my button. Cool. So for the first one, I'm just going to say login and then on tap, let's just execute nothing for now. Let's just see what this looks like. Cool. And there it is for light mode. Let's just see what dark mode. And yeah, that's looking pretty good. Sweet. So if I click on this button, right, we want to log in, which is a method we haven't created yet. So let's just create that on the top. And we can fill this out later on when we connect it to Firebase. Sweet. So that's our login page. But at the very bottom, we want to have a little message here saying don't have an account, then register here and the register button. We want to make it a bit bold because we want to show the user we can tap on this. By the way, if you ever don't like any of these colors, you can come back to your theme and adjust it to the way you want. Like for example, this inverse primary is looking a little bit too dark for my liking. So I'm just going to soften that up a bit. And just check on dark mode as well. Everything's looking good to your preference. But yeah, like I said, in our login page at the very bottom, we want to make sure that the register here text widget is tappable. Like we want to click on this to go to the register page. So that's why we have it more bold. And let's wrap this in a gesture detector so that we can tap on this widget. Sweet. Now let's create a new page for register and let's do the same thing. So I'm just going to copy everything from the login page and just change it to register page. And the main difference we need for this one is I'm going to create another text editing controller for confirming the password. And also let's have another one to accept the username as well. So we're going to use four text fields in total.
and the button should say register instead of login and at the very bottom let's say already have an account then log in here so we can switch between the two pages cool and just to show you the visual differences if I go to the main.dart file in the home let's return the register page cool and it looks like that's what it looks like and it's working pretty good so what we want to do is we want to be able to show the login page first but if the user hasn't registered before then we want them to be able to go to the register page and back and forth so that's why we have these on tap methods that we created from before so I'm going to create this at the top and require it when we create this login page as well as the register page Just to organize what we're about to do, I'm gonna create another folder called auth, and I'm gonna create a file here called login or register. So what this one's gonna do is, it's going to be a stateful widget. And initially, we're just going to show a login page, and then we're going to create a toggle so that we can go between the two pages. Cool, so when we build this widget, just depending on if we are showing the login page, then return login page. And you can see there's that on tap that we specified from before. Just give it the toggle pages method and same thing for the register page. Sweet, so if I come back to my main.dart file, instead of returning one page or the other, let's just return this new login or register page. Okay, and just again, to be clear, it's gonna fire up this login or register page and at the beginning we're going to show login page and we can see these toggles if we tap on these text widgets here we can go between the two pages awesome now let's go to your firebase console and let's create a new project i'm going to call it minimal social app Sweet, now what we need to do is let's go to our authentication and let's click get started. And if you go to the sign in providers, let's add a new provider and click the email and password. Sweet. Then let's come back to our Flutter project and let's hook it up to Firebase. So in your terminal, just make sure first of all, if you hit Firebase login, that is logged into the same email as your Firebase, Firebase console. Then we want to say dot pub global activate Flutter Fire CLI. Looks like I got this little error, so I'm just gonna copy that in. And this is the main thing, Flutter Fire configure. And then look for the project that you just created. There's my one minimal social app. And I'm going to create this for iOS and Android. The last thing we need to do is to add the Firebase core package. And we want to add in the Firebase auth package as well. Sweet, and then just a little bit of code in the main function. Just to finish the setting up, we wanna say widgets flutter binding ensure initialized. And let's make this an asynchronous function and let's await the Firebase to initialize the app. Cool, and just save it and run your app again just to make sure there's no more errors. And if you come back to your Firebase console, if you refresh the page, you should be able to see that we have these two apps connected now. Awesome, so now what we're going to do is let's try to create a new user. So we have this nice register page and we have this register method for us to fill out. In here, let's just have a little plan. So firstly, we wanna show a loading circle and we want to check to make sure that the passwords and the confirmed passwords match. And once that's all done, then let's try creating the user. So just starting with the showing the loading circle, I'm just going to show a dialogue here and I need the context. So I'm actually just gonna switch this state 
list widget to a state full widget. And you can do that by hovering your mouse over the state list widget word and hit command dot. I think on Windows it's control dot and you'll have this option to switch to a stateful widget. So in this little dialog box, let's show in the middle a circular progress indicator. So that's just our loading circle. And let's make sure that we are gonna create the user only if the passwords match. So if the password controller and the confirm password controller isn't the same, then we're going to pop the loading circle and let's just show a little error to the user telling them, you know, to fix the password. So this displaying this user, so displaying this kind of message is going to be pretty common use case for us. So let's just create another method here. And this one, I'm actually going to create it in a new folder, in a new file here, just called helper functions, because we might need to use it across the app. This one is just for displaying an error to the user or just displaying a message to the user. So for the parameters, just given a string that's a message, let's show a dialog displaying this message. So just to see what we just did, we can now import this little help function and we can give it a message like passwords don't match. And we'll see later on what this looks like. But let's just finish off this code real quick. So let's try to create the user now. Now in Firebase, we are going to say Firebase auth.instance, and you can see here the create user with email and password. That's what we want, and we can just give it the email and password. And looks like we should change this to an asynchronous function. And then finally, if that's all done, then pop the circle. Now we might get some errors. So if we have a Firebase auth exception, let's catch this error. And Again, pop the circle, but display the message to the user. And again, that's why that helper function is very helpful. So I'm just going to kill this app and let's just run it again. Sweet. Now let's go to our register page. I'm going to say Mitch for the username, MitchCoco at gmail.com. And the first thing I just want to check is let's try to say our password and the confirmed password is different. Let's just see the error message. Sweet, passwords don't match. Fill out the username, fill out the email, and let's create a user. Sweet, now if I come back to my Firebase console and you go to the authentication, you can see there's our new user that we just created. Sweet, and by the way, just to optimize this code a little bit, we should say if the passwords don't match, and put this in an if else statement. So we only wanna to try to create the account as long as the passwords match. So we can help the code out a little bit. And now let's try to log in. So we created a user. So let's try to fill out this login method. So it's kind of similar. We're going to show a loading circle first. And then we're going to try the sign in. So if you go to your Firebase auth.instance, you can see this option sign in with email and password. And then we can pop the loading circle. And if we have any errors, just display the error. Awesome, now what this means is if we have users that can sign in and sign out, we want to have a way to make sure that the app can automatically know what pages to display. Like if the user is signed in, then we want to display the home page. If the user isn't signed in, then we want to display the login register page. So we're going to go to our auth folder and create another file called auth.dart 
And this one, I'm just going to call it auth page. And what it's going to do is it's going to use a stream to just listen to the authentication. So if the user is signed in or not. So the stream that we're going to listen to is Firebase auth instance. And you can see here it's called auth state changes. So this will just let us know about if the user is signed in or not. So if the user is logged in, then we're going to return the home page, which we haven't created yet. If the user is not logged in, then that's when we want to display the login or register page. Right, so just to demonstrate what we are doing, I'm just going to create a home page real quick. Let's just show a blank scaffold. Let's just have an app bar saying home page. Awesome. So just starting from the main function, just to keep everyone on the same page, it's going to fire up my app. And then we're going to go to the login or register page currently. So I'm going to change this to auth page, which is what we just created. And this is going to firstly listen for if we are already signed in or not. Okay, it looks like we are in the home page, but our app bar is kind of funny. Let's just give it a color. And we can naturally have a action for a logout button. Right, so logging out is also very easy. It's just Firebase auth instance dot sign out. So we can now log in, we can now log out. Sweet, now let's keep moving on. Now we are able to do the authentication. We can sign users in. And so we're at this home page. Now we're going to create a few more pages for this app. So we've got the home page, we want a profile page. And then let's also have a users page to display all of the users inside the app. So for this app bar color, let's give it sort of our theme. Now the first thing I want to have is the drawer to kind of organize these pages. So without even filling out anything, if you just save this, you can see there's that little menu button on the top left and I can open up a blank drawer. So what I'm going to do is just to keep our code nice and organized, I'm going to create my drawer in my components folder just to separate out the code. Cool. So let's give it our background color. And then we're going to have a column. So just have a bit of a plan. We have a drawer header at the top. And then we're going to have three tiles. So the home, profile, and the user tile. So let's just start with the drawer header. This one, I'm just going to give it an icon. And this is just a convenient widget to have on the top of a drawer. Just occupies a good amount of space. And then for the list tiles. So I'm just going to have the home one first. Now when I tap on this, the home, we are already home. So we just want to pop this dialog. And maybe we could give some padding just to the left of this. Sweet. Now let's copy this list tile and I'm going to do this, do the same thing for profile. And users and also log out. Now when it comes to the log out button, I want to have that on the very bottom while the rest three are at the top. So what I'm going to do is everything except for the logout list tile, I'm going to group them in its own column. And then this overall column, I'm going to make the main access alignment space between. So this will just push the logout to the bottom. 
And just for the logout tile, I'm just going to add some extra padding for the bottom side. Okay, this is looking visually good. So we're going to use this drawer to deal with the navigation to go to different pages. So let's just create some quick scaffolds here for the profile page and the users page. Now, if you come to the main.dart file, we can go to the routes and this will help us to organize our pages to navigate to. So I'm just going to list out all of the pages that we have. So we've got the login, register page, home page, profile page, and users page. So the reason why these routes are useful is if we click on this profile tile, we want to pop the drawer, but we also want to navigate to this profile page. So we can give it that route name. And similar to the users tile. Awesome. And then the last one was the logout. Now we actually had the logout button in our app bar, right? So let's actually get rid of that and put it inside of our drawer. Okay, much better. And we can navigate to the different pages. Sweet. Looks like we can't really see the app bar, but we can focus on decorating it now. Great. Now the last Firebase service we want to use is the Cloud Firestore. So this is just to store the data for the user's posts and also some information about all of the users that we have. So in your Firebase console, let's go to your Firestore database and create a database. Just hit next and you can select your location. I'm just going to leave mine at the US. And one thing you want to do here real quick is in the rules, we can allow the read and write if true. I'm just going to change that so that we can update some of the data. Awesome. Now we come back to our Flutter project and we should open up our terminal and add the package for the Firestore. Cool. So now we can store some information about any of the data in our app. So the first thing I want to store is when we create a new user, I want to store this user credential in my database so that I can have a page in the users page where I just sort of list out all of the users that we have in that app. So when we create the new user, we have this user credential. So I'm going to create a user document and add it to the Firestore. So let's create that method real quick. So this would be a future create user document with the given user credential. So first of all, let's just check real quick. Just make sure it's not null. And this is how we add a new document to our database. So we're going to go to our collection called users. That's the group is going to be under. And we can create a new document here with the user's email. And then we can set some information here. So I want to store the email and the username. Okay, so I restarted my app just to make sure all the changes were done well, especially when you add a new package, just restart your app. And let's create a new user. Let's create one for Ronaldo. So I register it. Let's see in our Cloud Firestore, if I refresh the page, you can see there's our new collection that we just added. And you can see it's the Ronaldo. So this is how we store some data in our app using Firestore. Cool, which means we can now have a profile page sort of displaying the current logged in user. 
and we can get the user's details to display on this profile page. So let's grab the current user. You can say Firebase auth.instance.current user. And then let's use a future to get the user's details that we just added. So remember, we had that in our collection called users. And let's get those documents. So in our profile page, let's sort of decorate this up as we go along with the background color. But the main thing here is the body. We're going to use a future builder. And what we're going to build is very similar to what we had in the other pages. We're just going to firstly show a loading circle and then any error that we need to display. And then let's get the data. So firstly, let's show a loading circle if we need. And then if we have an error, let's display the error. And then finally, if we have the data, then let's grab the data from this user. Okay, so once, once we have the user, let's grab the email field and the username field. Okay, and at the very end, else, if we have nothing, just display no data. Okay, now let's see if this works. If I save this and I go to my profile, yeah, you can see the Ronaldo information, which is the current logged in user. Sweet. So now we can display the current user. Let's go to our users page and try to display all the users. So let's just start off by giving it a background color and then the stream builder. We're going to listen for the collection of users. So again, just display any errors if we need. and show a loading circle. And then let's get all the users. And we're going to display it using a list view builder. So the item count, this is going to be however many users we have. And finally, in the item builder, let's get the individual user. So we're going through the index of users. And let's just return it using a basic list tile. And whoops, this should be inside of a text widget. Okay, so let's save that. And let's create a new user here. So let's create like Bill Gates or something. You can see if you go to the profile, then yep, we can see our information, Bill Gates. And then if you go to the users page, we can see all of the users that are signed in. So we've got Ronaldo and Bill Gates. Awesome, now let's spend the, f the next few moments to just decorate this up. So the profile page, I actually don't want an app bar. So if I come down to my column, you got the username, you got the email, and at the top, let's have a kind of profile picture section.
So I'm going to use a person icon and just use some decoration with a curved border. Yeah, something like this. And let's also style up the username, make it much bigger and much bolder. And space this out a little bit. And decorate up the email as well. Cool, that's looking pretty good. Now I want to have a kind of custom back button. So I'm going to create my own one in the components. Now let's create, I'm going to create my own back button here. So I'm going to have a gesture detector. And when you tap on this back button, which is going to pop the current page. And for the container, I'm going to have a arrow, a back arrow. And let's give it some padding. And decoration. I want this to be a circle. Sweet, something like that. Cool. Now I actually want it on the left hand side. So a little trick here is you can put this inside of a row and that'll push it to the left. And let's just use some padding just to position it where we want. Cool. And let's just make sure dark mode. Yep, dark mode is looking good as well. Sweet. Now let's go to our users page and decorate this up. So again, copy in that back button. Okay, let's delete the app bar. So now let's come back to our home page and for this app bar title, I'm just going to call it the wall and we can make the background color transparent, make the foreground color, the inverse primary, and let's start filling out the body of this column. So now we want to try to post a message. So the very top thing at the column, I'm going to have a text field to have a box for the user to type. Good thing we created a our own text field in our components from before because we can now use it again, right? So we can say like, say something and we need a controller. So let's come to the top and create a controller. Cool, now if I save it, there it is. Now I'm gonna need some padding on either side. Or maybe just all the way around, I want 25. 
Okay, so now when it comes to posting messages and, and retrieving those messages from Firebase, I'm going to create a new folder called database. And let's create a new file called firestore.dart. So I'm just gonna separate out the logic from the UI as much as I can. So I'm gonna create a class here called, Fire, called Firestore database. And just to have a bit of excellent explanation at the top, this database stores posts that users have published in the app. It is stored in a collection called posts in Firebase. And each post is going to contain a message, the email of the user, and also the timestamp. So let's have a bit of a plan here. We firstly need to know the current logged in user and we want to be able to get the collection of posts from Firebase and a few methods here. We want to be able to post a message and also read posts from Firebase. So let's just start off with getting the current logged in user. And then for the collection of posts, we can go to the Firebase Firestore instance collection posts. Now, this is the main important methods here. So for posting a message, it's going to be a future. Let's call it add post. And all I need to know is what's the message that I'm going to post. So we have that collection of posts and let's just add in another post. And remember each post is going to have three bits of information, just the user that posted it, the message, and also the timestamp. Sweet, so now let's imagine that we have a bunch of posts in our database. Now we wanna be able to read that information and display it back into our app. So for this one, it's going to be a stream to continuously listen for any changes. So we wanna get the posts and let's just order them by timestamp descending is true. So in other words, the latest post will be at the top. And then we can just return this stream. Awesome. Now I'm just going to quickly create a custom button to post when the user types a message in. So just starting off with a gesture detector, we need the on tap and I'm just going to create a very simple minimal button. So if I come back to my home page next to my text field, I need to put this in a row. And by the way, when you do this, you have to expand the text field because we have to fill the remaining space. And then next to it, we want to put a post button that we just created. Sweet. And there it is. Now it looks like I'm going to need to add some padding to this and just some margin on the left hand side. And let's just refine the colors here. Oh, looking good. Sweet, so if I hit this button on the on tap, we want to have a method to post a message, right? Now, one little useful check here is to only post a message if there is something in the text field, right? We don't want to be sending blank posts. So if the controller is not empty, then let's try to add it to the Firestore. So we want to access those Firestore methods that we created in this class. So in our home page at the top, let's get access to that Firestore. I'm actually going to call it database instead of Firestore. And now we can just say database.addPost and we can give it the message, which is going to be whatever is in the controller. Sweet. And then a very good idea is to clear the controller. So after the, after the user posts a message, we want to, we want to have nothing in the controller anymore. Now, oh, looks like I forgot to actually give the method to my button. So if I say first post and then I click post and if I come back to my console and I refresh it, you can see there's our collection of posts and there's our first one there. Looks good. So now that we can post a message and it's in Firebase, let's try to read it back into our app. 
So again, that's going to be using a stream builder. And we are going to listen for the stream that we created for the get post stream. And this is going to be the last time that we need to do this. So let's show a loading circle first. Let's get all posts. And if there's no data, and then finally we can return the list. Right, so we're gonna go through however many posts we have. We're gonna get the individual post. And then get the data from each of those posts, which is the message, the user email, and the timestamp. And then in terms of the UI, we can return it using a very simple list tile. Cool, so that's the functionality is all done. Then everything else is just decorating, right? Like the styling of these texts and the different UI elements for us to make it look aesthetic. All right, so you can add some padding. And so even this list tile, because as we decorate it, it's getting bigger and bigger. I probably want to reuse this list tile. So I'm going to create a new component called my list tile and just start decorating it inside here. So for this list tile, it's going to be, we have to give it a title and a subtitle. And yep, that's making our code look much cleaner. And even in our users, right, we have these list tiles. So we can come back to that users page. And instead of just displaying a basic list tile, let's give it the one we just created. And then if you want to further customize this, then you can just do that in the list tile component, right? Like maybe giving it some color and some border radius. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. But we have just created the minimal social app, right? And again, let's just check the dark mode just to make sure it's looking pretty good. And yeah, looking sleek. And that's it. That's how you create a very minimal social app using Firebase and Flutter. I want to continue building on top of this, maybe adding some extra functionality like comments and likes. And if you have any other suggestions on what you want to see me build next, let me know in the comments. I hope you learned something and let me know if you have any trouble. I'll try to help you out. But thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Yo, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm gonna show you how we can code up this nice, sleek, minimal weather app by reading some API data. Now, just to have a clear picture of what we're about to do, I drew up a nice little diagram for us. So let's start off with our phone. Now, the first thing is we need to get the location of this device, and then we're gonna give that information to a weather service class, which we'll create. And this class will handle most of our operations. So once we get the device's location, we're going to give that city name to the API, which is this openweathermap.org website. 
and then that will return us the weather for that city and just before we give that to our phone directly we're going to go through a weather model just so that we can get the relevant information from the weather so i want to know the temperature and the conditions of the weather and so we'll give that information to our app and on a high level this is what we're about to do go to this website openweathermap.org and we're going to get our api key from here so all you need to do is just to sign in using your email and you'll be assigned a free api key so we're going to need this key later on now i've opened up a brand new flutter project and the first thing we'll do is to open up the terminal and let's add in some packages that we'll need so the first one is the http package then we need flutter pub add geolocator and also geocoding and finally let's add in the lottie package as well so this one's going to be for some nice animations so what we just did if you didn't know is if you go to your popspec.yaml this is the packages that we added in Let's start coding. Now I'm going to delete everything below the main function just to create this from scratch. So I'm going to have my material app. And for the home, let's go to our weather page, which we haven't created. So I'm just going to create this in a new folder called pages just to keep our code nice and clean. And then let's come back to our main dot dot just to import this and sweet what you should have is just a blank scaffold so this is where we'll begin now the very first thing is to create a weather model so if we just create a quick class here if we think about any particular weather let's say we want three things i want to know the city name i want to know the temperature and also maybe the main condition like if it's cloudy or sunny or whatever so we're going to require this when we create a weather And then we need a quick method here just to deal with the JSON file. So when we get our data from our API at OpenWeather, we're going to use this to sort of decode the information. For the city name in the field of the JSON is going to be name. And then the temperature, we want to convert this one to a double. And also the main condition is going to be in the weather field. And then main. So this is our basic weather model. One last thing we want to do is to create a weather service. So this one will help us fetch the data. So starting with the base URL. So this one, just make sure to copy exactly what I have. It's just the open weather map website pretty much. And then we need to have our API key. And then let's create a future method here called get weather. And let's accept a parameter called city names. Now this is where our HTTP package comes into play. At the top, just import it as HTTP. And then now we can access the URLs from the web. So for this one, I'm just gonna copy this in. So make sure to copy exactly how I have it. And basically what it is, is we're just going to the base URL, which is the open weather website. And then we're gonna to go to the specific city with our API key. So then we can just check this response. And so if we have a response, then we can go to our weather and then decode that information. And otherwise we have some error. Cool. Now we just need one more method here, which is another future for getting the current city. So I want the app to automatically know where the device is. So to do this, we have to ask for permission from the user. Let's check the permission. And also if it's denied, let's ask for permission. And then, so once we got the permission from the user, let's fetch the current location. And then we're gonna convert the location into a city name. Okay, sweet. So let's say the position. So we can use this to get our current position. Let's say the desired accuracy is high. 
And then we have to do a little bit of place mark work. And give it our positions, latitude and longitude. Cool. Now the information I really want is just the city's name. So you can say the locality. Cool. Now I just want to return the city, but if it's null, which is what the question mark question mark means, if it's null, just return a blank string. Okay, so we have these two methods that we can now come to our weather page and let's display it in our UI now. So the first thing is we need our API key and let's just have a quick method to fetch the weather and then maybe later we'll do the weather animations too. Let's create our weather service and in this parameter, this is where you have to give your specific API key, the one that's free on open weather. So I'll put that one in for my one a bit later on. And then let's create a weather object here. And let's just have a quick method here to fetch the weather. Again, the first thing I need to do is just to get the current city. And then we'll get the weather for this city. So for the city name, if we go to our weather service, we can access our get current city method. And then let's try to get the weather for that city. And if that's all good, then let's set the state and let's just update our weather object. And also if we have any errors, let's just print it to the console. Cool. So at the top, we need to give our API key. Let's just make sure not to forget that. So I'm going to paste my one in that we got from the start of the video. And let's just have an initial state. So when this app starts up, let's fetch the weather. Cool. Now let's display this using our UI. So I'm going to use a big column. And I just want to display the city name and then the temperature for now. So if we go to our weather object, let's just display the city name. And if it's null, then let's just say like loading city. And for the temperature, this should be a double, like a decimal number. So I'm just going to round it to the nearest integer. And I'm just going to add this little degree Celsius sign. Cool, so you can see it's there in the corner. I'm going to actually center this column and also the alignment I'm going to center as well. Sweet. So you can see right now it's just loading and there's no temperature. And this is because we have to do a little bit of extra work for the permission. So for the Android, if we go to the app source main, you can go to the Android manifest. And then at the top here, we just want to paste this bit of code to these two lines just to get the permission. So make sure to copy what I did. And that's for Android. For iOS, go to runner and go to this info.plist. And at the top here, we also want to just add in this NS location when in use usage description. So you just need to add that little thing in. Cool. So I'm just going to save everything. And just to just for good luck, I'm just going to kill the app and restart it. And you can see there's our app asking us for permission to get our location. Sweet. So just test this on your device. It should get your exact location and it's showing the temperature. Cool. Now just to make this a little bit more fun and aesthetic, I'm going to add in a animation. So if you go to Lottie files, you can get some nice easy animations here. So I'm just going to search for weather and it looks like this guy has some cool weather animations that are pretty simple. So Let's say we want the top four, like the sunny, a rainy, a cloudy, and a thunder one. So you can have more if you want, but I'll just show you how to do it with a few of these ones. So if you click on any of them that you want, you can click download and get that JSON file. And so here I've got my project and then also the animation I just downloaded. I'm just going to rename this to make it more easier to remember. So I downloaded the cloud animation. And let's create a new folder here called assets and just drag all of your animations in here. So go to the Lottie website and download whichever ones you want. I'm going to bring in the four that I said I'm going to use. So the cloud, rain, sunny and the thunder. And so in the actual project and just drag the folder in. Sweet. And then if we come back to our code, we have to tell it that we're going to bring in some assets. So go to your pubspec.yaml again. 
and we're going to scroll down to the assets and just uncomment this and specify where you placed it so we placed it in the assets folder sick now if we come back to our column in the middle let's just put in the animation so if you start typing Lottie you can import it and specify where we placed our asset so let's say assets cloud.json and you can see there's the animation we've got the sunny thunder and the rain awesome now the animations are coming up fine what we want is we want the animations to match the weather right so you can actually also get the condition the weather condition if I say main condition here, you can see right now it's clouds. All right, so depending on this main condition, let's display the appropriate animation. So let's come to the top and fill out this one last method called get weather animation. And we're just going to accept a main condition as a parameter. If the main condition is null, let's just return the sunny animation as a default. And so we're going to use a switch statement to deal with the different cases okay and so if we look at the main condition and we just reduce it down all to lower case so i looked at the main conditions that you can have from our open weather api and these are the possible ones we can get so we can get clouds mist smoke haze dust fog so for those ones i'm just going to simply return clouds for rain drizzle and you also get shower rain i'm just going to return the rainy one If we have thunderstorm, then we have our the thunder animation. And then lastly, if it's clear, then just return the sunny one. And by default, we'll return sunny. So I'm going to use just the four animations, but if you want, you can go back and try to find animations for all of the different conditions. But I think the four that we have can represent most of these. Also, now if we come back to our UI where we give the animation, instead of specifying just a specific animation, let's now get weather animation and we can give it the main condition that we have. So currently we can see it's clouds. So hopefully if I save this, we get the cloudy animation. Sweet. And that's it. That's the basic functionality on how to get the API data and create a very simple weather app. Yo, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how to read data from an API and display it back in our Flutter apps. I'm a big NBA fan, so I'm going to use a basketball API to teach you these important concepts in a really simple way. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function, I'm running my app which brings us to our home page which is just a blank scaffold so you should just have a blank app like this and the first thing to do is we need to import a http package so this is a very common package that allows us to make requests to the internet so let's copy this and go to your pubspec.yaml and we're going to paste this in and save it and close that once that's done and the other thing actually is we need to get an API. So I'm going to link this API below. It's a basketball API and it's free. So it should be good for us to use this to learn. <laughs> I love how there's the Michael Jordan crying meme. And if you scroll down, you can see we can make HTTP requests for different things. Like we can get the players and then it will display it as a JSON data like this. Now I'm going to go to the one that has teams. So once we make this request, we're going to get this sort of JSON data and I'll show you how to sort of decode it and put it into our Flutter apps. So if you come back to our code, let's create a method to get the teams. Now this one is going to be a feature because when we make a request, it's going to take some time to get the data from the internet, maybe like a few milliseconds or something. So the data will return sometime in the future. So that's why we're using a future method. And let's just create a variable called response and make sure to import the HTTP package at the top. And now we can say await HTTP and get the URL. So let's choose the HTTPS and here you can put the URL in. So come back to the API and let's just copy this, paste it in. Now, if you hover over, over this, you can actually see the way they want us to 
put in the URL. So you can see in the green, the example. So it looks like we don't put the HTTPS. You just put the domain and also separate the path, right? So I'm just gonna get rid of this part and also the www and let's grab the path and just separate it like this. So that's how they want us to structure it. And just to show you what we're actually getting from this, let's print the body of the response. So if I just run this and I open my debug console, after a little bit of time, you can see we get this. And so that is essentially the data that we get. But it looks like for us, it's just a big ass string. So we're gonna have to sort of decode this to make it readable, right? So let's create the JSON data and let's use the JSON decode. And what we can do with this now is do a quick for loop and say, okay, each team in the JSON data. And if you actually go back to the API, it looks like it's split up into two sections here. So you got the data and then the meta, but I'm interested in the data. So that's why I put that in here. And let's get each team. Now to do this, let's actually create a team model. So let's just create a quick class here. And I'm just gonna keep it real simple. So let's get the strings for the abbreviation and the city and create the constructors for these. So what I mean is, for example, like LAL for Los Angeles Lakers and the city is Los Angeles. Okay, so I'm just getting a couple of parameters from our API. Cool, so now that we've created this class, we can now come back to this for loop and create an individual team. And then let's add it to a list, which we should make right now. Let's create a list of teams. So in the for loop, after we create each team, let's add it to our list of teams. Sweet, now just to see if this actually worked, let's just print at the end of this, the length of our list of teams. So we should hopefully have 30 teams in the MBA. And there it is, 30, cool. So it looks like it's working. So now that we have all of the teams in our list, let's display it in our actual app. So come down to the scaffold and in the body, we're going to use something called a future builder. So remember how when we make a request, it takes a little bit of time to get the information, right? So that's why we're going to use a future builder. And the future that we're waiting for is the get teams method. So while that's loading, we can create a builder and consider two different scenarios. So the first one is if it's done loading or not. So is it done loading? If it is, then let's just show the team data. And then else, if it's still loading, then let's show a loading circular progress indicator. Okay, so if you look at this snapshot, it actually tells us a lot of good information. For example, like this connection state, we can check if it's done, you know, waiting, etc. So I'm just gonna go with done. And if it's done loading, then let's return a list view, which I've made many tutorials on, so check that out if you need. But in the list view, I wanna return a list tile. And in the title, let's just return the name of the team. Cycling through each index, let's print out the abbreviation. Cool, and if it's still loading, then I wanna return in the middle just a circular progress indicator. So let's see if this works. Cool, so you can see that it's got a little loading circle, so it's a good idea to let the user know that some information is actually getting loaded right now. And sick, looks like we got our 30 teams here. And it looks like we have a bit of an index error, and that's because we didn't specify the item count. So we just wanna display the length of our list of teams. Cool, and honestly, that's really it. That's how you read data from an API. And from here, it's just really the fun part, I would say. You know, we can s fill out the subtitle and the name of the city. And then you can just start decorating it, you know, the UI part of it. So I would say that's just really the fun part. But the main thing that I want you to take away from this video is how to read data from an API and convert it to a JSON data that we can actually read and display back onto our app. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how to implement push notifications for Android using Flutter and Firebase. So let's go to your Firebase console and let's create a new project here. 
I'm just gonna call it push nerdy tutorial and I'm just gonna disable the Google Analytics for now and let's just create a project. Awesome, so now that you've done that, let's come back to our code. And I've opened up a brand new Flutter project, so you should just get this demo homepage. And I've got my Android emulator here on the right. So before we do any of the code, let's make sure to connect our Flutter project to the Firebase. So in the terminal, I'm just gonna say Firebase login first, just to make sure that you've got the correct email address. Cool, and then let's say dot pub global activate, and we wanna activate the Flutterfire CLI. Sweet, and on Mac, it seems like we get this kind of issue, so you just need to copy this and paste it in. And the main thing we wanna do here is Flutterfire configure. So you can see it's gonna fetch the available projects, and hopefully we can see our list of projects, and that's the one that we just created. So push nerdy tutorial, and select the platform. So for this one, I'm just gonna do only Android. And I'm just gonna hit yes. And that should be done. So if you come back to the console and you refresh the page, it should say that you've connected your Android app. Awesome, so now let's come back to our code again and we want to add in a couple of packages. So Flutter, Pub, Add. And the first thing is Firebase Core. And we also need one more, which is the Firebase messaging. So if you don't know what we just did, if you go to your project and you go to your pubspec.yaml, this is where all of the packages and dependencies are going to be organized. And you can see that we've added the Firebase core and the Firebase messaging here. Awesome, now we can start coding. So I'm gonna delete everything below the main function just to create this from scratch. So I'm gonna create my app and let's create our material app. And at the beginning, let's go to our homepage, which we haven't created yet. So in the library, let's create a new folder called pages, just to keep everything nice and organized. And I'm gonna create our homepage.dart file here. So this one, let's just have a blank scaffold. And if I come back to the main.dart, you can now see we can import what we just created. Cool, and then if you save and run this, it should just be a blank scaffold, so just a blank white app. Now, just so we know what page we're looking at, maybe we should create a app bar and just say home page for the title. Now, when we're working with Firebase, we always need to go to our main function and just sort of initialize a couple of things. So we need to say widgets flutter binding ensure initialized. And we want this function to be an asynchronous function so that we can await and Firebase initialize app. And in the options, let's just say the current platform. So I'm just gonna kill the app and I'm just gonna restart it just to make sure everything is connected and it's fine. Now, I ran into this issue a lot when dealing with Android emulator and I figured out a solution for it. So if you go to Android and your build.gradle file, if you look at this number here, if you just change this to 14, then we should be able to run the emulator again. And honestly, I'm not entirely sure why, why we have to do that. So if anyone knows, just let me know below. But we should be able to run our app now. Awesome, so now that everything's done, I'm just gonna create a new folder called API. And let's create a file called firebaseapi.dart. And this is where we're going to handle all of the Firebase related services. Now, just before we code, I wanna just have a plan so that we know what we're doing. So I'm just gonna comment here. The first thing is I wanna create an instance of the Firebase messaging. Then we need to have a function to initialize the notifications. And we need a function to also handle the received messages. And then we might need another function just to further initialize some of the background settings. So I'll explain what all of these are doing. So just starting from the beginning, we need to grab an instance of the Firebase messaging. So let's just create that here.
and then we can create our first function. So this is going to be a future and I'm going to call it init notifications. So in here, the first thing we have to do is we need to request permission from the user. So this is going to prompt the user just to allow the notification. And then we need to fetch the Firebase cloud messaging token for this device. So when you install the app on your phone, each device is going to have its individual token. And let's print the token just so that we can see it. So normally you would send this to your server. And so let's start creating this. If you go to our instance, so the Firebase messaging, you can see we can request permission. And then let's grab the token as well. And then let's just do a quick print statement here so that we can see what this token actually is. Cool, so if I save this and I just run it, nothing's happening because we forgot to call this function we just created. So let's go to the main.dart file and when the app fires up, it's going to start off from this main function. And let's just also get our Firebase API and then let's initialize the notification. So that's the method that we just created. Awesome, so let's just save this and run it again. And you can see in the console that there's the token for this particular Android device. Right, so if you just grab this token and you go back to your console, if you go to this engage and you go to the messaging, we can create your first campaign and let's get the notification messages. And let's try to send our first notification. So I'm just gonna call this Flutter app and you can send a little message here. So I'm just gonna say, sending you a notification, bro. And you can click on this test and you can see it's asking for the token. So let's just paste our token in and then I'm gonna click test. So let's see if this works. So if you come back to your homepage, so I'm just going to exit the app and you can see there's the little not notification, it just got received. Sweet, there it is. So if I click into it, then we can go to our app. On a very basic level, this is how we send notifications using Firebase. So now I wanna show you when the user clicks into the notification, how we can go to a very specific page to display that information. So if you look at this next function that we're about to create, the function to handle received messages, that's what we're going to do. So what we're gonna do first is in the pages, let's just create one more page. And I'm just gonna call it notification page. And this will just be a very basic scaffold with an app bar. And since we're dealing with a few different pages, we're going to need to set up some navigation. So what I'm gonna do is let's define some routes and I'm going to call this notification screen. And one useful thing is going to be a navigator key. So if you just give this to your material app, this will help us navigate between different screens very easily. Let's come back to our firebase.api and fill out that function. So I'm just gonna call this handle message and as a parameter, we're going to have the message for the notification. Now, if the message is null, then let's just not do anything. But if the notification has a message, then let's go to that specific page when the user taps on the notification. So, and you can see here that navigator key that we just created earlier. So let's just hit enter to import it. And you can go to this current state. And usually when we navigate, we can use this push named to go to the route that we defined in the main.dart file. And what's really useful here is you can see that we can pass through an argument. So what that means is like pass through our message. Cool. And then the last function to fill out here is just some ways to handle the background settings. So handle notification if the app was terminated and now opened. And also we want to attach event listeners for when a notification opens the app. So I'll explain what this all means, but starting with the first situation, which is when the app is terminated and now opened, if you go to the instance, then we can get the initial message and then let's just handle the message. So that's the function we just created. And we can also say on message open app, we can listen for any of these messages and pass through that same function. 
So if you just save that and you come back to our notification page in this build method, let's get the message and let's try to display it on the screen. So I'm just gonna call it final message. You get the modal route and get the argument for the notification. And so once we have this message, then we can just say, all right, give me that notifications title. And give me the body. And also just give me the data as well. So let me show you what we just coded up. So we have this initialized push notifications. And so let's just make sure to call this method at the very beginning. And now if I restart this, uh, looks like we have another token because we installed it again. So I'm just gonna grab this and in our console, maybe let's switch up the message and do another test. So if I just add that token in again and I hit test, then you can see there is the notification. And now hopefully if I click into this, we just navigate to the notification page and then we can actually display the contents of that notification in our app. Cool, so we just did that with some test messages. So if that's all working, if you scroll down, you can hit next. And then we have to select the app and there's our Android app that we connected. Hit next and then you can schedule notifications. So you can do it now or you can schedule it for a particular date and time. You can see we can also do recurring notifications. But I'm just gonna hit now. Let's go to next and review and let's publish. And so this is how you create a new campaign for notifications using Firebase. So hopefully that was simple and clear to understand. If you have any questions about any of the code, just comment below and I'll try to come around and help. But this is how easy it is to set up push notifications for your Android device using Flutter and Firebase. Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how to implement push notifications for iOS using Flutter and OneSignal. So all the instructions that we need is actually on the OneSignal documentation. So I'll link that below. But let's go through this together and I'll show you how to set it up. Step one is to have a OneSignal account. And let's click new app. I'm just gonna call it push nerdy tutorial. And we're gonna set up both Google and iOS. So firstly, I'm just gonna set up the Google one real quick. You can see we need to upload this service account JSON. So if you go to your Firebase projects, let's create a new project here called push nerdy tutorial. You can call it whatever you want. And let's just create this. Now, if you go to your project settings and you go to your service accounts, just click on this generate new private key and then it will download something. And if you come back to one signal, then we can upload what we just downloaded. Let's hit save and continue. And then now let's click on Flutter. And you can see this is the important information, your app ID. So we're gonna use this later on. Now click done. And let's go back to the documentation. Cool, now if I go to the iOS requirements, now the main thing here is we need to get a P8 authentication token or a P12 push notification certificate. Now I'm just gonna click on the P12 one and let's just follow these instructions. Now it's important to note when it comes to iOS, you have to have a paid Apple developer account. And if you intend on publishing your app to the App Store at all, then you are going to need this paid developer Apple account anyway. So that's the main requirement that you'll need. So if you log on to your Apple developer account, let's go to identifiers and we're going to register an app ID. And let's scroll down and get the push notifications. And for this, we need to know what the bundle ID for our app is. So if I just come over here, I created a new Flutter project. And if you go to Xcode and you open up in this Flutter project and you go to iOS, then let's open the runner.com xcode workspace file and this is where you should be able to see your bundle id 
So each app has its own bundle identifier. And so when you publish your app, you're going to need to specify your unique bundle ID. So I'm just going to use my one. So that's going to be my bundle ID. And let's just give it a short description. Now the next step is to generate a push certificate. So there's a method one, which you can do automatically, but I'm actually going to do method two, which is to create a certificate request manually. So if you go to your keychain and you go to this top left corner and you go to your certificate assistant, we can request a certificate from a certificate authority. And let's put in your email address. And I'm actually going to save to the disk. Let's hit continue. And I'm just going to save it to the desktop. Uh, looks like I had one earlier, so I'm just going to replace it. And make sure in your identifier, we checked off this push notification. Cool. So now let's go to our certificates and create a new certificate. And we want this one, Apple Push Notification Service, the sandbox and production. Let's hit continue. And look for the app that we just created. And we're going to upload our signing request certificate. And that was on my desktop. So just upload that one. And let's hit download. Sweet, now I'm just going to move what I downloaded into my desktop. There it is. And if you just double click it, and we want to open this using the keychain access. So hopefully you have it there. There's my one. So if you just right click this, let's export. And I'm just going to save it to my desktop. And you can create a new password for this one. And it also wants my permission. So this is just going to be the password for my computer. Cool, so now we need to upload this push certificate to OneSignal. So if we come back to OneSignal, we activated the Google, but let's activate the iOS one as well. And you can see here the two different authentication types. We had the P12 certificate and just upload that one. Cool, and enter your password that you just created. Sweet, and let's click Flutter. And the setting up is done for one signal. Great. Now what we need to do is if I just come back to the documentation. So we did step one here with all the requirements for iOS and Android. Now let's go to our pub spec YAML and we're going to add this dependency in for one signal. So go back to our project and go to your pub spec .yaml and let's add in this dependency package and save it. And if that's all done properly in your main.dart file, you should be able to import one signal. There it is. Awesome. Now, when it comes to iOS, we still need to have a few more steps to enable the notifications. So let's open Xcode again. And if you go to the top, you can see in the file, let's go new, target. And let's look for push notification. Oh, it's called notification service extension. Now this product name, it has to be exactly this one, one signal notification service extension. For this, we want to hit cancel. And the thing you need to check here is just ensure, as it says here, Ensure the deployment target is set to the same value as your main application target. So what that means is if you go to the deployment information, you can see currently I've got it at set at 16. Now I'm just going to go a bit lower than that. I'm just going to choose 11. And if I click on my runner, you can see it's 11. So just make sure that everything is set to the same deployment target. Cool, let's close the Xcode project and in the iOS directory, open the pod file and we want to add this little snippet of code. So copy this. 
and go to iOS, go to your pod file, and just at the end here, let's just add this bit of code. And at the top, we want to uncomment this line. So I'm going to target the iOS 11 and let's save it. And then if you open up your terminal, let's change our directory to the iOS folder. So we're in this folder now and hit pod install. Sweet, installation complete. And then the next step is we want to go to this one signal notification service extension and this particular file. So we want to copy this entire file here. And you can see on the left hand side, we want this one, the one with the M. And so we're going to replace this entire file with this new code. Next, enable background modes and check remote notification. So if you go to your runner, you can see in the signing and capabilities, you can hit this plus button to add a new capability. So we want the push notification. And one more capability is the background mode. And let's check the remote notifications. Sweet, now I'm just gonna skip step five for now because that's just Android. Let's go to step six, initialize the one signal SDK. So this one we're going to put in our main.dart file. So again, just copy this. Let's put it in our main.dart file. And this string here is where we want to place our app ID that we got from the beginning. So if you come back to one signal, you can get that easily in your keys and IDs. And there it is. So just copy your app ID and we want to place that into this string. Now there's some more cool things you can do with notifications, but just to make sure it works for us, I'm going to go to step seven. And now we can run our app and we can send ourselves our first notification. Now, one important thing to note, as you can see, it says here, run your app on a physical device to make sure it builds correctly. It doesn't actually work on iOS simulators. It's only gonna work on physical devices. So I'm gonna plug my real iPhone onto this computer and I'm gonna run this Flutter project for my actual device. So that's the iPhone 13 Pro. And just while that's running, if you come back to one signal, you can click on this messages tab and let's create a new message. So for the title, I'm just gonna call it Flutter App. And let's just give it a little message. So let's just say like, sending you a notification, please work. And if you just scroll down, we can now review and send. So on your physical device, you should see this little pop-up dialog to get your permission to send you notifications. So let's hit allow. And I'm going to close the app. And if you come back to one signal, let's hit send message. And you can see there's our notification working. And you can see if you scroll down in your notification center, you should be able to see our first Flutter notification. And that's it. That's how easy it is to implement push notifications. iOS does have a little bit more things that you need to set up compared to Android, but OneSignal makes this process really easy. So I'm a big fan of OneSignal. They make my life so much easier. Hey, what up? Welcome back to another quick Flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm going to show you how we can code our apps in such a way that it's responsive to different screen sizes. So of course, we want to make our apps work on mobile, but as we adjust the screen size, I'll show you how you can make it responsive to like a tablet version. And then if it's stretched out long enough, then also a desktop version as well. So this is what makes Flutter so great at being a cross-platform framework. And if you're a Flutter developer, then you're gonna know this stuff. I'll also show you a little bonus tip when it comes to the menu. If you click it, you can open the drawer like usual, but if we're in the desktop version, we're gonna have enough space anyway. So let's open the drawer up by default. So I'll show you how you can create this responsive design in a really simple way. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page, in my main function, I am running my app 
which returns just a blank scaffold. So it should just be a white blank app like this. And inside this scaffold, this is where you would usually start building out the UI for your app. But before we do that, I want to make this app responsive, meaning I want it to work on mobile devices, but also tablet devices as well as desktop devices. So in other words, I want to make this app functional across all different screen sizes. And so we're going to have to structure our code in a way that our app becomes nice and responsive to that. And by the way, I upgraded my Flutter to Flutter 3 recently, and it looks like we have this Linux and Mac OS capability. I think we had Windows maybe in the last update, um, definitely had web before. And so I'm running this app on a Mac window, which I've actually been loving lately, developing my apps using this window. Because sometimes when I use the web and like a Chrome browser, it's kind of laggy sometimes and it doesn't feel as clean. But this Mac window has been giving me no trouble. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to go to the library and let's create a new folder called responsive. And so we'll put all the responsive design related files in here. So let's create a new file called responsive layout. And let's just import our material dot dot and let's create a state list widget called responsive layout. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to create some widgets that we want to pass through. So for example, let's call it a mobile scaffold, a tablet scaffold, and a desktop scaffold. So these are the three different sizes that we're going to sort of adjust for. And let's create the constructors for this. And let's make sure to require these guys. Cool. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to return something called a layout builder. And what this one does is it helps us keep track of the constraints for this particular window. So you can see like this one here. What you can do is say, do like an if statement. And you can say if constraints dot, and you can see there's a lot of options here. And the one I want to use is max width. And so we can say, all right, if your width for the current window, because it's like it keeps changing, right? If it's less than say 500 pixels, then let's return the mobile scaffold. Else if constraints and the max width is less than say 1000 or maybe 1100, then let's return a tablet scaffold. And if nothing else, then let's return a desktop scaffold. So what we're doing here is we're basically just checking what the current width of our window is going to be. And so these numbers 500 and 1100 are arbitrary numbers that we can adjust and um, change up later on if we need. But just from my experience, these numbers seem to be working pretty well for me. But like I said, you can fine tune these numbers as necessary. And so what we just did here is if you go back to the main.dart file, instead of just returning a blank scaffold, I'm going to return a responsive layout, which is what we just created. And you can see we have to fill out these three different scaffolds. Okay, so with these, let's come to our files. And in here, I'm just going to create three new files here. So let's call it mobile scaffold, tablet scaffold. and desktop scaffold. And so in each of these, I'm just gonna create a quick scaffold. 
So let's create a stateful widget called mobile scaffold and we're going to return a scaffold and just for us to differentiate it let's say let's give it a background color so for the mobile one just for us to differentiate let's give it a green and let's do the same thing for the tablet but this one will change the blue and finally the desktop scaffold and this one will change to pink so coming back to our main.dart file let's bring all of this together so in the mobile scaffold let's give it the mobile scaffold that we created And it requires us to fill out the tablet scaffold, which we just created as well. And finally, the desktop scaffold. Cool. And we don't need this const anymore. But we can put the const on these ones. Cool. So if I save this, right? It's going to be green at the beginning. And after we reach like a certain width, which in our case it was, what was the number? 500. So there's like 500 pixels. And then if you go above 500, it's going to be a tablet. Okay, which we made it blue. And then once you get to 1100, it's going to become pink. And so this will be our desktop. Okay, so desktop, tablet, and then mobile. And like I said, these numbers are arbitrary numbers that you can change up. But in my experience, I think 500 and 1100 seem to be working pretty well. I think like most iPhone sizes in the width, it's roughly 400. So um, yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. Cool. So this is a nice initial setup for us to do. And just to sum up again, in my main function, we're returning, the very first thing we're returning is this responsive layout. And this responsive layout is just checking the constraints of our current window, and we're just checking the width, right? If it's less than 500, then return the mobile. Otherwise, if it's less than this number, return the uh, tablet. And the biggest one, we're gonna return the desktop scaffold. Okay, and now, in terms of the UI, we can just go to the individual scaffolds that we created to fill out how we want the app to look right so let's start with the mobile scaffold now i actually don't want this to be green let's make it like a light gray and now we can start filling this out like the app bar and the app bar i want to make it like a dark gray and let's create a drawer as well which should give us this little menu up here cool and here's the drawer that we can fill out which we can do real quick by the way i've actually made a separate tutorial covering drawers by itself so check that out if you need but just real quick, I'm just gonna create a column. And at the top, let's have a drawer header. And here you can put like an icon, like your logo or something. So I'm just gonna put a random icon here. Like this guy. And then below that, we can just start doing some list tiles. So, the leading icon let's do home and for the title let's say dashboard like this 
And maybe we'll just create a few more. All right, cool. So for example, right in our mobile scaffold, let's say we have just this blank app. We have this dark app bar, and we got this, uh, and we got this dashboard as well. Now, if I drag this out, you can see it's just going to go to blue, right? But I still want the other scaffolds to have a menu bar like this. And so, if you're going to reuse code uh, multiple times, it's a good idea to create a separate file called constants. Constants meaning values that are not going to change. So what do I mean by this? Well, we could say, like, I'm going to reuse this app bar. Right, so we can say var, like variable, my app bar is equal to this. Also, var my drawer is equal to this. And you can also say like something like my fault background is equal to this color. Right, so now that you have all the repeating values in this constants file, we can now simplify our code a bit. So instead of having to specify it each time, we can just say my app bar. This one can be my default background. This one can be my drawer. Okay, so that cleans up a lot. And then we can go to the tablet scaffold. And for the background color, we can just say my default background color. And for the app bar, let's just do the same app bar and the drawer. We're going to do my drawer. Cool. So currently we're in the mobile version. And even if we go to the tablet version, it's still essentially the same app that has this menu drawer. Now, one little, I guess, bonus I'll show you how to do is once you get to the desktop version, since we have a lot of space, I'll get this drawer to just show up and without having to press this button. So let's actually do that now. So in the desktop scaffold now, the background color is just the default background and the app bar is still my app bar. And now instead of specifying the drawer like this, which is going to give us this little menu icon, let's just start filling it out in the body. And I'm going to say in the row, let's have the open drawer. And then we'll have the rest of the body after that. So let's say my drawer. And let's see what this looks like. So currently we're in mobile version. And so we can open the drawer. Same thing as a tablet version. But if we get to this, like a desktop, you can see, I just want to have the menu open by default without having to click on the button. Since if you're in a desktop view, you're going to have a lot of space, right? So it'll open up the menu drawer like this. And if you go to tablet version, then it'll just hide itself. Okay, so if you look at a lot of dashboards, they have this side menu showing up, right? So that's how you get that one. Cool, so, so far so good. Now let's just close the desktop and the scaffold again just for now. And let's just focus on the mobile scaffold, but the body of the mobile scaffold. So I'm going to create a overall column. And let's create a bit of a plan. So for this layout, I want to have, say, like four boxes on the top. And then um, let's have like tiles below it. So I'm going to have a grid view, but I'm going to use a grid view builder. Again, if you need more understanding about grid views, I made a separate tutorial covering just grid views and the builder. So please check that out if you want more in depth about it. 
but I can just show you real quick how to make it. So the grid delegate. So this sliver grid delegate with fixed cross axis count is what I'm going to use. And this thing basically, if you look at this cross axis count, you can specify like how many you want in each row of this grid. So for this one, in the mobile version, I kind of want four boxes that is two by two. So let's say I want two in each row. And in the item builder, we want to have We want to return, let's say, a container and let's give it a color blue. And also, we can specify the item count. Let's just say I want to create four boxes. Now, I think we should have some error because, yep, yeah, because this is a very common error the render box not being laid out. So that's because this grid view needs a specified constraint. So I'm going to wrap it in a sized box and for the width I'm just going to say double dot infinity. And also an aspect ratio of 1. Cool, so here it is. Now we actually can't see what's going on because this container is all stuck together. So let's just add a padding to this container and we should be able to see what's going on. So yeah, we created four boxes, two in each row, and yeah, it's just a blue container. So if you actually drag this window a bit smaller, it's gonna be proportioned nicely. And that's what this aspect ratio is doing. So in responsive design, this widget comes in particularly handy because you don't wanna, um, you don't wanna use fixed values like fixed width and height all the time especially when your screen size keeps changing so what this aspect ratio of one is saying if you hover over this it's a ratio of the width to the height so a ratio of one means it's a square right like the width to the height is a ratio of one so that's what i did here and at this point i want to encapsulate a bit of my code so that we can reuse it namely this little container that we just created. I'm gonna create a new file called utilities. So just util. And in this file, oh sorry, in this folder, I like to create uh, the little different widgets that we have in our app that we can reuse. So this one I'm gonna call my box. So we'll just call it my box and we're going to return the little container that we just created. So this is really useful to encapsulate because then we can just return my box. And just while we're here, I'm going to create another file called my tile. And so it's going to be very similar to the box. But just so that we can see the difference, let's just switch up the color again. But for this one, I want to actually specify a certain height, let's say like 80. Cool, so coming back to our mobile scaffold, we have a grid. And under this, let's just fill up the rest of the space with an expanded widget. And I'm going to use a list view builder this time. So very similar to a grid view, except for this is just a list. Cool, and let's just say I want to return like five of these. Let's see what this looks like. Cool, so this should just be a basic layout for a particular app, right? You've got some grids up here and then some um, lists down here as well. So as this gets longer, let's make these four objects into like a singular four line. Okay, so basically I just want to stretch out this UI. So right now, again, if I just stretch it out, 
it's just going to go to the tablet body, right? Right, so what I'm going to do is let's just copy this column and go to the tablet scaffold and return it here as well. Let's just import our little files. Now without changing anything, our mobile scaffold and tablet scaffold have the same exact code. So let's just see what happens if we drag this out. If I go to like tablet mode, you can see that it's still got the same aspect ratio. And so this is not really a good experience for the user, right? Everything's just zooming in. Okay, so at this point, I want to flatten these out so that we have four in a single row. So that's an easy fix. Remember in our cross axis count, let's change this to four in each row. And if I save this, so currently we are in the mobile version. If I stretch this out, then you can see it just becomes a flat row, right? And at this point, because I know that this is going to be a four box row, in the aspect ratio, the ratio of width to height is going to be four. So if I just save this, you can have this nice, responsive layout like this. So hopefully that made sense. Just let me know if you have any issues at all with any of this understanding. I'm happy to come into the comments and help you out. But this is just the general idea on how to make your app responsive. So when the user is in like a mobile version, it's a certain view. And as we drag out, we can change the layout such that it's nice and responsive. Cool. And then finally, let's go to the desktop as well. And desktop, we already got the menu bar coming out. Again, let's grab this column. And let's go to the desktop scaffold. And with this one, it's a row initially because we wanted to have this dashboard showing up and so in the middle we'll display what the other two scaffolds had but as we stretch out even further i want to have a third column with some more widgets like more information okay so currently we have the drawer on the very left and then for now let's just expand the rest of the space and give it that column that we had in the other two scaffolds. So again, I'm just gonna copy this, copy this. And so let's just save this and see how this looks. So we're at mobile now, and then tablet. And then once we get to desktop, this drags out. But you can see this column is still the same as your tablet, right? which is fine, but I want to get to a point where once I stretch even further, I want to have a new column so that maybe you can have like a calendar, you know, you can have like a clock there or there's a lot of different widgets you could put there if this was a dashboard. So that's what I want to do. So how do we do this? So in this overall row, we got the drawer first and then we're going to expand the rest of the space with this column. And then below that, let's expand another one. And let's just create a random column. Cool. So you can see as I drag this out, we're in tablet. And then let's go to desktop. And we have this third column showing up, right? Now, one great thing about expanded widgets is you can proportion things out using this flex property. So for example, right, let's say I want this first column to be a flex of two, meaning I want it to be two times as big as everything else. So right now you can see like this column size and that column size in terms of the width, they're the same. But if I put a flex of two on this green section, 
you can see now it's like two to one. Okay, so you can have this nice gradual effect so it's not too jarring for the user. So this is a simple approach in how to make your app responsive. Just to sort of summarize again, in my main function, the very first thing I'm returning is this responsive layout widget, which determines if we should display a mobile or tablet or desktop version, right? So again, I put the responsive related things in this responsive folder. And this file is, I would say, the most important file in this whole tutorial, right? So in this, we need to give it our mobile scaffold, our tablet scaffold, and our desktop scaffold that we can decorate up. And we're going to use this layout builder to see what the constraints are for our current window. And just take a look at the width and say, okay, if you're less than 500 pixels, then return a mobile. If it's less than 1100 pixels, then return the tablet. And then finally, if it's above all that, then return your desktop. And then in your individual files, your mobile, tablet, and desktop scaffold, this is where you can just fill out the UI sort of as you would normally. And one sort of MVP widget that was very helpful in making our design very responsive is aspect ratio. So you can see I barely used any fixed height or width in, in this code. Sometimes you're going to have to make some certain things a fixed height or width. But for the most part, in a responsive design, because your screen keeps changing sizes, I'm just going to say, all right, just fill up however much space you have. And instead, I'm just going to use things like aspect ratios to, to control how I want these widgets to look. And so aspect ratio and expanded widgets to fill up the rest of the space. These were some pretty handy widgets for us to use to make our design responsive. Hopefully that made sense. Like I said, if you have any questions on any of this just let me know below and i'll come around and try to help but once you got the responsive layout like this done from here i would say this is the fun part in terms of like building out the little ui right and also different people have different uh, ui needs like you might be making a finance dashboard um, i was making a habit tracker dashboard and some people want to make like an education dashboard so obviously it depends on your app right but those specifics building like the UIs and stuff. I think we've had a lot of practice on them and I would say that's the fun part. You can just fill out the individual widgets. But the overall layout of all this, hopefully you understood how to make this responsive design. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another quick flutter tutorial. In this one, I'm gonna show you how to code up a minimal music player app. So we can browse through a playlist of songs and perform the basic functionalities like playing, pause, resume, and a seek bar to control where in the song you are. For the theme and design, let's code it up in both light and dark mode with a touch of neomorphism. So just before we start, let's have a little bit of a visual plan about what we're about to code up. So we're just going to have two pages. One is for the playlist to display all the songs. And then we can click on a song to go to the song page and have the playback controls. And then we're going to have the audio player as a provider to sort of provide all of the different data that we need. So for the first page, it's just going to provide a list of songs. And then when we go to the song page, it's going to provide what the current song that we're playing and the playback controls as well. And also we are going to have actually one more page for the settings page where we can just control the dark mode and light mode. So I've ended up a brand new Flutter project and just to keep everyone on the same page in my main function, I'm running my app which brings us to this home page. And I've got this in a separate folder called pages just to keep it organized. And this should just be a blank scaffold. So you should just have a white blank app like this. Now let's just start off with the theme. So I'm going to create a new folder called theme and let's start off with the light mode. And so you can choose your own colors, but you can just also copy my ones. 
So if you create a theme data here, you can specify these different colors. So background, primary, secondary, and I also like to specify the inverse primary. So these are all just different shades of gray, which you can play around with but let's create one for the dark mode as well. And make these colors a bit darker. So we can always fine tune these colors later on. So one thing we're going to do is in the main file, you can see in the material app, we can specify this theme. So if I give it light mode and nothing changed, we should actually come to the home page and let's actually give it a background color. So we can say theme dot of context, go to the color scheme and you can see there's all the options for what we specified before. So for this, let's just give it the background color. And if I save this, you can see it changed to a little bit of a light gray. So if I change this to dark mode, then it will be much darker. We want to switch between these two modes. So to do that, let's create a theme provider. Open up your terminal and let's add in this package. So flutter pub add provider for some simple state management. And let's fill out this class. So class theme provider extend, extends change notifier. So initially let's make it light mode. And let's create a getter and also a boolean just to see if it's dark mode or not. So this here will just check if the current theme is equal to the dark mode and return true or false. And then we also need a setter to set the theme. And this notify listeners is to update the UI. And then lastly, we just need a toggle theme method. So if the current theme is the light mode, then change to dark mode and vice versa. Sweet. So if you come back to the main.dart file, when you run this app, we need to wrap this in a change notifier provider and give it our theme provider. And so now we can say instead of just light mode or dark mode, we can go to our provider and get the theme data. Cool, so just save it and run it again and everything should be working fine. Now we're going to need a way to trigger this toggle theme method to change to dark mode. So let's go to our home page and I'm just going to create an app bar real quick. And if you just create a blank drawer, you can see there's a menu icon in the, in the top left. So just click it and you can open this blank drawer. We're going to code this up. Now, just to keep our code nice and organized, I'm going to create this in a separate folder called components. So this is where I just like to put the different widgets. For this drawer, let's give it our background color. And just to see the changes that we're making, if I come back to the home page, we can type my drawer and you can see there it is. So let's just import. And so in this drawer, I'm just going to create a column. And so let's just have a basic layout. So let's have a logo at the top. So for the logo, I'm just going to use a music note icon here. And for these tiles, let's use a list tile. Maybe we could use a bit of padding. Cool. And let's do the same thing for settings.
Awesome, that's looking pretty good. Now, when I click on this home tile on tap, we just want to pop the box. So we're already at the home page. So if I click this, I just want to pop the drawer. Now, when it comes to the settings, I want to pop the drawer, but I also want to navigate to the, set to the settings page. So we haven't created this settings page yet, so let's just do that real quick. And let's come back over here and import what we just created. And there we go, we can now navigate to the settings page. So let's fill this out. In the body, I'm just going to create a basic container and let's just decorate it up a little bit. And main thing here is the row. I want to have a switch. And I'm going to use a Cupertino switch, which is the Apple style one. So if I just show you real quick, if I say false for the value and save it, you can see there's the button. And if I change it to true, you can see the switch becomes green. So this one is gonna be true or false. So what we're gonna do is go to our theme provider. And you can see is dark mode. And for the unchanged, go to the provider and we can go toggle theme. And so if I save this, you can toggle between the two. Sweet, and let's just clean this up and decorate this to our liking. Add some padding and margin, and of course our border radius needs to be curved. By the way, so you see how we're in dark mode. Now you can see the different shades of gray that it currently is. If you don't like it, you can go to this dark mode file and control and change up the colors to your liking. You can even hover over this and it goes exactly what you want. So let's make this darker. Let's make the secondary one darker for the tile. And yeah, I think that's much better. So just play around with it. Okay, sweet. So now it's time for our actual music and our audio player. So what we need here is I'm gonna create a new folder called models, and we're gonna start off with a song. So if you think about a song, I'm gonna need four things. I wanna know the song name. I wanna know the artist name, the image path, for the artwork and also the audio path. And let's create another model here called playlist provider. And so firstly, we're going to have a playlist of songs and you can see if I import the song, what we just created, we can create our first song. So, now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come over here to my desktop and I've got this assets folder and I have a folder called audio and I just have an mp3 file here. So you can grab any mp3 file and place it into a folder like this. And I've also got this image folder for the album artwork. So just get any kind of square image. So I'm going to go to my project and just drag this assets folder in. And then if I come back to my code, we have to tell it in our popspec.yaml that we are importing assets. So if you scroll down, you can see this assets that you have to uncomment. And so we're going to import two things. So assets audio and assets images. Cool, so just as an example, let's create three songs here. And I'm just gonna title this up to be whatever.
Okay, sweet. So I have these three songs. The next thing we need to know is the current song that's playing, but the index of it. So if I say like zero, that's the first song here. If I say one, that's this song. Two is that song. So with this current song index, we're going to control which song we're playing. And so I'm just going to put some nice comments here. I need a section for getters and then setters. So let's get a way to return the playlist and also the current song index. Sweet, so let's try to come back to our homepage and display the playlist of songs in a list. So to do that, we are going to use a consumer widget to consume this data. And we're going to return a list view builder. And whoops, since we have a new provider, we should come back to our main.dart file and add in this new provider. So we've currently only got the theme provider. So what you can do here is say multi provider and just specify both the theme as well as the playlist provider. Sweet, so if I come back down here, so what I'm gonna do here is before we display this list view, Let's firstly get the playlist. And then now we can say in the item count, we're going to say playlist.length. And then we're going to get the individual song by going through all of the indexes for however long this playlist is. And then we can now give it to our list tile UI. So let's just start off with our song name. And you can see if you save it, there it is. And then we can go to the subtitle to give it the artist name. And then we can start decorating this up. Even the leading, we can give it the image. Cool. And then finally, the on tap. So when we tap on one of these tiles, we want to go to the song. So let's just create that at the top real quick. I'm going to start off by getting the playlist provider. And just initialize it. And then here's our method for going to a particular song. So with a given song index. So firstly, let's update the current song index in our provider, and then we're going to navigate to the song page. And whoops, we forgot to create the setter method. So let's just do that real quick. So we just want to set the new current index. So if I come back here, we can give it the new song index and then we're going to navigate to our song page, which we haven't created. So let's just create that real quick. Cool, so if I save this and I click on one of these tiles, nice, we can go to a song page. So now what we need to do is to just decorate up this song page. So the kind of design aesthetic I want to go for is a new morphism style. So I'm just going to create a new component called new box, just standing for new morphic box. And let's just say I want to know a child when I create this. And so let me show you how to do this. So in the containers decoration, the color is going to be the same as the background color. And the trick here is to just work with a couple shadows. So I'm just gonna have a dark shadow on the bottom right and a lighter shadow on the top left. So 
We can give it a slightly darker color here. Give it a bit of a blur and we're going to offset this. So what this means is instead of just being right in the middle, we're going to change the position of this shadow a little bit. So this will, so 4, 4 will make it on the bottom right. Let's copy this, change this to white and make this negative negative. Should be top left. So just to show you what we just created in our song page in the body, let's just create in the middle a new box and maybe just give it an icon. And so you can see there it is. Now I think we should add some padding. And the corners are pretty sharp, so let's curve the corners. And oh, and the final thing is the scaffold should have a background color. So the background and the foreground of this is actually the same, and it's the shadows that are creating this 3D effect. And I think this looks pretty cool. Sweet, so now that we have a new morphic box, we can start to decorate up our song page. So let's have a big column. And I'm going to have a custom app bar. And then the album artwork, the song duration progress, and then the playback controls. So just before we fill this out, let's grab this entire scaffold and wrap it in a consumer widget just to consume the playlist provider data. So like I said, I want to create my own custom app bar. So let's get rid of this guy. And let's start off with a row for a back button, maybe like a title and then a menu button. Sweet, there it is. So it's scrunched up in the corner. So let's actually wrap this in a safe area widget, which makes us avoid the notches and stuff like that. And then let's also space between to spread it out. And let's add some padding as well. Cool, and then below that, let's use one of our new morphic boxes. And for the child, let's give it the image asset. And just to try this out, right? I wanna to go to one of my images. And there it is. And you can see it's got a nice effect around it. And we can say number two, number three. Cool, so all of our images are currently working. And the image itself is quite sharp. So I'm gonna wrap this in a clip R rec to change the border radius. Now below the image, we want to have the song and artist name. And also maybe like a heart icon for the like and not like. Sweet, and then below that, we are in need of a progress bar for the duration. So firstly, in a row, I want to know the start time. And then we're gonna have a couple icons. So the shuffle and the repeat, and also the end time at the end. So for now, I'm just gonna put in some blank values just to get the UI down first. Now let's space this evenly or space between. Yep, 
And then now below this, we need a slider. So you can see it's like this little progress bar thing. And so we can specify the min and the max. And let's say the value is 50. And I'm going to change up this active color to be green. And this is looking pretty good. Now, I actually think we should take this slider out of this padding. Cool. And just for this UI, if it's a, since it's a music player, I actually don't want that big ass circle as the thumb. So you can wrap this in a slider theme and then get this thumb and then make it zero. Sweet, I think that looks better. Cool, and then the last thing we need is just a playback control. So let's have another big row, and then we're gonna have a skip previous, a play pause button, and then a skip forward. So let's just try one of these out. So if I get another new morphic box and go to the previous icon, And I'm just going to expand this to fill up the entire space. And also wrap it in a gesture detector so that we can tap on this. So let's copy this and create a few more. Now for the middle one, I actually want to change up the flex to be two, which means it should be double the size. And then we can just use some size boxes in between just to create some gaps. Cool, and then once you're done, if you come to the very overall column here, I'm just going to main axis alignment to the center, which I think looks the best. Sweet. Now, oh, we actually had this back button, which, which we didn't specify the functionality. So let's say, let's just pop it. Go back to the previous. Okay, it's looking pretty good. Now, one thing is if I go to another song, it should reflect these changes, but currently we have it all fixed. And hard coded in. So you can see like this thing is hard coded in. So what we're going to do is grab this whole thing and then open up these curly braces and we're going to return it anyway. But just before we return the scaffold, we're going to get the playlist and then we're going to get the current song. So let's firstly get the playlist and then we're going to get the current song. And then we can go to this image asset and just go to the current songs, album, art, image path. And same thing for the text, right? Instead of hard coding this value, we can say current song and then the song name. And then the current song and then the artist name. Sweet, and I think that should be good. If I just save this, we can now go to the appropriate ones. Okay, now the last thing we need to do is we need to code up the audio player. So open up your terminal and we're going to add this package in flutter pub add audio players. This is the most popular one in flutter. So we're going to go with this. And so just have a bit of a plan about what we're going to do is we're going to have an audio player and we're going to control the durations. So like how long it is and stuff like that. 
we're going to have a constructor and initially we're not playing and then these are the main playback controls so play the song pause the song resume and then this will be helpful as well this pause and this pause or resume which i'll explain later and then also the other main thing is seek to a specific position in the current song so that we can use our thumb to drag around to different positions and then just a couple more play next song play previous song listen to the durations and then we can finally dispose of this audio player so looks like a lot we need to get through but each of these is quite simple so let's just start this off let's get our audio player and for the duration I need to know two I want to know two different durations so the current duration and the total duration for the song so when we create this constructor so when we create this playlist provider we want to just automatically start listening to the duration for any changes So we're going to listen for the total duration, listen for the current duration, and then we can also listen for when the song is completed. And then let's come back to the beginning. So let's just create a quick Boolean and say, is playing false at the beginning? And a quick method to play a song. So firstly, I need to know what path it is. So let's go to the current songs audio path. And if it was playing something already, just stop it. And then we can play this asset. Now pause is also similar, just pause it and just change up the Boolean and the notify listeners. We're going to resume. Now we have both of these pause and resumes which work individually, but if we are actually in the UI, we are going to click on this button to pause and resume. So it's actually gonna be one button. So it's gonna be helpful for us to just create this pause or resume. So for this one, we're just gonna check. If it's playing, then we're gonna pause it. Otherwise, we're gonna resume it. And then for the seek, we just need to know as an input the duration. So where are we going to? And then just go to that position. And then we want to play to the next song. So all we need to do when we want to go to the next song is just update the index. So this current song index, as long as it's not null and it's not the last song, just increment by one. And then if it is the last song, let's just go back to the first song. So it can just loop. And then similarly for the previous song. Now when it comes to the previous song or the left skip previous button, if we're currently in the middle of a song, then if you actually press the left Arrow, it should go to the beginning of the song before you skip to the previous song, if you know what I mean. So if it's more than two seconds, like if more than two seconds have passed, then we're just going to restart the current song. 
And then otherwise, we're going to go to the previous song. Cool, and then for this song completion, once a particular song's completed, then we're going to just play the next song. Okay, cool, now let's just um, finish off by writing all the getters. So I wanna get the bo boolean for is playing, the current duration, the total duration, and that's it. And for this setter, when we update the current song index, as long as the new index isn't null, then we're just going to play this song at the new index. So this should just work out nicely. So when you import a new package, by the way, it's a good idea to just kill the project and just open it again, just to make sure. But let's check this out. So if I click on one of these songs, then, then yay, you can hear the music playing. Okay, so there's actually no way for us to pause the music right now in our UI. So I'm just gonna kill the app and restart it. And let's just fill this out, right? So the slider, you know, the max slider, we can now give it the total duration. And then where we are currently, we can give it the current duration. And this on change method is for when the, during when the user is dragging the slider around. But what I'm more interested in is the on change end. And this one is for when the sliding has finished. So when we, go to that position in the song duration. Cool, and then let's come back down to these playback controls. So for the skip previous, we can give it the correct method and we can give it the pause and resume for the icon this one we actually want to change up the icon so if it is playing then let's give the pause icon and then otherwise give it the play arrow and then finally the skip forward method Okay, sweet, so let's save this. And if I click on a song, it starts playing and you can see it says pause because it's playing right now. And you can see the green bars moving as well. And you can also seek to a different position. And we can also skip the songs and it looks like all the functionality is working fine. Now, one of the last things we need to do is just this time value and then go to the current duration and just convert it to a string. Same thing for the total duration. And you can see, if we print it out, it looks like it's working, but it looks quite ugly. So I'm just gonna come up to the top and we're just gonna have a quick method here to convert this duration into like a nice minute seconds string. So let's call it format time and just accept a duration. And so what I'm gonna do is firstly, just get the remainder if you divide it by 60, just to get the two digit seconds. And the formatted time is just gonna be the duration in minutes and then the two digit seconds. So let's come back down and format these guys. And whoops, there's an extra bracket. Cool, and it's not quite perfect. Like if it's a single digit second, we should add in an extra zero on the left. Yeah, I like that. That looks much better. And let's just test all of these functionalities out. I think it's all working. Except for the going previous, it works when you're in the middle, but we can't skip to the previous. 
Let's come back to that method and oh, for some reason we didn't fill this one out. When we are already past two seconds, then we're going to just restart the song. And sweet, looks like everything's working. Now just one last thing is let's just check the dark mode. And it looks like it's working fine except for this new morphic box. So let's come over here. And the background's good. Let's just grab a quick boolean for the dark mode. And let's just say, okay, if it's dark mode, then give it a black color. For this one, if it's a dark mode, then give it a dark gray. And that's looking pretty good. Sweet, so that's how you code up a minimal music player app. And that's it, that's the full Flutter Masterclass. If you made it to the end, you truly did a great job, so congratulations. Now for some final thoughts. Like any skill, make sure to be consistent and put in the hours to learn this material. Remember, you have the AI and the entire internet to help you learn, so the only thing holding you back is yourself. And my final piece of advice is to just start small and build. We saw many different apps made during this course, so keep building apps for yourself. I hope this was helpful to you. Thanks for watching and good luck on your app development journey.